This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Keith Worrell. The Alchemist by H. P. Lovecraft. High up, crowning the grassy summit of a swelling mount whose sides are wooded near the base with the gnarled trees of a primeval forest, stands the old chateau of my ancestors. For centuries, its lofty battlements have frowned down upon the wild and rugged countryside about, serving as a home and stronghold for the proud houses whose honored line is older even than moss-grown castle walls. These ancient turrets, stained by the storms of generations and crumbling under the slow yet mighty pressure of time, formed in the ages of feudalism one of the most dreaded and formidable fortresses in all France. From its mocky collated parapets and mounted battlements, barons, counts, and even kings have been defied, yet never has its spacious hall resounded to the footsteps of the invader. But since those glorious years all is changed, a poverty but little above the level of dire want, together with a pride of name that forbids its alleviation by the pursuits of commercial life, have prevented the scions of our line from maintaining their estates in pristine splendor, and the falling stone of the walls, the overgrown vegetation of the parks, the dry and dusty moat, the ill-paved courtyards and toppling towers without, as well as the sagging floors, the worm-eaten waincoats, and the faded tapestries within, all tell a gloomy tale of fallen grandeur. As the ages pass, first one, then another, of the four great turrets were left a ruin, until at last but a single tower housed the sadly reduced descendants of the once mighty lords of the estate. It was in one of the vast and gloomy chambers of this remaining tower that I, Antone, last of the unhappy and accursed counts of the sea, first saw the light of day ninety long years ago. Within these walls and amongst the dark and shadowy forests, the wild ravines and grottoes of the hillside below were spent the first years of my troubled life. My parents I never knew. My father had been killed at the age of thirty-two, a month before I was born by the fall of a stone somehow dislodged from one of the deserted parapets of the castle. And my mother having died at my birth, my care and education devolved solely upon one remaining servitor, an old and trusted man of considerable intelligence, whose name I remember as Pierre. I was an only child, and the lack of companionship which this fact entailed upon me was augmented by the strange care exercised by my aged guardian in excluding me from society of the peasant children whose abodes were scattered here and there upon the plains that surround the base of the hill. At the time, Pierre said that this restriction was imposed upon me because my noble birth placed me above association with such Libyan company. Now I know its real object was to keep from my ears the idle tales of the dread curse upon our line that were nightly told and magnified by the simple tenantry as they conversed in their hushed accents and the glow of their cottage hearths. Thus isolated and thrown upon my own resources, I spent the hours of my childhood in poring over the ancient tombs that filled the shadow-haunted library of the chateau, and in roaming without aim or purpose through the perpetual dust of the spectral wood that clothed the side of the hill near its foot. It was perhaps an effect of such surrounding that my mind early acquired a shade of melancholy. Those studies and pursuit which partake of the dark and occult in nature most strongly claimed my attention. Of my own race I was permitted to learn singularly little, yet what small knowledge of it I was able to gain seemed to depress me much. Perhaps it was at first only the manifest reluctance of my old preceptor to discuss with me my paternal ancestry that gave rise to the terror which I ever felt at the mention of my great house. Yet as I grew out of childhood, I was able to piece together disconnected fragments of discourse, let it slip from the unwilling tongue which had begun to falter in approaching senility, and had a sort of relation to a certain circumstance which I had always deemed strange, but which now became dimly terrible. The circumstances to which I allude is the early age at which all the counts of my line had met their end. Whilst I had hitherto considered this but a natural attribute of a family of short-lived men, I afterwards pondered long upon the premature deaths, and began to connect them with the wanderings of the old man, who often spoke of a curse which for centuries had prevented the lives of the holders of my title from much exceeding the span of thirty-two years. Upon my twenty-first birthday, the aged Pierre gave to me a family document which he said had for many generations been handed down from father to son, and continued by each possessor. Its contents were of the most startling nature, and its perusal confirmed the gravest of my apprehension. At this time, my belief in the supernatural was firm and deep-seated, else I would have dismissed with scorn the incredible narrative unfolded before my eyes. The paper carried me back to the days of the thirteenth century, when the old castle in which I sat had been a feared and impregnable fortress. It told of a certain ancient man who had once dwelled on our estates, 
a person of no small accomplishments, though little above the rank of peasant, by name, Michael, usually designated by a surname of Malvais the Evil, on account of his sinister reputation. He had studied beyond the custom of his kind, seeking such things as a philosopher's stone or the elixir of eternal life, and was reputed wise in the terrible secrets of black magic and alchemy. Michael Malvais had one son named Charles, a youth as proficient as himself in the hidden arts, who had therefore become called Le Sorcerer, or the Wizard. This pair, shunned by all honest folk, were suspected of the most hideous practices. Old Michael was said to have burned his wife alive as a sacrifice to the devil, and the unaccountable disappearance of many small peasant children was laid at the dreaded door of these two. Yet through the dark natures of the father and son ran one deemingly ray of humanity. The old man loved his offspring with fierce intensity, whilst the youth had for his parent a more than filial affection. One night the castle on the hill was thrown into the wildest confusion by the vanishment of a young Godfrey, son to Henry, the Count. A searching party, headed by the frantic father, invaded the cottage of the sorcerers, and there came upon old Michael Malveus, busy over a huge and violently bouldering cauldron. Without certain cause, in the ungoverned madness of fury and despair, the Count laid hands on the aged wizard, and ere he released his murderous hold, his victim was no more. Meanwhile, joyful servants were proclaiming the finding of young Godfrey in a distant and unused chamber of the great edifice, telling too late that poor Michael had been killed in vain. As the Count and his associates turned away from the lovely abode of the alchemist, the form of Charles Le Sorcerer appeared through the trees. The excited chatter of menials standing about told him what had occurred, yet he seemed at first unmoved at his father's fate. Then, slowly advancing to meet the Count, he pronounced in dull yet terrible accents the curse that ever afterward haunted the House of C. May never a noble of thy murderous line survive to reach a greater age than thine, spoke he, when suddenly leaping backwards into the black woods, he drew from his tunic a vial of colorless liquid, which he threw into the faces of his father's slayer as he disappeared behind the inky curtain of the night. The Count died without utterance and was buried the next day, but little more than two and thirty years from the hour of his birth. No trace of the assassin could be found, though relentless bands of peasants scoured the neighboring woods and the meadowland around the hill. Thus time and the want of a remainder dulled the memory of the curse in the mind of the late Count's family, so that when Godfrey, innocent cause of the whole tragedy and now bearing the title, was killed by an arrow whilst haunting at the age of thirty-two, there were no thoughts save those of grief at his demise. But when, years afterwards, the next young Count, Robert by name, was found dead in a nearby field of no apparent cause, the peasants told in whispers that their sonnier had but lately passed his thirty-second birthday when surprised by early death. Louis, son to Robert, was found drowned in the moat at the same fateful age, and thus down through the centuries ran the ominous chronicle, Henris, Robert, Antonius, and Armand, snatched from happy and virtuous lives when little below the age of their unfortunate ancestor at his murder. That I had left at most but eleven years of further existence was made certain to me by the words which I had read. My life previously held at small value now became dearer to me each day as I delve deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the hidden world of black magic. Isolated as I was, modern science had produced no impression upon me, and I labored as in the Middle Ages, as rapt as had been old Michael and young Charles themselves in the acquisition of demonological and alchemical learning. Yet read as I might, in no manner could I account for the strange curse upon my line. In unusually rational moments, I would even go so far as to seek a natural explanation, attributing the early deaths of my ancestors to the sinister Charles Le Saucer and his heirs. Yet, having found upon careful inquiry that there were no known descendants of the alchemist, I would fall back to occult studies, and once more endeavor to find a spell that would release my house from its terrible burden. Upon one thing I was absolutely resolved. I should never wed, before, since no other branch of my family was in existence, I might thus end the curse with myself. As I drew near the age of thirty, old Pierre was called to the land beyond. Alone, I buried him beneath the stones of the courtyard about which he had loved to wander in life. Thus was I left to ponder on myself as the only human creature within the great fortress, and in my utter solitude my mind began to cease a vain protest against the impending doom, to become almost reconciled to the fate which so many of my ancestors had met. Much of my time now was occupied with the exploration of the ruined and abandoned halls of the towers of the old chateau, which in my youth fear had caused me to shun, and some of which old Pierre had once told me had not been trodden by human foot for over four centuries. Strange and awesome were many of the objects I encountered. 
Furniture, covered by the dust of ages and crumbling with the rot of long dampness, met my eyes. Cobwebs in a profusion never before seen by me were spun everywhere, and huge bats flapped their bony and uncanny wings on all sides of the otherwise untenanated gloom. Of my exact age, even down to days and hours, I kept a most careful record for each movement of the pendulum of the massive lock in the library told off so much of my doomed existence. At length, I approached that time which I had so long viewed with apprehension, since most of my ancestors had been seized some little while before they reached the exact age of Count Henry at his end. I was every moment on the watch for the coming of the unknown death. In what strange form the curse should overtake me, I knew not, but I was resolved at least that it should not find me a cowardly or passive victim. With new vigor, I applied myself to my examination of the old chateau and its contents. It was upon one of the longest of all my excursions of discovery in the deserted portion of the castle, less than a week before that fatal hour which I felt must mark the utmost limit of my stay on earth, beyond which I could not even the slightest hope of continuing to draw breath, that I came upon the culminating event of my whole life. I had spent the better part of the morning in climbing up and down half-ruined staircases in one of the most dilapidated and ancient turrets. As the afternoon progressed, I saw the lower levels descending into what appeared to be either a medieval place of confinement or a more recently excavated storehouse for gunpowder. As I slowly traversed the nitrine-crusted passageway at the foot of the last staircase, the paving became very damp, and soon I saw by the light of my flickering torch that a blank, water-stained wall impeded my journey. Turning to retrace my steps, my eye fell upon a small trap door with a ring which lay directly beneath my foot. Pausing, I succeeded with difficulty in raising it, whereupon there was revealed a black aperture, exhaling nauseous fumes which caused my torch to sputter, and disclosing in the unsteady glare the top of a flight of stone steps. As soon as the torch which I lowered into the repellent depths burned freely and steadily, I commenced my descent. The steps were many, and led to a narrow, stone lagged passage, which I knew must be far underground. This passage proved of great length and terminated in the massive oaken door, dripping with the moisture of the place and stoutly resisting all my attempts to open it. Ceasing after a time my efforts in this direction, I had proceeded back some distance towards the steps where there suddenly fell to my experience one of the most profound and maddening shocks capable of reception by the human mind. Without warning, I heard the heavy door behind me creak slowly open upon its rusty hinges. My immediate sensations were incapable of analysis. To be confronted in a place as thoroughly deserted as I had deemed the old castle with evidence of the presence of man or spirit produced in my brain a horror of the most acute description. When at last I turned and faced the seat of the sound, my eyes must have started from their orbits at the sight that they beheld. There, in the ancient gothic doorway, stood a human figure. It was that of a man clad in a skull cap and long medieval tunic of a dark color. His long hair and flowing beard were of a terrible and intense black hue and incredible profusion. His forehead high beyond the usual dimensions, his cheeks deep sunken and heavily lined with wrinkles, and his hands long, claw-like, and gnarled, were such a deadly, marble-like whiteness as I had never elsewhere seen in man. His figure, leaned to proportions of a skeleton, was strangely bent and almost lost within the volumes of folds of his particular garment. But strangest of all were his eyes, twin caves of abysmal blackness, profound in expression of understanding, yet inhuman in degree of wickedness. These were now fixed upon me, piercing my soul with their hatred, and rooting me to the spot whereon I stood. At last the figure spoke in a rumbling voice that chilled me through with its dull hollowness and latent malevolence. The language in which the discourse was clothed was that debased form of Latin in use amongst the more learned men of the Middle Ages, and made familiar to me by my prolonged researches into the works of the old alchemists and demonologists. The apparition spoke of the curse which had hovered over my house, told me of the coming end, dwelt on the wrong perpetuated by my ancestor against old Michael Malveus, and gloated over the revenge of Charles Le Saucier. He told me how young Charles had escaped into the night, returning in after years to kill Godfrey, the heir, with an arrow just as he approached the age which had been his father's at his assassination. How he had secretly returned to the estate and established himself unknown in the even then deserted subterranean chamber whose doorway now framed the hideous narrator. How he had seized Robert, son of Godfrey, in a field, forced poison down his throat, and then left him to die at the age of thirty-two thus maintaining the foul provisions of his vengeful curse. At this point, I was left to imagine the solution of the greatest mystery of all. 
how the curse had been fulfilled since that time when Charles Le Sorcier must in the course of nature have died, for the man digressed into an account of the deep alchemical studies of two wizards, father and son, speaking most particularly of the researches of Charles Le Sorcier concerning the elixir which should grant him who partook of it in eternal life and youth. His enthusiasm had seemed for the moment to remove from his terrible eyes the black malevolence that had first so haunted me. But suddenly the fiendish glare returned, and with a shocking sound like the hissing of a serpent, the stranger raised a glass vial with the evident intent of ending my life as had Charles de Saussure six hundred years before ended that of my ancestor. Prompted by some preserving instinct of self-defense, I broke through the spell that had hitherto held me immovable, and flung my now dying torch at the creature who menaced my existence. I heard the file break harmlessly against the stones of the passage as the tunic of the strange man caught fire and lit the horrid scene with a ghastly radiance. The shriek of fright and impotent malice emanated by the would-be assassin proved too much for my already shaken nerves, and I fell prone upon the slimy floor in a total faint. When at last my senses returned, all was frightfully dark, and my mind, remembering what had occurred, shrank from the idea of beholding any more. Yet curiosity overmastered all. Who, I asked myself, was the man of evil, and how come he within the castle walls? Why should he seek to avenge the death of Michael Malveus, and how had the curse been carried on through all these long centuries since the time of Charles Le Saussier? The dread of years was lifted from my shoulders, for I knew that he whom I had felled was the source of all my danger from the curse, and now I was free. I burned with desire to learn more of the sinister thing which had haunted my line for centuries, and made of my own youth one long continued nightmare. Determined upon further exploration, I felt my pockets for lint and steel, and lit the unused torch which I had with me. First of all, new light revealed the distorted and blackened form of the mysterious stranger. The hideous eyes were now closed. Disliking the sight, I turned away and entered the chamber beyond the gothic door. Here I found what seemed much like an alchemist's laboratory. In one corner was an immense pile of shining yellow metal that sparkled gorgeously in the light of the torch. It may have been gold, but I did not pause to examine it, for I was strangely affected by that which I had undergone. At the farthest end of the apartment was an opening leading out into one of the many wild ravines of the dark hillside forest. Filled with wonder, yet now realizing how the man had obtained access to the chateau, I proceeded to return. I had intended to pass by the remains of the stranger with averted face, but as I approached the body, I seemed to hear, emanating from it, a faint sound, as though life were not yet wholly extinct. Aghast, I turned to examine the charred and shriveled figure on the floor. Then, all at once, the horrible eyes, blacker even than the seared face in which they were set, opened wide with an expression which I was unable to interpret. The cracked lips tried to frame words I could not well understand. Once I caught the name of Charles Le Saussure, and again I fancied the words years and curse issued from the twisted mouth. Still I was at a loss to gather the purport of his disconnected speech. At my evident ignorance of his meaning, pitchy eyes once more flashed malevolently at me, until, helpless as I saw my opponent to be, I trembled as I watched him. Suddenly the wretch, animated with his last burst of strength, raised his piteous head from the damp and sunken pavement. Then, as I remained paralyzed with fear, he found his voice in his dying breath scream forth those words which have ever afterwards haunted my days and nights. Fool, he shrieked, can you not guess my secret? Have you no brain whereby you may recognize the will which has through six long centuries fulfilled the dreadful curse upon the house? Have I not told you the great elixir of eternal life? Know you not how the secret of alchemy was solved? I tell you, it is I, I, I have lived for six hundred years to maintain my revenge, for I am Charles Le Saussure. End of The Alchemist. Recording by Keith Worrell. Please visit my webpage at www.nakedpenguins.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. The Beast in the Cave by H.P. Lovecraft. The horrible conclusion which had been gradually intruding itself upon my confused and reluctant mind was now an awful certainty. I was lost, completely hopelessly lost, in the vast and labyrinthine recess of the Mammoth Cave. Turn as I might, in no direction could my straining vision seize on any object capable of serving as a guidepost to set me on the outward path. 
that nevermore should I behold the blessed light of day, or scan the pleasant hills and dales of the beautiful world outside, my reason could no longer entertain the slightest unbelief. Hope had departed. Yet indoctrinated as I was by a life of philosophical study, I derived no small measure of satisfaction from my unimpassioned demeanor, for although I had frequently read of the wild frenzies into which were thrown the victims of similar situations, I experienced none of these, but stood quiet as soon as I clearly realized the loss of my bearings. Nor did the thought that I had probably wandered beyond the utmost limits of an ordinary search cause me to abandon my composure even for a moment. If I must die, I reflected, then was this terrible yet majestic cavern as welcome a sepulchre as that which any churchyard might afford, a conception which carried with it more of tranquillity than of despair. Starving would prove my ultimate fate, of this I was certain. Some I knew had gone mad under circumstances such as these, but I felt that this end would not be mine. My disaster was the result of no fault save my own, since unknown to the guide I had separated myself from the regular party of sightseers, and wandering for over an hour in forbidden avenues of the cave, had found myself unable to retrace the devious windings which I had pursued since forsaking my companions. Already my torch had begun to expire. Soon I would be enveloped by the total and almost palpable blackness of the bowels of the earth. As I stood in the waning, unsteady light, I idly wondered over the exact circumstances of my coming end. I remembered the accounts which I had heard of the colony of consumptives who, taking their residence in this gigantic grotto to find health from the apparently salubrious air of the underground world, with its steady, uniform temperature, pure air, and peaceful quiet, had found instead death in strange and ghastly form. I had seen the sad remains of their ill-made cottages as I passed them by with the party, and had wondered what unnatural influence a long sojourn in this immense and silent cavern would exert upon one as healthy and vigorous as I. Now I grimly told myself my opportunity for settling this point had arrived, provided that want of food should not bring me too speedy a departure from this life. As the last fitful rays of my torch faded into obscurity, I resolved to leave no stone unturned, no possible means of escape neglected. So summoning all the powers possessed by my lungs, I set up a series of loud shoutings, in the vain hope of attracting the attention of the guide by my clamor. Yet as I called, I believed in my heart that my cries were to no purpose, and that my voice, magnified and reflected by the numberless ramparts of the black maze about me, fell upon no ears save my own. All at once, however, my attention was fixed with a start as I fancied that I heard the sound of soft approaching steps on the rocky floor of the cavern. Was my deliverance about to be accomplished so soon? Had then all my horrible apprehensions been for naught? And was the guide, having marked my unwarranted absence from the party, following my course and seeking me out in this limestone labyrinth? Whilst these joyful queries arose in my brain, I was on the point of renewing my cries, in order that my discovery might come the sooner, when in an instant my delight was turned to horror as I listened, for my ever-acute ear, now sharpened in even greater degree by the complete silence of the cave, bore to my benumbed understanding the unexpected and dreadful knowledge that these footfalls were not like those of any mortal man. In the unearthly stillness of this subterranean region, the tread of the booted guide would have sounded like a series of sharp and incisive blows. These impacts were soft and stealthy, as of the paws of some feline. Besides, when I listened carefully, I seemed to trace the falls of four instead of two feet. I was now convinced that I had, by my own cries, aroused and attracted some wild beast, perhaps a mountain lion, which had accidentally strayed within the cave. Perhaps, I considered, the Almighty had chosen for me a swifter and more merciful death than that of hunger. Yet the instinct of self-preservation, never wholly dormant, was stirred in my breast, and though escape from the oncoming peril might but spare me for a sterner and more lingering end, I determined nevertheless to part with my life at as high a price as I could command. Strange as it may seem, my mind conceived of no intent on the part of the visitor save that of hostility. Accordingly, I became very quiet, in the hope that the unknown beast would, in the absence of a guiding sound, lose its direction as had I, and thus pass me by. But this hope was not destined for realization, for the strange footfalls steadily advanced, 
the animal evidently having obtained my scent, which in an atmosphere so absolutely free from all distracting influences as is that of the cave, could doubtless be followed at great distance. Seeing, therefore, that I must be armed for defense against an uncanny and unseen attack in the dark, I grouped about me the largest of the fragments of rock which were strewn upon all parts of the floor of the cavern in the vicinity, and grasping one in each hand for immediate use, awaited with resignation the inevitable result. Meanwhile, the hideous pattering of the paws drew near. Certainly the conduct of the creature was exceedingly strange. Most of the time, the tread seemed to be that of a quadruped, walking with a singular lack of unison betwixt hind and four feet. Yet at brief and infrequent intervals, I fancied that but two feet were engaged in the process of locomotion. I wondered what species of animal was to confront me. It must, I thought, be some unfortunate beast who had paid for its curiosity to investigate one of the entrances of the fearful grotto, with a lifelong confinement in its interminable recesses. It doubtless obtained as food the eyeless fish, bats and rats of the cave, as well as some of the ordinary fish that are wafted in at every freshet of Green River, which communicates in some occult manner with the waters of the cave. I occupied my terrible vigil with grotesque conjectures of what alteration cave life might have wrought in the physical structure of the beast, remembering the awful appearances ascribed by local tradition to the consumptives who had died after long residence in the cave. Then I remembered with a start that, even should I succeed in felling my antagonist, I should never behold its form, as my torch had long since been extinct, and I was entirely unprovided with matches. The tension on my brain now became frightful. My disordered fancy conjured up hideous and fearsome shapes from the sinister darkness that surrounded me, and that actually seemed to press upon my body. Nearer, nearer the dreadful footfalls approached. It seemed that I must give vent to a piercing scream, yet had I been sufficiently irresolute to attempt such a thing, my voice could scarce have responded. I was petrified, rooted to the spot. I doubted if my right arm would allow me to hurl its missile at the oncoming thing when the crucial moment should arrive. Now the steady pat-pat of the steps was close at hand, now very close. I could hear the labored breathing of the animal, and terror-struck as I was, I realized that it must have come from a considerable distance, and was correspondingly fatigued. Suddenly the spell broke. My right hand, guided by my ever-trustworthy sense of hearing, threw with full force the sharp-angled bit of limestone which it contained, toward that point in the darkness from which emanated the breathing and pattering and Wonderful to relate, it nearly reached its goal, for I heard the thing jump, landing at a distance away, where it seemed to pause. Having readjusted my aim, I discharged my second missile, this time most effectively, for with a flood of joy I listened as the creature fell in what sounded like a complete collapse, and evidently remained prone and unmoving. Almost overpowered by the great relief which rushed over me, I reeled back against the wall. The breathing continued in heavy gasping inhalations and expirations, whence I realized that I had no more than wounded the creature. And now all desire to examine the thing ceased. At last something allied to groundless superstitious fear had entered my brain, and I did not approach the body, nor did I continue to cast stones at it in order to complete the extinction of its life. Instead I ran at full speed in what was, as nearly as I could estimate in my frenzied condition, the direction from which I had come. Suddenly I heard a sound, or rather a regular succession of sounds. In another instant they had resolved themselves into a series of sharp metallic clicks. This time there was no doubt. It was the guide. And then I shouted, yelled, screamed, even shrieked with joy, as I beheld in the vaulted arches above the faint and glimmering effulgence which I knew to be the reflected light of an approaching torch. I ran to meet the flare, and before I could completely understand what had occurred, was lying upon the ground at the feet of the guide, embracing his boots and gibbering, despite my boasted reserve, in a most meaningless and idiotic manner, pouring out my terrible story, and at the same time overwhelming my auditor with protestations of gratitude. At length I awoke to something like my normal consciousness. The guide had noted my absence upon the arrival of the party at the entrance of the cave, and had, from his own intuitive sense of direction, proceeded to make a thorough canvas of by-passages just ahead of where he had last spoken to me, locating my whereabouts after a quest of about four hours. By the time he had related this to me, I, emboldened by his torch and his company, began to reflect upon the strange beast which I had wounded but a short distance back in the darkness, and suggested that we ascertain by the flashlight's aid what manner of creature was my victim. Accordingly, I retraced my steps, this time with a courage born of companionship, to the scene of my terrible experience. 
Soon we descried a white object upon the floor, an object whiter even than the gleaming limestone itself. Cautiously advancing, we gave vent to a simultaneous ejaculation of wonderment, for of all the unnatural monsters either of us had in our lifetimes beheld, this was in surpassing degree the strangest. It appeared to be an anthropoid ape of large proportions, escaped, perhaps, from some itinerant menagerie. Its hair was snow-white, a thing due, no doubt, to the bleaching action of a long existence within the inky confines of the cave, but it was also surprisingly thin, being indeed largely absent save on the head, where it was of such length and abundance that it fell over the shoulders in considerable profusion. The face was turned away from us, as the creature lay almost directly upon it. The inclination of the limbs was very singular, explaining, however, the alternation in their use which I had before noted, whereby the beast used sometimes all four, and on other occasions but two, for its progress. From the tips of the fingers or toes, long rat-like claws extended. The hands or feet were not prehensile, a fact that I ascribed to that long residence in the cave, which, as I before mentioned, seemed evident from the all-pervading and almost unearthly whiteness so characteristic of the whole anatomy. No tail seemed to be present. The respiration had now grown very feeble, and the guide had drawn his pistol with the evident intent of dispatching the creature, when a sudden sound emitted by the latter caused the weapon to fall unused. The sound was of a nature difficult to describe. It was not like the normal note of any known species of simian, and I wonder if this unnatural quality were not the result of a long-continued and complete silence, broken by the sensations produced by the advent of the light a thing which the beast could not have seen since its first entrance into the cave. The sound, which I might feebly attempt to classify as a kind of deep-toned chattering, was faintly continued. All at once a fleeting spasm of energy seemed to pass through the frame of the beast. The paws went through a convulsive motion, and the limbs contracted. With a jerk the white body rolled over so that its face was turned in our direction. For a moment I was so struck with horror at the eyes thus revealed that I noted nothing else. They were black, those eyes, deep, jetty black, in hideous contrast to the snow-white hair and flesh. Like those of other cave denizens, they were deeply sunken in their orbits, and were entirely destitute of iris. As I looked more closely, I saw that they were set in a face less prognathous than that of the average ape, and infinitely less hairy. The nose was quite distinct. As we gazed upon the uncanny sight presented to our vision, the thick lips opened and several sounds issued from them, after which the thing relaxed in death. The guide clutched my coat sleeve and trembled so violently that the light shook fitfully, casting weird moving shadows on the walls. I made no motion, but stood rigidly still, my horrified eyes fixed upon the floor ahead. The fear left, and wonder, awe, compassion, and reverence succeeded in its place. For the sounds uttered by the stricken figure that lay stretched out on the limestone had told us the awesome truth. The creature I had killed, the strange beast of the unfathomed cave, was, or had at one time been, a man. End of The Beast in the Cave by H. P. Lovecraft Beyond the Wall of Sleep. I have often wondered if the majority of mankind ever pause to reflect upon the occasionally titanic significance of dreams, and of the obscure world to which they belong. Whilst the greater number of our nocturnal visions are perhaps no more than faint and fantastic reflections of our waking experiences, Freud, to the contrary, with his puerile symbolism, there are still a certain remainder whose immundane and ethereal character permit of no ordinary interpretation, and whose vaguely exciting and disquieting effect suggests possible minute glimpses into a sphere of mental existence no less important than physical life, yet separated from that life by an all but impassable barrier. From my experience I cannot doubt but that man, when lost to terrestrial consciousness, is indeed sojourning in another and uncorporeal life of far different nature from the life we know, and of which 
Only the slightest and most indistinct memories linger after waking. From those blurred and fragmentary memories we may infer much, yet prove little. We may guess that in dreams, life, matter, and vitality, as the earth knows such things, are not necessarily constant, and that time and space do not exist as our waking selves comprehend them. Sometimes I believe that this less material life is our truer life, and that our vain presence on the terraqueous globe is itself the secondary or merely virtual phenomenon. It was from a youthful reverie filled with speculations of this sort that I arose one afternoon in the winter of 1900 and 1901 when to the state psychopathic institution in which I served as an intern was brought the man whose case has ever since haunted me so unceasingly. His name, as given on the records, was Joe Slater, or Slater, and his appearance was that of the typical denizen of the Catskill Mountain region, one of those strange repellent scions of a primitive colonial peasant stock, whose isolation for nearly three centuries in the hilly fastnesses of a little traveled countryside has caused them to sink to a kind of barbaric degeneracy, rather than advance with their more fortunately placed brethren of the thickly settled districts. Among these odd folk, who correspond exactly to the decadent element of white trash in the South, law and morals are non-existent, and their general mental status is probably below that of any other section of Native American people. Joe Slater, who came to the institution in the vigilant custody of four state policemen, and who was described as a highly dangerous character, certainly presented no evidence of his perilous disposition when I first beheld him. Though well above the middle stature, and of somewhat brawny frame, he was given an absurd appearance of harmless stupidity by the pale, sleepy blueness of his small watery eyes, the scantness of his neglected and never-shaven growth of yellow beard, and the listless drooping of his heavy nether lip. His age was unknown since among his kind neither family records nor permanent family ties exist. But from the baldness of his head in front, and from the decayed condition of his teeth, the head surgeon wrote him down as a man of about forty. From the medical and court documents we learned all that could be gathered of his case. This man, a vagabond, hunter, and trapper, had always been strange in the eyes of his primitive associates, he had habitually slept at night beyond the ordinary time, and upon waking would often talk of unknown things in a manner so bizarre as to inspire fear even in the hearts of an unimaginative populace. Not that his form of language was at all unusual, for he never spoke save in the debased patois of his environment, but the tone and tenor of his utterances were of such mysterious wildness that none might listen without apprehension. He himself was generally as terrified and baffled as his auditors, and within an hour after awakening would forget all that he had said, or at least all that had caused him to say what he did, relapsing into a bovine, half-amiable normality like that of the other hill-dwellers. As Slater grew older, it appeared, his matutinal aberrations had gradually increased in frequency and violence till about a month before his arrival at the institution had occurred the shocking tragedy which caused his arrest by the authorities. One day, near noon, after a profound sleep begun in a whiskey debauch at about five of the previous afternoon, the man had roused himself most suddenly, with ululations so horrible and unearthly that they brought several neighbors to his cabin, a filthy sty where he dwelt with a family as indescribable as himself. Rushing out into the snow, he had flung his arms aloft and commenced a series of leaps directly upward in the air, the while shouting his determination to reach some, quote, big, big cabin with brightness in the roof and walls and floor and the loud, queer music far away, unquote. As two men of moderate size sought to restrain him, 
he had struggled with maniacal force and fury, screaming of his desire and need to find and kill a certain, quote, thing that shines and shakes and laughs, unquote. At length, after temporarily felling one of his detainers with a sudden blow, he had flung himself upon the other in a demoniac ecstasy of bloodthirstiness, shrieking fiendishly that he would, quote, jump high in the air and burn his way through anything that stopped him, unquote. Family and neighbors had now fled in a panic, and when the more courageous of them returned, Slater was gone, leaving behind an unrecognizable pulp-like thing that had been a living man but an hour before. None of the mountaineers had dared to pursue him, and it is likely that they would have welcomed his death from the cold, but when several mornings later they heard his screams from a distant ravine, they realized that he had somehow managed to survive and that his removal in one way or another would be necessary. Then had followed an armed searching party, whose purpose, whatever it may have been originally, became that of a sheriff's posse, after one of the seldom popular state troopers had by accident observed, then questioned, and finally joined the seekers. On the third day, Slater was found unconscious in the hollow of a tree, and taken to the nearest jail where alienists from Albany examined him as soon as his senses returned. To them he told a simple story. He had, he said, gone to sleep one afternoon about sundown after drinking much liquor. He had awakened to find himself standing bloody-handed in the snow before his cabin, the mangled corpse of his neighbor, Peter Slater, at his feet. Horrified, he had taken to the woods in a vague effort to escape from the scene of what must have been his crime. Beyond these things he seemed to know nothing, nor could the expert questioning of his interrogators bring out a single additional fact. That night, Slater slept quietly, and the next morning he awakened with no singular feature save a certain alteration of expression. Dr. Barnard, who had been watching the patient, thought he noticed in the pale blue eyes a certain gleam of peculiar quality and in the flaccid lips an all but imperceptible tightening, as if of intelligent determination. But when questioned, Slater relapsed into the habitual vacancy of the mountaineer, and only reiterated what he had said on the preceding day. On the third morning occurred the first of the man's mental attacks. After some show of uneasiness in sleep, he burst forth into a frenzy so powerful that the combined efforts of four men were needed to bind him in a straitjacket. The alienists listened with keen attention to his words, since their curiosity had been aroused to a high pitch by the suggestive, yet mostly conflicting and incoherent stories of his family and neighbors. Slater raved for upward of fifteen minutes, babbling in his backwoods dialect of green edifices of light oceans of space, strange music, and shadowy mountains and valleys. But most of all did he dwell upon some mysterious blazing entity that shook and laughed and mocked at him. This vast, vague personality seemed to have done him a terrible wrong, and to kill it in triumphant revenge was his paramount desire. In order to reach it, he said, he would soar through abysses of emptiness, burning every obstacle that stood in his way. Thus ran his discourse, until with the greatest suddenness he ceased. The fire of madness died from his eyes, and in dull wonder he looked at his questioners and asked why he was bound. Dr. Barnard unbuckled the leather harness and did not restore it till night, when he succeeded in persuading Slater to don it of his own volition, for his own good. The man had now admitted that he sometimes talked queerly, though he knew not why. Within a week, two more attacks appeared, but from them the doctors learned little. On the source of Slater's visions they speculated at length, for since he could neither read nor write, and had apparently never heard a legend or fairy tale, his gorgeous imagery was quite inexplicable. 
That it could not come from any known myth or romance was made especially clear by the fact that the unfortunate lunatic expressed himself only in his own simple manner. He raved of things he did not understand and could not interpret, things which he claimed to have experienced, but which he could not have learned through any normal or connected narration. The alienists soon agreed that abnormal dreams were the foundation of the trouble, dreams whose vividness could for a time completely dominate the waking mind of this basically inferior man. With due formality, Slater was tried for murder, acquitted on the ground of insanity, and committed to the institution wherein I held so humble a post. I have said that I am a constant speculator concerning dream life, and from this you may judge of the eagerness with which I applied myself to the study of the new patient, as soon as I had fully ascertained the facts of his case. He seemed to sense a certain friendliness in me, or no doubt of the interest I could not conceal, and the gentle manner in which I questioned him. Not that he ever recognized me during his attacks, when I hung breathlessly upon his chaotic but cosmic word pictures. But he knew me in his quiet hours, when he would sit by his barred window, weaving baskets of straw and willow, and perhaps pining for the mountain freedom he could never again enjoy. His family never called to see him. Probably it had found another temporary head, after the manner of decadent mountain folk. By degrees I commenced to feel an overwhelming wonder at the mad and fantastic conceptions of Joe Slater. The man himself was pitiably inferior in mentality and language alike, but his glowing titanic visions, though described in a barbarous disjointed jargon, were assuredly things which only a superior or even exceptional brain could conceive. How, I often asked myself, could the stolid imagination of a Catskill degenerate conjure up sights whose very possession argued a lurking spark of genius? How could any backwoods dullard have gained so much as an idea of those glittering realms of supernal radiance and space about which Slater ranted in his furious delirium? More and more, I inclined to the belief that in the pitiful personality who cringed before me lay the disordered nucleus of something beyond my comprehension something infinitely beyond the comprehension of my more experienced, but less imaginative, medical and scientific colleagues. And yet, I could extract nothing definite from the man. The sum of all my investigation was that, in a kind of semi-corporeal dream life, Slater wandered or floated through resplendent and prodigious valleys, mountains, gardens, cities, and palaces of light in a region unbounded and unknown to man. That there he was no peasant or degenerate, but a creature of importance and vivid life, moving proudly and dominantly, and checked only by a certain deadly enemy, who seemed to be a being of visible, yet ethereal structure, and who did not appear to be of human shape, since Slater never referred to it as a man, or as aught, save a thing. This thing had done Slater some hideous but unnamed wrong, which the maniac, if maniac he were, yearned to avenge. From the manner in which Slater alluded to their dealings, I judged that he and the luminous thing had met on equal terms, that in his dream existence, the man was himself a luminous thing of the same race as his enemy. This impression was sustained by his frequent references to flying through space and burning all that impeded his progress. Yet these conceptions were formulated in rustic words wholly inadequate to convey them, a circumstance which drove me to the conclusion that, if a dream world indeed existed, oral language was not its medium for the transmission of thought. Could it be that the dream soul inhabiting this inferior body was desperately struggling to speak things which the simple and halting tongue of dullness could not utter? Could it be that I was face to face with intellectual emanations which would explain the mystery if I could but learn to discover and read them? I did not tell the older physicians of these things, for middle age is skeptical, cynical, and disinclined to accept new ideas. Besides, 
The head of the institution had but lately warned me in his paternal way that I was overworking, that my mind needed a rest. It had long been my belief that human thought consists basically of atomic or molecular motion, convertible into ether waves or radiant energy, like heat, light, and electricity. This belief had early led me to contemplate the possibility of telepathy, or mental communication by means of suitable apparatus, and I had in my college days prepared a set of transmitting and receiving instruments somewhat similar to the cumbrous devices employed in wireless telegraphy at that crude pre-radio period. These I had tested with a fellow student, but, achieving no result, had soon packed them away with other scientific odds and ends for possible future use. Now, in my intense desire to probe into the dream life of Joe Slater, I sought these instruments again, and spent several days in repairing them for action. When they were complete once more, I missed no opportunity for their trial. At each outbreak of Slater's violence, I would fit the transmitter to his forehead and the receiver to my own, constantly making delicate adjustments for various hypothetical wavelengths of intellectual energy. I had but little notion of how the thought impressions would, if successfully conveyed, arouse an intelligent response in my brain, but I felt certain that I could detect and interpret them. Accordingly, I continued my experiments, though informing no one of their nature. It was on the 21st of February, 1901, that the thing occurred. As I look back across the years, I realize how unreal it seems, and sometimes wonder if old Dr. Fenton was not right when he charged it all to my excited imagination. I recall that he listened with great kindness and patience when I told him, but afterward gave me a nerve powder and arranged for the half-year's vacation on which I departed the next week. That fateful night I was wildly agitated and perturbed, for despite the excellent care he had received, Joe Slater was unmistakably dying. Perhaps it was his mountain freedom that he missed, or perhaps the turmoil in his brain had grown too acute for his rather sluggish physique. But, at all events, the flame of vitality flickered low in the decadent body. He was drowsy near the end, and as darkness fell he dropped off into a troubled sleep. I did not strap on the straitjacket as was customary when he slept, since I saw that he was too feeble to be dangerous, even if he woke in mental disorder once more before passing away. But I did place upon his head and mine the two ends of my cosmic radio, hoping against hope for a first and last message from the dream world in the brief time remaining. In the cell with us was one nurse, a mediocre fellow who did not understand the purpose of the apparatus, or think to inquire into my course. As the hours wore on, I saw his head droop awkwardly in sleep, but I did not disturb him. I myself, lulled by the rhythmical breathing of the healthy and the dying man, must have nodded a little later. The sound of weird lyric melody was what aroused me. Chords, vibrations, and harmonic ecstasies echoed passionately on every hand, while, on my ravished sight, burst the stupendous spectacle of ultimate beauty. Walls, columns, and architraves of living fire blazed effulgently around the spot where I seemed to float in air, extending upward to an infinitely high vaulted dome of indescribable splendor. Blending with this display of palatial magnificence, or, rather, supplanting it at times in kaleidoscopic rotation, were glimpses of wide plains and graceful valleys, high mountains, and inviting grottos, covered with every lovely attribute of scenery which my delighted eyes could conceive of, yet formed wholly of some glowing ethereal plastic entity, which in consistency partook as much of spirit as of matter. As I gazed, I perceived that my own brain held the key to these enchanting metamorphoses, for each vista which appeared to me was the one my changing mind most wished to behold. 
Amidst this Elysian realm I dwelt not as a stranger, for each sight and sound was familiar to me, just as it had been for uncounted eons of eternity before, and would be for like eternities to come. Then the resplendent aura of my brother of light drew near and held colloquy with me, soul to soul, with silent and perfect interchange of thought. The hour was one of approaching triumph, for was not my fellow being escaping at last from a degrading periodic bondage, escaping forever, and preparing to follow the accursed oppressor even unto the uttermost fields of ether, that upon it might be wrought a flaming cosmic vengeance which would shake the spheres. We floated thus for a little time, when I perceived a slight blurring and fading of the objects around us, as though some force were recalling me to earth, where I least wished to go. The form near me seemed to feel a change also, for it gradually brought its discourse toward a conclusion, and itself prepared to quit the scene, fading from my sight at a rate somewhat less rapid than that of the other objects. A few more thoughts were exchanged, and I knew that the Luminous One and I were being recalled to bondage, though for my brother of light it would be the last time. The sorry planet shell being well nigh spent, in less than an hour my fellow would be free to pursue the oppressor along the Milky Way, and pass the hither stars to the very confines of infinity. A well-defined shock separates my final impression of the fading scene of light from my sudden and somewhat shamefaced awakening and straightening up in my chair as I saw the dying figure on the couch move hesitantly. Joe Slater was indeed awakening, though probably for the last time. As I looked more closely, I saw that in the sallow cheeks shone spots of color which had never before been present. The lips, too, seemed unusual, being tightly compressed, as if by the force of a stronger character than had been Slater's. The whole face finally began to grow tense, and the head turned restlessly with closed eyes. I did not rouse the sleeping nurse, but readjusted the slightly disarranged headband of my telepathic radio, intent to catch any parting message the dreamer might have to deliver. All at once, the head turned sharply in my direction, and the eyes fell open, causing me to stare in blank amazement at what I beheld. The man who had been Joe Slater, the Catskill decadent, was gazing at me with a pair of luminous, expanding eyes whose blue seemed subtly to have deepened. Neither mania nor degeneracy was visible in that gaze, and I felt beyond a doubt that I was viewing a face behind which lay an active mind of high order. At this juncture, my brain became aware of a steady external influence operating upon it. I closed my eyes to concentrate my thoughts more profoundly, and was rewarded by the positive knowledge that my long-sought mental message had come at last. Each transmitted idea formed rapidly in my mind, and though no actual language was employed, my habitual association of conception and expression was so great that I seemed to be receiving the message in ordinary English. Joe Slater is dead, came the sole petrifying voice of an agency from beyond the wall of sleep. My opened eyes sought the couch of pain and curious horror, but the blue eyes were still calmly gazing, and the countenance was still intelligently animated. He is better dead for he was unfit to bear the active intellect of cosmic entity. His gross body could not undergo the needed adjustments between ethereal life and planet life. He was too much an animal, too little a man. Yet it is through his deficiency that you have come to discover me, for the cosmic and planet souls rightly should never meet. He has been in my torment and diurnal prison for forty-two of your terrestrial years. I am an entity like that which you yourself become in the freedom of dreamless sleep. I am your brother of light, and have floated with you in the effulgent valleys. It is not permitted me to tell your waking earth self of your real self, but we are all roamers of vast spaces and travelers in many ages. 
Next year I may be dwelling in the Egypt which you call ancient, or in the cruel empire of San Shan, which is to come three thousand years hence. You and I have drifted to the worlds that reel about the red Arcturus, and dwelt in the bodies of the insect philosophers that crawl proudly over the fourth moon of Jupiter. How little does the earth self know life and its extent! How little indeed ought it to know for its own tranquillity! Of the oppressor I cannot speak. You on earth have unwittingly felt its distant presence. You, without knowing, idly gave the blinking beacon the name of Algol, the demon star. It is to meet and conquer the oppressor that I have vainly striven for eons, held back by bodily encumbrances. Tonight I go as a nemesis, bearing just and blazingly cataclysmic vengeance. Watch me in the sky, close to the demon star. I cannot speak longer, for the body of Joe Slater grows cold and rigid, and the coarse brains are ceasing to vibrate as I wish. You have been my only friend on this planet, the only soul to sense and seek for me within the repellent form which lies on this couch. We shall meet again, perhaps in the shining mists of Orion's sword, perhaps on a bleak plateau in prehistoric Asia, perhaps in unremembered dreams tonight, perhaps in some other form an eon hence, when the solar system shall have been swept away. At this point, the thought waves abruptly ceased. The pale eyes of the dreamer, or, can I say dead man, commenced to glaze fishily. In a half-stupor, I crossed over to the couch and felt of his wrist, but found it cold, stiff, and pulseless. The sallow cheeks paled again, and the thick lips fell open, disclosing the repulsively rotten fangs of the degenerate Joe Slater. I shivered, pulled a blanket over the hideous face, and awakened the nurse. Then I left the cell, and went silently to my room. I had an instant and unaccountable craving for a sleep whose dreams I should not remember. The climax? What plain tale of science can boast of such a rhetorical effect? I have merely set down certain things appealing to me as facts, allowing you to construe them as you will. As I've already admitted, my superior, old Dr. Fenton, denies the reality of everything I have related. He vows that I was broken down with nervous strain, and badly in need of a long vacation on full pay which he so generously gave me. He assures me, on his professional honor, that Joe Slater was but a low-grade paranoiac, whose fantastic notions must have come from the crude hereditary folk tales which circulated even in the most decadent of communities. All this he tells me, yet I cannot forget what I saw in the sky on the night after Slater died. Lest you think me a biased witness, another pen must add this final testimony, which may perhaps supply the climax you expect. I will quote the following account of the star Nova Persei verbatim, from the pages of that eminent astronomical authority Professor Garrett P. Service. Quote, On February 22, 1901, a marvelous new star was discovered by Dr. Anderson of Edinburgh, not very far from Algol. No star had been visible at that point before. Within 24 hours, the stranger had become so bright that it outshone Capella. In a week or two, it had visibly faded, and in the course of a few months, it was hardly discernible with the naked eye." Unquote. End Beyond the Wall of Sleep by H.P. Lovecraft This recording is in the public domain.
Recording by James Pontolillo. The Cats of Ulthar by H. P. Lovecraft. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe, as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic, and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus, and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Meroe and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords, and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which he hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbors. Why they did this I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their hovel, and from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more, and instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed and sounds heard after dark, the loser would lament impotently, or console himself by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple, and knew not whence it is all cats first came. One day a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year. In the marketplace they told fortunes for silver and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers none could tell, but it was seen that they were given to strange prayers and that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow, and when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy whom the dark people called Menes smiled more often than he wept as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menes could not find his kitten, and as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand, though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned with horn-flanked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again, and the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth the familiar cat had vanished. Cats large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow, and white. Old Cranon, the burgomaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menace's kitten, and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, 
No one durst complain to the sinister couple. Even when little Atal, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard of rite of beasts. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awakened at dawn, behold, every cat was back at his accustomed hearth, large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair, and marveled not a little. Old Cranon again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their saucers of milk was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days, the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the burgomaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty, though in so doing he was careful to take with him Shang, the blacksmith, and Thal, the cutter of stone, as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this, two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner, disputed at length with Nith, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thul were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweetmeat as a reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small Menace and his black kitten, of the prayer of Menace, and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told of by traders in Hathek and discussed by travelers in Nier, namely, that in Ulthar no man may kill a cat. This is the end of The Cats of Ulthar by H. P. Lovecraft. Recording by Garrett Fitzgerald. Celeface by H.P. Lovecraft. In a dream, Karanis saw the city in the valley and the seacoast beyond and the snowy peak overlooking the sea and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward distant regions where the sea meets the sky. In a dream it was also that he came by his name of Karanis for when awake he was called by another name. Perhaps it was natural for him to dream a new name, for he was the last of his family and alone among the indifferent millions of London, so there were not many to speak to him and remind him who he had been. His money and lands were gone, and he did not care for the ways of the people about him, but preferred to dream and write of his dreams. What he wrote was laughed at by those to whom he showed it, so that after a time he kept his writings to himself and finally ceased to write. The more he withdrew from the world about him, the more wonderful became his dreams, and it would have been quite futile to try to describe them on paper. Curanus was not modern, 
and did not think like others who wrote. Whilst they strove to strip from life its embroidered robes of myth and to show in naked ugliness the foul thing that is reality, Quranus sought for beauty alone. When truth and experience failed to reveal it, he sought it in fancy and illusion, and found it on his very doorstep amid the nebulous memories of childhood tales and dreams. There are not many persons who know what wonders are open to them in the stories and visions of their youth, for when as children we listen and dream, we think but half-formed thoughts, and when as men we try to remember, we are dulled and prosaic with the poison of life. But some of us awaken the night with strange phantasms of enchanted hills and gardens, of fountains that sing in the sun, of golden cliffs overhanging murmuring seas, of plains that stretch down to sleeping cities of bronze and stone, and of shadowy companies of heroes that ride caparisoned white horses along the edges of thick forests. And then we know that we have looked back through the ivory gates into that world of wonder which was ours before we were wise and unhappy. Karanus came very suddenly upon his old world of childhood. He had been dreaming of the house where he had been born, the great stone house covered with ivy, where thirteen generations of his ancestors had lived, and where he had hoped to die. It was moonlight and he had stolen out into the fragrant summer night, through the gardens, down the terraces, past the great oaks of the park, and along the long white road to the village. The village seemed very old, eaten away at the edge like the moon which had commenced to wane, and Karanus wondered whether the peaked roofs of the small houses hid sleep or death. In the streets were spears of long grass, and the window panes on either side broken or filmily staring. Karanus had not lingered, but had plodded on, as though summoned toward some goal. He dared not disobey the summons, for fear it might prove an illusion like the urges and aspirations of waking life, which do not lead to any goal. Then he had been drawn down a lane that led off the, from the village street towards the channel cliffs, and had come to the end of things, to the precipice in the abyss, where all the village and all the world fell abruptly into the unechoing emptiness of infinity, and where even the sky ahead was empty and unlit by the crumbling moon and the peering stars. Faith had urged him on. Over the precipice and into the gulf, faith had urged him on. Over the precipice and into the gulf, where he had floated down, 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 past dark, shapeless, undreamed dreams, faintly glowing spheres that may have been partly dreamed dreams, and laughing, winged things that seemed to mock the dreamers of all the worlds. Then a rift seemed to open in the darkness before him, and he saw the city of the valley, glisteningly, radiantly, far, far below, with a background of sea and sky, and a snow-capped mountain near the shore. Karanus had awakened the very moment he beheld the city, yet he knew from his brief glance that it was none other than Selephase, in the valley of Uthnargai beyond the Canarian hills where his spirit had dwelt all the eternity of an hour one summer afternoon very long ago, when he had slipped away from his nurse and let the warm sea breeze lull him to sleep as he watched the clouds from the cliff near the village. He had protested then when they had found him, waked him and carried him home, for just as he was aroused, he had been about to sail in a golden galley for those alluring regions where the sea meets the sky. 
And now he was equally resentful of awaking, for he had found his fabulous city after forty weary years. But three nights afterward, Karanis came again to Selephes. As before, he dreamed first of the village that was asleep or dead, and of the abyss down which one must float silently. Then the rift appeared again, and he beheld the glittering minarets of the city, and saw the graceful galleys riding at anchor in the blue harbor, and watched the ginkgo trees of Mount Aaron swaying in the sea breeze. But this time he was not snatched away, and like a winged being settled gradually over a grassy hillside, till finally his feet rested gently on the turf. He had indeed come back to the valley of Uthnargai and the splendid city of Selephes. Down the hill, amid scented grasses and brilliant flowers, walked Karanas, over the bubbling Naraxa on the small wooden bridge where he had carved his name so many years ago, and through the whispering grove to the great stone bridge by the city gate. All was as of old, nor were the marble walls discolored, nor the polished bronze statues upon them tarnished, and Karanis saw that he need not tremble lest the things he knew be vanished. For even the sentries on the ramparts were the same, and still as young as he remembered them. When he entered the city, past the bronze gates and over the onyx pavements, the merchants and camel drivers greeted him as if he had never been away. And it was the same at the turquoise temple of Hathnortha, where the orchid-wreathed priests told him that there is no time in Uthnarga but only perpetual youth. Then Karanis walked through the street of pillars to the seaward wall, where gathered the traders and sailors and strange men from the regions where the sea meets the sky. There he stayed long, gazing out over the bright harbor where the ripples sparkled beneath an unknown sun, and where rowed lightly the galleys from far places over the water. And he gazed also upon Mount Aaron, rising regally from the shore, its lower slopes green with swaying trees, and its white summit touching the sky. More than ever, Karanis wished to sail in a galley to the far places of which he had heard so many strange tales, and he sought again the captain who had agreed to carry him so long ago. He found the man, a thief, sitting on the same chest of spice he had sat on before, and the thief seemed not to realize that any time had passed. Then the two rode to a galley in the harbor, and giving orders to the oarmen, commenced to sail out into the billowy Serenarian Sea that leads to the sky. For several days they glided undulatingly over the water, till finally they came to the horizon where the sea meets the sky. Here the galley paused not at all, but floated easily in the blue of the sky among fleecy clouds tinted with rain. And far beneath the keel, Karanis could see strange lands and rivers and cities of surpassing beauty spread indolently in the sunshine, which seemed never to lessen or disappear. At length, the thief told him that their journey was near its end, and that they would soon enter the harbor of Serania, the pink marble sea of the clouds, which is built on that ethereal coast where the west wind flows into the sky. But as the highest of the city's carven towers came into sight, there was a sound somewhere in space, and Karanis awaked in his London garret. For many months after that, Karanis sought the marvelous city of Selephes and its sky-bound galleys in vain, and though his dreams carried him to many gorgeous and unheard-of places, no one whom he met could tell him how to find Uthnargai beyond the Tenarian Hills. One night, 
He went flying over dark mountains where there were faint, lone campfires at great distances apart, and strange, shaggy herds with tinkling bells on the leaders. And in the wildest part of this hilly country, so remote that few men could ever have seen it, he found a hideously ancient wall or causeway of stone zigzagging along the ridges and valleys too gigantic ever to have risen by human hands, and of such a length that neither end of it could be seen. Beyond that wall in the gray dawn he came to a land of quaint gardens and cherry trees, and when the sun rose he beheld such beauty of red and white flowers, green foliage and lawns, white paths, diamond brooks, blue lakelets, carven bridges and red-roofed pagodas that he for a moment forgot Celephase in sheer delight. But he remembered it again when he walked down a white path toward a red-roofed pagoda and would have questioned the people of this land about it had he not found that there were no people there but only birds and bees and butterflies. On another night Tyrannus walked up a damp stone spiral stairway endlessly and came to a tower window overlooking a mighty plain and river lit by the full moon. And in the silent city that spread away from the river bank he thought he beheld some feature or arrangement which he had known before. He would have descended and asked the way to East Nargai had not a fearsome aurora sputtered up from some remote place beyond the horizon, showing the ruin and antiquity of the city, and the stagnation of the reedy river, and the death lying upon that land, as it had lain since King Kynaratholus came home from his conquests to find the vengeance of the gods. So Karana sought fruitlessly for the marvelous city of Selephes and its galleys that sailed to Saranian in the sky, meanwhile seeing many wonders, and once barely escaping from the high priest not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face, and dwells all alone in a prehistoric stone monastery in the cold desert plateau of Lang. In time, he grew so impatient of the bleak intervals of the day that he began buying drugs in order to increase his periods of sleep. Hashish helped a great deal, and once set him to a part of space where form does not exist, but where glowing gases study the secrets of existence. And a violet-colored gas told him that this part of space was outside what he had called infinity. The gas had not heard of planets and organisms before, but identified Karanus merely as one from the infinity where matter, energy, and gravitation exist. Karanus was now very anxious to return to minaret-studded Selephes, and increased his doses of drugs, but eventually he had no more money left, and could buy no drugs. Then one summer day he was turned out of his garret, and wandered aimlessly through the streets, drifting over a bridge to a place where the houses grew thinner and thinner. And it was there that fulfillment came, and he met the cortege of knights come from Selephes to bear him thither forever. Handsome knights they were, astride roan horses and clad in shining armor with tabards of cloth of gold curiously emblazoned. So numerous were they that Karanus almost mistook them for an army, but they were sent in his honor, since it was he who had created Uthnargai in his dreams, on which account he was now to be appointed its chief god forevermore. Then they gave Karanus a horse and placed him at the head of the cavalcade, and all rode majestically through the downs of Surrey and onward toward the region where Karanus and his ancestors were born. It was very strange, but as the riders went on they seemed to gallop back through time. For wherever they passed through a village in the twilight, 
they saw only such houses and villages as Chaucer or men before him might have seen, and sometimes they saw knights on horseback with small companies of retainers. When it grew dark they traveled more swiftly, till soon they were flying uncannily as if in the air. In this dim dawn they came upon the village which Karanus had seen alive in his childhood, and asleep or dead in his dreams. It was alive now, and early villagers curtsied as the horsemen clattered down the street and turned off into the lane that ends in the abyss of dreams. Karanus had previously entered that abyss only at night, and wondered what it would look like by day so he watched anxiously as the column approached its brink. Just as they galloped up the rising ground to the precipice, a golden glare came somewhere out of the west and hid all the landscape in effulgent draperies. The abyss was a seething chaos of roseate and cerulean splendor, and invisible voices sang exultantly as the nightly entourage plunged over the edge and floated gracefully down past glittering clouds and silvery coruscations. Endlessly down the horsemen floated, their chargers pawing the ether as if galloping over golden sands, and then the luminous vapors spread apart to reveal a greater brightness, the brightness of the city Celephase, and the sea coast beyond, and the snowy peak overlooking the sea, and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward distant regions where the sea meets the sky. And Karanus reigned thereafter over Uthnargai and all the neighboring regions of dream, and held his court alternately in Celephase and in the cloud-fashioned Seranium. He reigns there still, and will reign happily forever, Though below the cliffs at Innsmouth, the channel tides played mockingly with the body of a tramp who had stumbled through the half-deserted village of Dawn, played mockingly, and cast it upon the rocks by ivy-covered Trevor Towers, where a notably fat and especially offensive millionaire brewer enjoys the purchased atmosphere of extinct nobility. End of Celephase. Recording by Garrett Fitzgerald, Brewer, Maine. Recording by Joseph Canna. The Crawling Chaos by H. P. Lovecraft. Of the pleasures and pains of opium, much has been written. The ecstasies and horrors of De Quincey and the Paradise Artificialis of Baudelaire are preserved and interpreted with an art which makes them immortal, and the world knows well the beauty, the terror, and the mystery of those obscure realms into which the inspired dreamer is transported. But much, as has been told, no man has yet dared intimate the nature of the phantasms thus unfolded to the mind, or hint at the direction of the unheard of roads along whose ornate and exotic course the partaker of the drug is so irresistibly borne. De Quincey was drawn back into Asia, the teeming land of nebulous shadows whose hideous antiquity is so impressive that the vast age of the race and name overpowers the sense of youth in the individual. But farther than that, he dared not go. Those who have gone farther seldom return, and even when they have, they have been either silent or quite mad. I took opium once. In the year of the plague, when the doctors sought to deaden the agonies they could not cure, there was an overdose. My physician was worn out with horror and exertion. And I traveled very far indeed. In the end I returned and lived, but my nights are filled with strange memories, nor have I permitted a doctor to give me opium again. The pain and pounding in my head had been quite unendurable when the drug was administered. Of the future I had no heed. To escape, whether by cure, unconsciousness, or death, was all that concerned me. I was partly delirious, so that it is hard to place the exact moment of transition, but I think the effect must have begun shortly before the pounding ceased to be painful. As I have said, there was an overdose, so my reactions were probably far from normal. The sensation of falling, curiously disassociated from the idea of gravity or direction, was paramount. Though there were subsidiary impressions of unseen throngs and incalculable profusion, throngs of infinitely diverse nature, but all more or less related to me. 
Sometimes it seemed less as though I were falling than as though the universe or the ages were falling past me. Suddenly my pain ceased, and I began to associate the pounding with an external rather than an internal force. The falling had ceased also, giving place to a sensation of uneasy temporary rest. And when I listened closely, I fancied the pounding was that of the vast, inscrutable sea as its sinister, colossal breakers lacerated some desolate shore after a storm of titanic magnitude. Then I opened my eyes. For a moment, my surroundings seemed confused, like a projected image hopelessly out of focus. But gradually, I realized my solitary presence in a strange and beautiful room lighted by many windows. Of the exact nature of the apartment, I could form no idea, for my thoughts were still from settle. But I noticed van-colored rugs and draperies, elaborately fashioned tables, chairs, ottomans, and divans, and delicate vases and ornaments which conveyed a suggestion of the exotic without actually being alien. These things I noticed, yet they were not long uppermost in my mind. Slowly, but inabsorbably, crawling upon my consciousness and rising above every other impression came a dizzying fear of the unknown, a fear of the greater, because I could not analyze it, and seeming to concern a stealthily approaching menace, not death, but some nameless, unheard of thing inexpressibly more ghastly and abhorrent and shrank from glancing through the arched lattice windows that opened so bewilderingly on every hand. Perceiving shutters attached to these windows, I closed them all, averting my eyes from the exterior as I did so. Then, employing a flint and steel which I found on one of the small tables, I lit many candles reposing the walls in arabesque sconces. The added sense of security brought by closed shutters and artificial light calmed my nerves to some degree, but I could not shut out the monotonous pounding. Now that I was calmer, the sound became as fascinated as it was fearful, and I felt a contradictory desire to seek out its source, despite my still powerful shrinking. Opening a portiere on the side of the room nearing the pounding, I beheld a small and richly draped corridor, ending in a cavern door and large oriel windows. To this window, I was irresistibly drawn, though my ill-defined apprehension seemed almost equally bent on holding me back. As I approached it, I could see a chaotic whirl of waters in the distance. Then, as I attained it and glanced out on all sides, the stupendous picture of my surroundings burst upon me with full and devastating force. I beheld such a sight as I had never beheld before, and which no living person can have seen save in the delirium of fever or the inferno of opium. The building stood on a narrow point of land, or what was now a narrow point of land, fully three hundred feet above what must lately have been a seething vortex of mad water. On either side of the house there was a newly washed out precipice of red earth, whilst ahead of me the hideous waves were still rolling and frightfully eating away the land with ghastly monotony and deliberation. Out a mile or more there rose and fell menacing breakers at least fifty feet in height, and on the far horizon ghoulish black clouds of grotesque contour were resting and brooding like unwholesome vultures. The waves were dark and purplish, almost black, and clutched at the yielding red mud of the bank as if it with uncouth, greedy hands, and could not but feel that some noxious marine mind had declared a war of extermination upon all the solid ground, perhaps abetted by the angry sky. Recovering at length from the stupor into which this unnatural spectacle had thrown me, I realized that my physical danger was acute. Even whilst I gazed, the bank had lost many feet, and it could not be long before the house would fall undermined into this awful pit of lashing waves. Accordingly, I hastened to the opposite side of the edifice, and finding a door emerged at once, unlocking it after me with a curious key which had hung inside. I now beheld more of the strange region about me, and marked a singular division which seemed to exist in the hostile ocean and firmament. On each side of the jutting promontory, different conditions held sway. At my left, as I faced inland, was a gently heaving sea with great green waves rolling peacefully in under a brightly shining sun. Something about that sun's nature and position made me shudder. But I could not tell then, and could not tell now, what it was. At my right also was the sea, but it was blue, calm, and only gently undulating, while the sky above it was darker and the washed-out bank more nearly white than reddish. I now turned my attention to the land, and found occasion for fresh surprise, for the vegetation resembled nothing I had seen or read about. It was apparently tropical, or at least subtropical, a conclusion born out of the intense heat of the air. Sometimes, I thought, I could trace strange analogies with the flora of my native land, fancying the well-known plants and shrubs might assume such forms under the radical change of climate. 
but that gigantic and omnipresent palm trees were plainly foreign. The house I had just left was very small, hardly more than a cottage, but its material was evidently marble, and its architecture was weird and composite, involving a quaint fusion of western and eastern forms. At the corners were Corinthian columns, where the red tile roof was like that of a Chinese pagoda. From the door inland there stretched a path of singularly white sand, about four feet wide, and lined either side with strange palms, unidentifiable flowering shrubs and plants. It lay toward the side of the promontory where the sea was blue and the bank rather whitish. Down this path I felt impelled to flee, as if pursued by some malignant spirit from the pounding ocean. At first it was slightly uphill, then I reached a gentle crest. Behind me I saw the scene I had left, the entire point with the cottage and black water, with the green sea on one side and the blue sea on the other, and a curse unnamed and unnameable lowering over all. I never saw it again, and often wonder. After this last look, I strode ahead and surveyed the inland panorama before me. The path, as I have intimated, ran along the right-hand shore as one went inland. Ahead and to the left, I now viewed a magnificent valley comprising thousands of acres and covered with a swaying growth of tropical grass higher than my head. Almost at the limit of vision was a colossal palm tree, which seemed to fascinate and beckon me. By this time, wonder and escape from the imperiled peninsula had largely dissipated my fear. But as I paused and sank fatigued to the path, idly digging with my hands into the warm, whitish golden sand, a new and acute sense of danger seized me. Some terror in the swishing tall grass seemed added to that of the diabolically pounding sea, and I started up crying and disjointly, Tiger? Tiger? Is it tiger? Beast? Beast? Is it beast that I am afraid of? My mind wandered back to the ancient and classical story of tigers, which I had read. I strove to recall the author, but had difficulty. Then, in the midst of my fear, I remembered that the tale was by Rudyard Kipling, nor did the grotesqueness of deeming him an ancient author occur to me. I wished for the volume containing this story, and had almost started back toward the doomed cottage to procure it, but my better sense and the lure of the palm prevented me. Whether or not I could have resisted the backward beckoning without the counter-fascination of this vast palm tree, I do not know. This attraction was now dominant, and I left the path and crawled on hands and knees down the valley's slope despite my fears of the grass and of the serpents it might contain. I resolved to fight for life and reason as long as possible against all menaces of land or sea, though I sometimes feared defeat as the maddening swish of the uncanny grasses joined the still audible and the irritating pounding of the distant breakers. I would frequently pause and put my hands to my ears for relief, but could never quite shut out the detestable sound. It was, as it seemed to me, only after ages that I finally dragged myself to the beckoning palm tree and lay quiet beneath its protecting shade. There now ensued a series of incidents which transported me to the opposite extremes of ecstasy and horror, incidents which I trembled to recall and dare not seek to interpret. No sooner had I crawled beneath the overhanging foliage of the palm than there dropped from its branches a young child of such beauty as I never beheld before. Though ragged and dusty, this being bore the features of a fawn or demigod. It seemed almost to diffuse a radiance in the dense shadow of the tree. It smiled and extended its hand, but before I could arise and speak, I heard in the upper air the exquisite melody of singing, notes high and low blent with the sublime and ethereal harmoniousness. The sun had by this time sunk below the horizon, and in the twilight I saw an aureole of lambent light encircled the child's head. Then in a tone of silver it addressed me. It is the end. They have come down through the gloaming from the stars. Now all is over, and beyond the Arenurian streams we shall dwell blissfully in Tello. As the child spoke, I beheld a soft radiance through the leaves of the palm tree, and rising greeted a pair whom I knew to be the chief singers among those I had heard. A god and goddess they must have been, for such beauty is not mortal. And they took my hand, saying, Come, child, you have heard the voices, and all is well. In Tello beyond the Milky Way, and in the Arenurian streams are cities all of amber and calcity, and upon their domes of many facets glisten the images of strange and beautiful stars. Under the ivory bridges of Tello flow rivers of liquid gold, bearing pleasure barges bound for blossomy Cytherian of the Seven Suns, and in Tello and the Cytherian abide only youth, beauty, and pleasure, nor are any sounds heard save of laughter, song, and the lute. Only the gods dwell in Tello of the Golden Rivers, 
but among them shalt thou dwell. As I listened, enchanted, I suddenly became aware of the change in my surroundings. The palm tree so lately overshadowed my exhausting form was now some distance to my left, and considerably below me. I was obviously floating in the atmosphere, companioned not only by the strange child and the radiant pair, but by a constantly increasing throng of half-luminous, fine-crowned youths and maidens with wind-blown hair and joyful countenance. We slowly ascended together, as if borne on a fragrant breeze, which blew not from the earth, but from the golden nebula, and the child whispered in my ear that I must look always upward to the pathways of light, and never backward to the sphere I had just left. The youths and maidens now chanted mellifluous choriambics to the accompaniment of lutes, and I felt enveloped in a peace and happiness more profound than any I had in life imagined when the intrusion of a single sound altered my destiny and shattered my soul. Through the ravishing strains of the singers and the lutenists, as if in mocking demonic concord, robbed from gulfs below the damnable and detestable pounding of that hideous ocean, as those black breakers beat their message into my ears, I forgot the words of the child and looked back down upon the doomed scene from which I thought I had escaped. Down through the ether I saw the accursed earth, slowly turning, ever turning with angry and tempestuous seas, gnawing at the wild, desolate shores and dashing foam against the tottering towers of a deserted cities. And under a ghastly moon there gleam sights I can never describe, sights I can never forget, deserts of corpse-like clay and jungles of ruin and decadence where once stretched the populous plains and villages of my native land, and maelstroms of frothing ocean where once rose the mighty temples of my forefathers. Round the northern pole streamed a morass of noisome growths and miasmal vapors, hissing before the onslaught of the ever-mounting waves that curled and fretted from the shuddering deep. Then, a rending report claved the night, and athwart the desert of deserts appeared a smoking rift. Still the black ocean foamed and gnawed, eating away the desert on either side as the rift in the center widened and widened. There was now no land left but the desert, and still the fuming ocean ate and ate, all at once, I thought even the pounding sea seemed afraid of something, afraid of dark gods of the inner earth that are greater than the evil gods of water. But even if it was, it could not turn back, and the desert had suffered too much from those nightmare waves to help them now. So the ocean ate the last of the land and poured into the smoking gulf, thereby giving up all it had ever conquered from the newly flooded lands that flowed again, uncovering death and decay and from its ancient and immemorial bed it trickled loathsomely, uncovering nighted secrets of the years when time was young and the gods unborn. Above the waves rose weedy remembered spires, the moon lay pale lilies of light on dead London, and Paris stood from its damp grave to be sacrificed with stardust. Then rose spires and monoliths that were weedy but not remembered, terrible spires and monoliths of land that men never knew were lands. There was not any pounding now, but only the unearthly roaring and hissing of waters tumbling into the rift. The smoke of that rift had changed to steam, and almost hid the world as it grew denser and denser. It seared my face and hands, and when I looked to see how it affected my companions, I found they had all disappeared. Then very suddenly it ended. I knew no more till I awakened upon a bed of convalescence. As the cloud of steam from the plutonic gulf finally concealed the entire surface from my sight, all the firmament shrieked in a sudden agony of mad reverberations which shook the trembling ether. And one delirious flash and burst it happened. One blinding, deafening holocaust fire, smoke, and thunder that dissolved the wan moon, and it sped outward to the void. And when the smoke cleared, and I sought to look upon the earth, I beheld against a background of cold, humorous stars only the dying sun and the pale, mournful planets searching for their sister. End of the Crawling Chaos by H.P. Lovecraft. Recording by Joseph Canna, Chicago, Illinois. Recording by Michael Sample, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, 2008. Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. 
Penniless and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think, from my slavery to morphine, that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was to supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation, so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awakened, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me, that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might, nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking, or brooding, in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, 
an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon that had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illuminate. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscence of Paradise Lost and Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with some difficulty down the rocks and stood on a gentler slope beneath gazing into the Stygian deeps, where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object which gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distant impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the seas since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, was an array of bas-reliefs whose subject would have excited the envy of a door. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine, which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer, they were damnably human in the general outline, 
Despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seemed to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but a little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemous-like, and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I knew that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist, and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease, and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave and now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information of the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply, I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of a puny war exhausted mankind, of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand! The window! The window! End of Dagon. This has been a recording by Michael Sample, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, 2008. Recording by Matt Bonha The Doom That Came to Sarnath by H.P. Lovecraft There is, in the land of Minar, a vast, still lake that is fed by no stream, and out of which no stream flows. Ten thousand years ago, there stood by its shore the mighty city of Sarnath, but Sarnath stands there no more. 
It is told that in the immemorial years, when the world was young, before ever the men of Sarnath came to the land of Manar, another city stood beside the lake, the grey stone city of Ib, which was as old as the lake itself, and peopled by beings not pleasing to behold. Very odd and ugly were these beings, as indeed are most beings of a world yet inchoate and rudely fashioned. It is written on the brit cylinders of Hedatharon that the beings of Ib were in hue as green as the lake and the mists that rise above it, that they had bulging eyes, pouting, flabby lips, and curious ears, and were without voice. It is also written that they descended one night from the moon in a mist, they and the vast still lake in the grey stone city Ib. However this may be, it is certain that they worship a sea-green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of Bakrug, the great water lizard, before which they danced horribly when the moon was given. And it is written in the papyrus of Ilarnet that one day they discovered fire, and thereafter kindled flames on many ceremonial occasions. But not much is written of these beings, because they lived in very ancient times, and man is young and knows but little of the very ancient living things. After many eons, men came to the land of Menar, dark shepherd folk with their fleecy flocks, who built Pra, Ilarnek, and Kadatharon on the winding river Ai. And certain tribes, more hardy than the rest, pushed on to the border of the lake and built Sarnath at a spot where precious metals were found in the earth. Not far from the grey city of Ib did the wandering tribes lay the first stones of Sarnath, and at the beings of Ib they marveled greatly. But with their marveling was mixed hate, for they thought it not meet that beings of such aspect should walk about the world of men at dusk, nor did they like the strange sculptures upon the grey monoliths of Ib, for why those sculptures lingered so late in the world, even until the coming of men, none can tell, unless it is because the land of Manar is very still and remote from most other lands, both of waking and of dream. As the men of Sarnath beheld more of the beings of Ib, their hate grew, and it was not less because they found the beings weak and soft as jelly to the touch of stones and arrows. So one day, the young warriors, the slingers, and the spearmen, and the bowmen, marched against Ib, and slew all the inhabitants thereof, pushing the queer bodies into the lake with long spears, because they did not wish to touch them. And because they did not like the grey sculpted monoliths of Ib, they cast these also into the lake, wondering from the greatness of the labor however the stones were brought from afar, as they must have been since there is not like them in the land of Manar or the lands adjacent. Thus, of the very ancient city of Ib, nothing was spared, save the sea-green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of Bakrug, the water lizard. This the young warriors took back with them as a symbol of conquest over the old gods and beings of Th, and as a sign of leadership in Manar. But on the night after it was set up in the temple, a terrible thing must have happened, for weird lights were seen over the lake, and in the morning the people found the idol gone, and the high priest, Taran Ish, lying dead, as from some fear unspeakable. And before he died, Taran Ish had scrawled upon the altar of chrysolite, in coarse, shaky strokes, the sign of doom. After Taran Ish, there were many high priests in Sarnath, but never was the sea green stone idol found and many centuries came and went, wherein Sarnath prospered exceedingly, so that only priests and old women remembered what Haran Ish had scrawled upon the altar of Chrysolite. Betwixt Sarnath and the city of Ilarnek arose a caravan route, and the precious metals from the earth were exchanged for other metals and rare cloths and jewels and books and tools for artificers and all things of luxury that are known to the people who dwell along the winding river Ai and beyond. So Sarnath waxed mighty, and learned, and beautiful, and sent forth conquering armies to subdue the neighboring cities. And in time there sat upon a throne in Sarnath the kings of all the land of Manar, and of many lands adjacent. 
The wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind was Sarnath the Magnificent, a polished desert-quarried marble were its walls, in height 300 cubits and in breadth 75, so that chariots might pass each other as men drove them along the top. For full 500 stadia did they run, being open only on the side toward the lake, where a green stone seawall kept back the waves that rose oddly once a year at the festival of the destroying of Ib. In Sarnath were fifty streets, from the lake to the gates of the caravans, and fifty more intersecting them, with onyx where they paved, save those whereupon the horses and camels and elephants trod, which were paved with granite. And the gates of Sarnath were as many as the landward ends of the streets, each of bronze, and flanked by the figures of lions and elephants, carven from some stone no longer known among men. The houses of Sarnath were of glazed brick and chalcedony, each having its walled garden and crystal lakelet. With strange art were they builded, for no other city had houses like them, and travelers from Thra and Alarnic and Kadatharon marveled at the shining domes wherewith they were surmounted. But more marvelous still were the palaces and the temples and the gardens made by Zokar the Olden King. There were many palaces, the last of which were mightier than any in Thra or Larnek or Gadatharon. So high were they that one within might sometimes fancy himself beneath only the sky. Yet, when lighted with torches dipped in the oil of Dothar, their walls showed vast paintings of kings and armies of a splendor at once inspiring and stupefying to the beholder. Many were the pillars of the palaces, all of tinted marble, and carven into designs of surpassing beauty. And in most of the palaces the floors were mosaics of beryl and lapis lazuli, and sardonyx and carbuncle and other choice materials, so disposed that the beholder might fancy himself walking over beds of the rarest flowers. And there were likewise fountains, which cast scented waters about in pleasing jets arranged with cunning art. Outshining all others was the palace of the kings of Menar and of the lands adjacent. On a pair of golden crouching lions rested the throne, many steps above the gleaming floor. And it was wrought of one piece of ivory, though no man lives who knows whence so vast a piece could have come. In that palace there were also many galleries and many amphitheaters where lions and men and elephants battled at the pleasure of the kings. Sometimes the amphitheaters were flooded with water conveyed from the lake in mighty aqueducts, and then were enacted stirring sea fights or combats betwixt swimmers and deadly marine things. Lofty and amazing were the seventeen tower-like temples of Sarnath, fashioned of a bright multicolored stone not known elsewhere. A full thousand cubits high stood the greatest among them, wherein the high priests dwelt with a magnificence scarce less than that of the kings. On the ground were halls as vast and splendid as those of the palaces, where gathered throngs in worship of Zokalar and Tamash and Loban, the chief gods of Sarnath, whose incense enveloped shrines were as the thrones of monarchs. Not like the icons of other gods were those of Zokalar and Tamash and Loban, for so close to life were they that one might swear the graceful bearded gods themselves sat on the ivory thrones. And up unending steps of Zircon was the tower chamber, wherefrom the high priests looked out over the city and the plains and the lake by day, and at the cryptic moon and significant stars and planets and their reflections in the lake at night. Here was done the very secret and ancient rite in detestation of Bakrug, the water lizard, and here rested the altar of Chrysolite, which bore the doomed scrawl of Turan Ish. Wonderful likewise were the gardens made by Zokar, the olden king. In the center of Sarnath they lay, covering a great space and encircled by a high wall and they were surmounted by a mighty dome of glass, through which shone the sun and moon and planets when it was clear, and from which were hung fulgent images of the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was not clear. In summer, the gardens were cooled with fresh odorous breezes wafted by fans, and in winter they were heated with concealed fires, 
so that in those gardens it was always spring. There ran little streams over bright pebbles, dividing meads of green and gardens of many hues, and spanned by a multitude of bridges. Many were the waterfalls in their courses, and many were the huge lakelets into which they expanded. Over the streams and lakelets rode white swans, whilst the music of rare birds chimed in with the melody of the waters. In order to terraces rose the green banks, adorned here and there with bowers of vines and sweet blossoms, and seats and benches of marble and porphyry. And there were many small shrines and temples where one might rest or pray to the small gods. Each year there was celebrated in Sarnath the feast of the destroying of Ib, at which time wine, song, dancing, and merriment of every kind abounded. Great honors were laid to the shades of those who had annihilated the odd ancient beings, and the memory of those beings and of their elder gods was derided by dancers and lutenists crowned with roses from the gardens of Zokar. And the kings would look out over the lake and curse the bones of the dead that lay beneath it. At first, the high priests liked not these festivals, for there had descended among them queer tales of how the sea green icon had vanished, and how Taran Ish had died from fear and left a warning. And they said that from their high tower they sometimes saw lights beneath the waters of the lake. But as many years passed without calamity, even the priests laughed and cursed and joined in the orgies of the feasters. Indeed, had they not themselves in their high tower often performed the very ancient and secret rite and detestation of Bokrug the water lizard, and a thousand years of riches and delight passed over Sarnath, wonder of the world. Gorgeous beyond thought was the feast of the thousandth year of the destroying of Ib, for a decade had it been talked of in the land of Minar, and as it drew nigh, there came to Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, men from Throth, Ilarnek, and Kadatharon, and all the cities of Minar and the lands beyond. Before the marble walls on the appointed night were pitched the pavilions of princes and the tents of travelers. Within his banquet hall reclined Nargis High, the king, drunken with ancient wine from the vaults of conquered Panath, and surrounded by feasting nobles and hurrying slaves. There were eaten many strange delicacies that feast, peacocks from the distant hills of Limplan, heels of camels from the Benazic desert, nuts and spices from Sindathrian groves, and pearls from wave-washed metal dissolved in the vinegar of Thra. Of sauces, there were an untold number, prepared by the subtlest cooks in all Manar, and suited to the palate of every feaster. But most prized of all the viands were the great fishes from the lake, each of vast size, and served upon golden platters set with rubies and diamonds. Whilst the king and his nobles feasted within the palace, and viewed the crowning dish as it awaited them on golden platters, others feasted elsewhere. In the tower of the great temple, the priests held revels, and in pavilions without the walls, the princes of neighboring lands made merry. And it was the high priest, Gnai Ka, who first saw the shadows that descended from the gibbous moon into the lake, and the damnable green mists that rose from the lake to meet the moon, and to shroud in a sinister haze the towers and the domes of fated Sarnath. Thereafter, those in the towers and without the walls beheld strange lights on the water, and saw that the gray rock Akurion, which was wont to rear high above it near the shore, was almost submerged. And fear grew vaguely yet swiftly, so that the princes of Ilarnet and of Far Rakhol took down and folded their tents and pavilions and departed, though they scarce knew the reason for their departing. Then, close to the hour of midnight, all the bronze gates of Sarnath burst open and emptied forth a frenzied throng that blackened the plain, so that all the visiting princes and travelers fled away in fright. For on the faces of this throng was writ a madness born of horror unendurable, and on their tongues were words so terrible that no hearer paused for proof. 
men whose eyes were wild with fear shrieked aloud at the sight within the king's banquet hall, where through the windows were seen no longer the forms of Nargis High and his nobles and slaves, but a horde of indescribable green voiceless things with bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips and curious ears, things which danced horribly, bearing in their paws golden plates set with rubies and diamonds and containing uncouth flames. And the princes and travelers, as they fled from the doomed city of Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, looked back again upon the mist-beginning lake and saw the gray rock Kurion was quite submerged. Through all the land of Minar and the land adjacent spread the tales of those who had fled from Sarnath, and caravans sought that accursed city and its precious metals no more. It was long ere any travel went thither, and even then only the brave and adventurous young men of yellow hair and blue eyes, who were no kin to the men of Minar. These men indeed went to the lake to view Sarnath, but though they found the vast still lake itself, and the great rock Kurion which rears high above it near the shore, they beheld not the wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind. Where once had risen walls of three hundred cubits and towers yet higher, now stretched only the marshy shore. Where once had dwelt fifty million men, now crawled the detestable water lizard. Not even the mines of precious metal remained. Doom had come to Sarnath. But half buried in the rushes was spied a curious green idol, an exceedingly ancient idol, chiseled in the likeness of Bakrug, the great water lizard. That idol, enshrined in the high temple at Alarnet, was subsequently worshipped beneath the gibbous moon throughout the land of Manar. End of The Doom That Came to Sarnath Recording by Matt Bonha Recording by James Pontolillo. Ex Oblivione by H. P. Lovecraft. When the last days were upon me, and the ugly trifles of existence began to drive me to madness like the small drops of water that torturers let fall ceaselessly upon one spot of their victim's body, I loved the irradiate refuge of sleep. In my dreams, I found a little of the beauty I had vainly sought in life, and wandered through old gardens and enchanted woods. Once, when the wind was soft and scented, I heard the south calling, and sailed endlessly and languorously under strange stars. Once, when the gentle rain fell, I glided in a barge down a sunless stream under the earth, till I reached another world of purple twilight, iridescent arbors, and undying roses. And once I walked through a golden valley that led to shadowy groves and ruins, and ended in a mighty wall green with antique vines, and pierced by a little gate of bronze. Many times I walked through that valley, and longer and longer would I pause in the spectral half-light where the giant trees squirmed and twisted grotesquely, and the gray ground stretched damply from trunk to trunk, sometimes disclosing the mold-stained stones of buried temples. And always the goal of my fancies was the mighty vine-grown wall with the little gate of bronze therein. After a while, as the days of waking became less and less bearable from their grayness and sameness, I would often drift in opiate peace through the valley and the shadowy groves, and wonder how I might seize them for my eternal dwelling place, so that I need no more crawl back to a dull world stripped of interest and new colors. And as I looked upon the little gate in the mighty wall, I felt that beyond it lay a dream country from which once it was entered, there would be no return. So each night in sleep I strove to find the hidden latch of the gate in the ivied antique wall, though it was exceedingly well hidden, and I would tell myself that the realm beyond the wall was not more lasting merely, 
but more lovely and radiant as well. Then, one night in the dream city of Zakarian, I found a yellow papyrus filled with the thoughts of dream sages who dwelt of old in that city, and who were too wise ever to be born in the waking world. Therein were written many things concerning the world of dream, and among them was lore of a golden valley, and a sacred grove with temples, and a high wall pierced by a little bronze gate. When I saw this lore, I knew that it touched on the scenes I had haunted, and I therefore read long in the yellow papyrus. Some of the dream sages wrote gorgeously of the wonders beyond the irrepassable gate, but others told of horror and disappointment. I knew not which to believe, yet longed more and more to cross forever into the unknown land. For doubt and secrecy are the lure of lures, and no new horror can be more terrible than the daily torture of the commonplace. So when I learned of the drug which would unlock the gate and drive me through, I resolved to take it when next I awaked. Last night I swallowed the drug and floated dreamily into the golden valley and the shadowy groves. And when I came this time to the antique wall, I saw that the small gate of bronze was ajar. From beyond came a glow that weirdly lit the giant twisted trees and the tops of the buried temples, and I drifted on songfully expectant of the glories of the land from whence I should never return. But as the gate swung wider and the sorcery of the drug and the dream pushed me through, I knew that all sights and glories were at an end, for in that new realm was neither land nor sea, but only the white void of unpeopled and illimitable space. So, happier than I had ever dared hope to be, I dissolved again into that native infinity of crystal oblivion from which the daemon life had called me for one brief and desolate hour. This is the end of Ex Oblivione by H. P. Lovecraft. Recording by Victoria Horseman. Facts Concerning the Late Arthur German and His Family by H.P. Lovecraft Part 1 Life is a hideous thing, and from the background behind what we know of it, peer demoniacal hints of truth which make it sometimes a thousandfold more hideous. Science, already oppressive with its shocking revelations, will perhaps be the ultimate exterminator of our human species, if separate species we be. For its reserve of unguessed horrors could never be borne by mortal brains if loosed upon the world. If we knew what we are, we should do as Sir Arthur German did. And Arthur German soaked himself in oil and set fire to his clothing one night. No one placed the charred fragments in an urn or set a memorial to him who had been. For certain papers and a certain boxed object were found which made men wish to forget. Some who knew him do not admit that he ever existed. Arthur German went out on the moor and burned himself. After seeing the boxed object which had come from Africa. It was this object and not his peculiar personal appearance which made him end his life. Many would have disliked to live if possessed of the peculiar features of Arthur German, but he had been a poet and a scholar and had not minded. Learning was in his blood, for his great-grandfather, Sir Robert German Baronet, had been an anthropologist of note, whilst his great-great-great-grandfather, Sir Wade German, was one of the earliest explorers of the Congo region, and had written eruditely of its tribes, animals, and supposed antiquities. Indeed, 
old Sir Wade had possessed an intellectual zeal amounting almost to a mania. His bizarre conjectures on a prehistoric white Congolese civilization, earning him much ridicule when his book Observations on the Several Parts of Africa was published. In 1765, this fearless explorer had been placed in a madhouse at Huntingdon. Madness was in all the Germans, and people were glad there were not many of them. The line put forth no branches, and Arthur was the last of it. If he had not been, one cannot say what he would have done when the object came. The Germans never seemed to look quite right. Something was amiss, though Arthur was the worst, and the old family portraits in German house showed fine faces enough before Sir Wade's time. Certainly the madness began with Sir Wade, whose wild stories of Africa were at once the delight and terror of his few friends. It showed in his collection of trophies and specimens, which were not such as a normal man would accumulate and preserve, and appeared strikingly in the oriental seclusion in which he kept his wife. The latter, he had said, was the daughter of a Portuguese trader whom he met in Africa, and did not like English ways. She, with an infant son born in Africa, had accompanied him back from the second and longest of his trips, and had gone with him on the third and last, never returning. No one had ever seen her closely, not even the servants, for her disposition had been violent and singular. During her brief stay at German House, she occupied a remote wing and was waited on by her husband alone. Sir Wade was, indeed, most peculiar in his solicitude for his family, for when he returned to Africa, he would permit no one to care for his young son, save a loathsome black woman from Guinea. Upon coming back, after the death of Lady German, he himself assumed complete care of the boy. But it was the talk of Sir Wade, especially when in his cups, which chiefly led his friends to deem him mad. In a rational age like the 18th century, it was unwise for a man of learning to talk about wild sights and strange scenes under a Congo moon, of the gigantic walls and pillars of a forgotten city crumbling and vine-grown, and of damp, silent stone steps leading interminably down into the darkness of abysmal treasure vaults and inconceivable catacombs. Especially was it unwise to rave of the living things that might haunt such a place, of creatures half of the jungle and half of the impiously aged city, fabulous creatures which even a Pliny might describe with skepticism things that might have sprung up after the great apes had overrun the dying city with the walls and the pillars, the vaults and the weird carvings. Yet, after he came home for the last time, Sir Wade would speak of such matters with a shudderingly uncanny zest, mostly after his third glass at the knight's head, boasting of what he had found in the jungle and of how he had dwelt among terrible ruins known only to him. And finally, he had spoken of the living things in such a manner that he was taken to the madhouse. He had shown little regret when shut into the bard room at Huntingdon, 
for his mind moved curiously. Ever since his son had commenced to grow out of infancy, he had liked his home less and less, till at last he had seemed to dread it. The Knight's Head had been his headquarters, and when he was confined, he expressed some vague gratitude, as if for protection. Three years later, he died. Wade German's son, Philip, was a highly peculiar person. Despite a strong physical resemblance to his father, his appearance and conduct were, in many particulars, so coarse that he was universally shunned. Though he did not inherit the madness which was feared by some, he was densely stupid and given to brief periods of uncontrollable violence. In frame, he was small but intensely powerful and was of incredible agility. Twelve years after succeeding to his title, he married the daughter of his gamekeeper, a person said to be of gypsy extraction. But before his son was born, joined the navy as a common sailor, completing the general disgust which his habits and misalliance had begun. After the close of the American War, he was heard of as a sailor on a merchantman in the African trade, having a kind of reputation for feats of strength and climbing, but finally disappearing one night as his ship lay off the Congo coast. In the son of Sir Philip German, the now accepted family peculiarity took a strange and fatal turn tall and fairly handsome, with a sort of weird eastern grace, despite certain slight oddities of proportion, Robert German began life as a scholar and investigator. It was he who first studied scientifically the vast collection of relics which his mad grandfather had brought from Africa and who made the family name as celebrated in ethnology as an exploration. In 1815, Sir Robert married a daughter of the seventh Viscount Brightholm and was subsequently blessed with three children, the eldest and youngest of whom were never publicly seen on account of deformities in mind and body. Saddened by these family misfortunes, the scientists sought relief in work and made two long expeditions in the interior of Africa. In 1849, his second son, Neville, a singularly repellent person who seemed to combine the surliness of Philip German with the hauteur of the Brightholms, ran away with a vulgar dancer, but was pardoned upon his return in the following year. He came back to German house a widower with an infant son, Alfred, who was one day to be the father of Arthur German. Friends said that it was this series of griefs which unhinged the mind of Sir Robert German Yet it was probably merely a bit of African folklore which caused the disaster. The elderly scholar had been collecting legends of the Onga tribes near the field of his grandfather's and his own explorations, hoping in some way to account for Sir Wade's wild tales of a lost city peopled by strange hybrid creatures. A certain consistency in the strange papers of his ancestor suggested that the madman's imagination might have been stimulated by native myths. On October 19, 1852, the explorer Samuel Seton 
called at German House, with a manuscript of notes collected among the Ungas, believing that certain legends of a gray city of white apes ruled by a white god might prove valuable to the ethnologist. In his conversation, he probably supplied many additional details, the nature of which will never be known, since a hideous series of tragedies suddenly burst into being. When Sir Robert German emerged from his library, he left behind the strangled corpse of the explorer, and before he could be restrained, had put an end to all three of his children, the two who were never seen, and the son who had run away. Neville German died in the successful defense of his own two-year-old son, who had apparently been included in the old man's madly murderous scheme. Sir Robert himself, after repeated attempts at suicide and a stubborn refusal to utter an articulate sound, died of apoplexy in the second year of his confinement. Sir Alfred German was a baronet before his fourth birthday, but his tastes never matched his title. At twenty, he had joined a band of music hall performers, and at thirty-six had deserted his wife and child to travel with an itinerant American circus. His end was very revolting. Among the animals in the exhibition with which he traveled was a huge bull gorilla of lighter color than average, a surprisingly tractable beast of much popularity with the performers. With this gorilla, Alfred German was singularly fascinated, and on many occasions the two would eye each other for long periods through the intervening bars. Eventually, German asked and obtained permission to train the animal. Astonishing audiences and fellow performers alike with his success. One morning in Chicago, as the gorilla and Alfred German were rehearsing an exceedingly clever boxing match, the former delivered a blow of more than usual force, hurting both the body and the dignity of the amateur trainer. Of what followed, members of the greatest show on earth do not like to speak. They did not expect to hear Sir Alfred German emit a shrill, inhuman scream or to see him seize his clumsy antagonist with both hands, dash it to the floor of the cage, and bite fiendishly at its hairy throat. The gorilla was off its guard, but not for long, and before anything could be done by the regular trainer, the body, which had belonged to a baronet, was past recognition. Part Two Arthur German was the son of Sir Alfred German and a musical singer of unknown origin. When the husband and father deserted his family, the mother took the child to German house where there was none left to object to her presence. She was not without notions of what a nobleman's dignity should be and saw to it that her son received the best education which limited money could provide. The family resources were now sadly slender, and German House had fallen into woeful disrepair. But young Arthur loved the old edifice and all its contents. He was not like any other German who had ever lived, for he was a poet and a dreamer. 
Some of the neighboring families who had heard tales of old Sir Wade German's unseen Portuguese wife declared that her Latin blood must be showing itself. But most persons merely sneered at his sensitiveness to beauty, attributing it to his music hall mother, who was socially unrecognized. The poetic delicacy of Arthur German was the more remarkable because of his uncouth personal appearance. Most of the Germans had possessed a subtly odd and repellent cast, but Arthur's case was very striking. It's hard to say just what he resembled, but his expression, his facial angle, and the length of his arms gave a thrill of repulsion to those who met him for the first time. It was the mind and character of Arthur German which atoned for his aspect. Gifted and learned, he took highest honors at Oxford and seemed likely to redeem the intellectual fame of his family. Though of poetic rather than scientific temperament, he planned to continue the work of his forefathers in African ethnology and antiquities, utilizing the truly wonderful though strange collection of Sir Wade. With his fanciful mind, he thought often of the prehistoric civilization in which the mad explorer had so implicitly believed, and would weave tale after tale about the silent jungle mentioned in the latter's wilder notes and paragraphs. For the nebulous utterances concerning a nameless, unsuspected race of jungle hybrids, he had a peculiar feeling of mingled terror and attraction, speculating on the possible basis of such a fancy, and seeking to obtain light among the more recent data gleaned by his great-grandfather and Samuel Seton amongst the Angas. In 1911, after the death of his mother, Sir Arthur German determined to pursue his investigations to the utmost extent. Selling a portion of his estate to obtain the requisite money, he outfitted an expedition and sailed for the Congo. Arranging with Belgian authorities for a party of guides, he spent a year in the Onga and Khan country, finding data beyond the highest of his expectations. Among the Kaliris was an aged chief called Muanu, who possessed not only a highly retentive memory, but a singular degree of intelligence and interests in the old legends. This ancient confirmed every tale which German had heard, adding his own account of the stone city and of the white apes as it had been told to him. According to Mwanu, the gray city and the hybrid creatures were no more, having been annihilated by the warlike Nebengus many years ago. This tribe, after destroying most of the edifices and killing the live beings, had carried off the stuffed goddess which had been the object of their quest, the white ape goddess, which the strange beings worshipped, and which was held by Congo tradition to be the form of one who had reigned as a princess among these beings. Just what the white ape-like creatures could have been, Mwanu had no idea but he thought they were the builders of the ruined city. German could form no conjecture, but by close questioning obtained a very picturesque legend of the stuffed goddess. The eight princess, it was said, became the consort of a great white god who had come out of the west. For a long time they had reigned over the city together, but when they had a son, all three went away. Later, the god and princess had returned, and upon the death of the princess, her
Her divine husband had mummified the body and enshrined it in a vast house of stone where it was worshipped. Then he departed alone. The legend here seemed to present three variants. According to one story, nothing further happened save that the stuffed goddess became a symbol of supremacy for whatever tribe might possess it. It was for this reason that the Nabangus carried it off. A second story told of a god's return and death at the feet of his enshrined wife. A third told of the return of the sun, grown to manhood, or apehood, or godhood, as the case might be, yet unconscious of his identity. Surely, the imaginative blacks had made the most of whatever events might lie behind the extravagant legendary. Of the reality of the jungle city described by Sir Wade, Arthur German had no further doubt, and was hardly astonished when, early in 1912, he came upon what was left of it. Its size must have been exaggerated, yet the stones lying about proved that it was no mere negro village. Unfortunately, no carvings could be found, and the small size of the expedition prevented operations toward clearing the one visible passageway that seemed to lead down into the system of vaults, which Sir Wade had mentioned. The white apes and the stuffed goddess were discussed with all the native chiefs of the region, but it remained for a European to improve on the data offered by old Moanu. Monsieur Verharen, Belgian agent at a trading post on the Congo, believed that he could not only locate but obtain the stuffed goddess of which he had vaguely heard since the once mighty Nabangus were now the submissive servants of King Albert's government, and with but little persuasion could be induced to part with the gruesome deity they had carried off. When German sailed for England, therefore, it was with the exultant probability that he would, within a few months, receive a priceless ethnological relic confirming the wildest of his great great-great-grandfather's narratives, that is, the wildest which he had ever heard. Countrymen near German House had perhaps heard wilder tales handed down from ancestors who had listened to Sir Wade around the table of the Knight's Head. Arthur German waited very patiently for the expected box from Monsieur Verharen. Meanwhile, studying with increased diligence the manuscripts left by his mad ancestor. He began to feel closely akin to Sir Wade, and to seek relics of the latter's personal life in England as well as of his African exploits. Oral accounts of the mysterious and secluded wife had been numerous, but no tangible relic of her stay at German House remained. German wondered what circumstance had prompted or permitted such an effacement, and decided that the husband's insanity was the prime cause. His great-great-great-grandmother, he recalled, was said to have been the daughter of a Portuguese trader in Africa. No doubt, her practical heritage and superficial knowledge of the Dark Continent had caused her to flout Sir Wade's tales of the interior, a thing which such a man would not be likely to forgive. She had died in Africa, perhaps dragged thither by a husband determined to prove what he had told. But as German indulged in these reflections, he could not but smile at their futility, a century and a half after the death of both of his strange progenitors. In June 1913, a letter arrived from Monsieur Verharen, telling of the finding of the stuffed goddess. 
It was, the Belgian averred, a most extraordinary object, an object quite beyond the power of a layman to classify. Whether it was human or simian, only a scientist could determine, and the process of determination would be greatly hampered by its imperfect condition. Time and the Congo climate are not kind to mummies, especially when their preparation is as amateurish as seemed to be the case here. Around the creature's neck had been found a golden chain bearing an empty locket on which were armorial designs. No doubt some hapless traveler's keepsake taken by the Nabangus and hung upon the goddess as a charm. In commenting on the contour of the mummy's face, Monsieur Verheren suggested a whimsical comparison, or rather expressed a humorous wonder just how it would strike his correspondent. But was much too interested scientifically to waste many words in levity. The stuffed goddess, he wrote, would arrive, duly packed, about a month after receipt of the letter. The boxed object was delivered at German House on the afternoon of August 3rd, 1913, being conveyed immediately to the large chamber which housed the collection of African specimens as arranged by Sir Robert and Arthur. What ensued can best be gathered by the tales of servants and from things and papers later examined. Of the various tales, that of aged Soames, the family butler, is most ample and coherent. According to this trustworthy man, Sir Arthur German dismissed everyone from the room before opening the box, though the instant sound of hammer and chisel showed he did not delay the operation. Nothing was heard for some time. Just how long Soames cannot exactly estimate, but it was certainly less than a quarter of an hour later that the horrible scream, undoubtedly in German's voice, was heard. Immediately afterward, German emerged from the room, rushing frantically toward the front of the house as if pursued by some hideous enemy. The expression on his face, a face ghastly enough in repose, was beyond description. When near the front door, he seemed to think of something, and turned back in his flight, finally disappearing down the stairs to the cellar. The servants were utterly dumbfounded, and watched at the head of the stairs, but their master did not return. A smell of oil was all that came up from the regions below. After dark, a rattling was heard at the door leading from the cellar into the courtyard, and a stable boy saw Arthur German, glistening from head to foot with oil and redolent of that fluid, steal furtively out and vanish on the black moor surrounding the house. Then, in an exaltation of supreme horror, everyone saw the end. A spark appeared on the moor. A flame arose, and a pillar of human fire reached to the heavens. The House of Germans no longer existed. The reason why Arthur German's charred fragments were not collected and buried lies in what was found afterward, principally the thing in the box. The stuffed goddess was a nauseous sight, withered and eaten away, but it was clearly a mummified white ape of some unknown species, less hairy than any recorded variety, and infinitely nearer mankind, quite shockingly so. Detailed description would be rather unpleasant, but two salient features must be told, for they fit in revoltingly with certain notes of Sir Wade German's African expeditions 
and with the Congolese legends of the White God and the Eight Princess. The two particulars in question are these. The arms on the golden locket about the creature's neck were the German arms. And the jocose suggestion of Monsieur Verheren about certain resemblance as connected with the shriveled face applied with vivid, ghastly, and unnatural horror to none other than the sensitive Arthur German, great-great-great-grandson of Sir Wade German and an unknown wife. Members of the Royal Anthropological Institute burned the thing and threw the locket into a well and some of them do not admit that Arthur German ever existed. The end of Facts Concerning the Late Arthur German and His Family Recording by Matt Bonehoff, Herbert West, Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft, Part A. To be dead, be truly dead, must be glorious. There are far worse things awaiting man than death. Count Dracula. Part 1. From the Dark. Of Herbert West, who was my friend in college and in afterlife, I can speak only with extreme terror. This terror is not due altogether to the sinister manner of his recent disappearance, but was engendered by the whole nature of his life work, and first gained its acute form more than seventeen years ago, when we were in the third year of our course at the Miskatonic University Medical School in Arkham. While he was with me, the wonder and diabolism of his experiments fascinated me utterly, and I was his closest companion. Now that he is gone, and the spell is broken, the actual fear is greater. Memories and possibilities are even more hideous than realities. The first horrible incident of our acquaintance was the greatest shock I ever experienced, and it is only with reluctance that I repeat it. As I have said, it happened when we were in the medical school, where West had already made himself notorious through his wild theories on the nature of death and the possibility of overcoming it artificially. His views, which were ridiculed by the faculty and by his fellow students, hinged on the essentially mechanistic nature of life, and concerned means for operating the organic machinery of mankind by calculated chemical action after the failure of natural processes. In his experiments, with the various animating solutions, he had killed and treated immense numbers of rabbits, guinea pigs, cats, dogs, and monkeys, till he had become the prime nuisance of the college. Several times, he had actually obtained signs of life in animals supposedly dead, in many cases violent signs, but he soon saw that the perfection of his process, if indeed possible, would necessarily involve a lifetime of research. It likewise became clear that, since the same solution never worked alike on different organic species, he would require human subjects for further and more specialized progress. It was here that he first came into conflict with the college authorities and was debarred from further experiments by no less a dignitary than the dean of the medical school himself, the learned and benevolent Dr. Alan Halsey, whose work in behalf of the stricken, is recalled by every old resident of Arkham. I had always been exceptionally tolerant of West's pursuits, and we frequently discussed his theories, whose ramifications and corollaries were almost infinite. Holding with Haeckel that all life is the chemical and physical process, and that the so-called soul is a myth, my friend believed that artificial reanimation of the dead can depend only on the condition of the tissues and that unless actual decomposition has set in, a corpse fully equipped with organs may, with suitable measures, be set going again in the peculiar fashion known as life. That the psychic or intellectual life might be impaired by the slight deterioration 
of sensitive brain cells, which even a short period of death would be apt to cause West fully realized. It had been, at first, his hope to find a reagent which would restore vitality before the actual advent of death, and only repeated failures on animals had shown him that the natural and artificial life motions were incompatible. He then sought extreme freshness in his specimens, injecting his solution into the blood immediately after the extinction of life. It was this circumstance which made the professors so carelessly skeptical, for they felt that true death had not occurred in any case. They did not stop to view the matter closely and reasoningly. It was not long after the faculty had interdicted his work that West confided to me his resolution to get fresh human bodies in some manner and continue in secret the experiments he could no longer perform openly. To hear him discussing ways and means was rather ghastly, for at the college we had never procured anatomical specimens ourselves. Whenever the morgue proved inadequate, two local negroes attended to this matter, and they were seldom questioned. West was then a small, slender, spectacled youth, with delicate features, yellow hair, pale blue eyes, and a soft voice, and it was uncanny to hear him dwelling on the relative merits of Christchurch Cemetery and the Potter's Field. He finally decided on the Potter's Field, because practically everybody in Christchurch was embalmed, a thing of course ruinous to West's researches. I was, by this time, his active and enthralled assistant, and helped him make all his decisions, not only concerning the source of bodies, but concerning a suitable place for our loathsome work. It was I who thought of the deserted Chapman farmhouse beyond Meadow Hill, where we fitted up on the ground floor an operating room and a laboratory, each with dark curtains to conceal our midnight doings. The place was far from any road, and in sight of no other house, Yet precautions were nonetheless necessary, since rumors of strange lights started by chance nocturnal roamers would soon bring disaster on our enterprise. It was agreed to call the whole thing a chemical laboratory if discovery should occur. Gradually, we equipped our sinister haunt of science with materials either purchased in Boston or borrowed quietly from the college, materials carefully made unrecognizable save to expert eyes and provided spades and picks for the many burials we should have to make in the cellar. At the college we used an incinerator, but the apparatus was too costly for our unauthorized laboratory. Bodies were always a nuisance, even the small guinea pig bodies from the slight clandestine experiments in West's room at the boarding house. We followed the local death notices like ghouls, for our specimens demanded particular qualities. What we wanted were corpses interred soon after death and without artificial preservation, preferably free from malforming disease and certainly with all organs present. Accident victims were our best hope. Not for many weeks did we hear of anything suitable, though we talked with morgue and hospital authorities, ostensibly in the college's interest, as often as we could without exciting suspicion. We found that the college had the first choice in every case, so that it might be necessary to remain in Arkham during the summer, when only the limited summer school classes were held. In the end, though, luck favored us, for one day we heard of an almost ideal case in the potter's field. A brawny young workman drowned only the morning before in summer's pond, and buried at the town's expense without delay or embalming. That afternoon we found the new grave, and determined to begin work soon after midnight. It was a repulsive task that we undertook in the black small hours, even though we lacked at that time the special horror of graveyards, which later experiences brought to us. We carried spades and oil dark lanterns, for although electric torches were then manufactured, they were not as satisfactory as the tungsten contrivances of the day. The process of unearthing was slow and sordid. It might have been gruesomely poetical if we had been artists instead of scientists and we were glad when our spades struck wood. When the pine box was fully uncovered, Wes scrambled down and removed the lid, dragging out and propping up the contents. I reached down and hauled the contents out of the grave, and then both toiled hard to restore the spot to its former appearance. The affair made us rather nervous, especially the stiff form and the vacant face of our first trophy, but we managed to remove all traces of our visit. 
When we had padded down the last shovel full of earth, we put the specimen in a canvas sack and set out for the old Chapman place beyond Meadow Hill. On an improvised dissecting table in the old farmhouse, by the light of a powerful acetylene lamp, the specimen was not very spectral looking. It had been a sturdy and apparently unimaginative youth, a wholesome plebeian type, large framed, gray eyed, and brown haired, a sound animal without psychological subtleties, and probably having vital processes of the simplest and healthiest sort. Now, with the eyes closed, it looked more asleep than dead though the expert tests of my friend soon left no doubt on that score. We had at last what West had always longed for, a real dead man of the ideal kind, ready for the solution as prepared according to the most careful calculations and theories for human use. The tension on our part became very great. We knew that there was scarcely a chance for anything like complete success, and could not avoid hideous fears at possible grotesque results of partial animation, especially were we apprehensive concerning the mind and the impulses of the creature, since in the space following death some of the more delicate cerebral cells might well have suffered deterioration. I, myself, still held some curious notions about the traditional soul of man, and felt an awe at the secrets that might be told by one returning from the dead. I wondered what sights this placid youth might have seen in inaccessible spheres and what he could relate to fully restored to life. But my wonder was not overwhelming, since for the most part I shared the materialism of my friend. He was calmer than I as he forced a large quantity of his fluid into a vein in the body's arm, immediately binding the incision securely. The waiting was gruesome, but West never faltered. Every now and then he applied his stethoscope to the specimen and bore the negative results philosophically. After about three quarters of an hour, without the least sign of life, he disappointedly pronounced the solution inadequate, but determined to make the most of his opportunity and try one change in the formula before disposing of his ghastly prize. We had that afternoon dug a grave in the cellar, and would have to fill it by dawn, for although we had fixed the lock on the house, we wished to shun even the remotest risk of a ghoulish discovery. Besides, the body would not be even approximately fresh the next night. So, taking the solitary acetylene lamp into the adjacent laboratory, we left our silent guest on the slab in the dark and bent every energy to the mixing of a new solution, the weighing and measuring supervised by West with an almost fanatical care. The awful event was very sudden and wholly unexpected. I was pouring something from one test tube to another, and West was busy over the alcohol blast lamp, which had to answer for a Bunsen burner in this gasless edifice, when, from the pitch-black room we had left, there burst the most appalling and demonic succession of cries that either of us had ever heard. Not more unutterable could have been the chaos of hellish sound if the pit itself had opened to release the agony of the damned, for in one inconceivable cacophony was centered all the supernal terror and the natural despair of animate nature. Human it could not have been. It is not in man to make such sounds, and without a thought of our late employment or its possible discovery, both West and I leapt to the nearest window like stricken animals, overturning tubes, lamp, and retorts, and vaulting madly into the starred abyss of the rural night. I think we screamed ourselves as we stumbled frantically toward the town, though as we reached the outskirts we put on a semblance of restraint, just enough to seem like belated revelers staggering home from a debauch. We did not separate, but managed to get to West's room, where we whispered with the gas up until dawn. By then, we had calmed ourselves a little with rational theories and plans for investigation, so that we could sleep through the day, classes being disregarded. But that evening, two items in the paper, wholly unrelated, made it again impossible for us to sleep. The old deserted Chapman house had inexplicably burned to an amorphous heap of ashes. That we could understand because of the upset lamp. Also, an attempt had been made to disturb a new grave in the potter's field, as if by futile and spadeless clawing of the earth. That we could not understand, for we had patted down the mold very carefully. 
And for seventeen years after that, West would look frequently over his shoulder and complain of fancied footsteps behind him. Now he has disappeared. Part 2. The Plague Demon I shall never forget that hideous summer sixteen years ago, when like a noxious afrit from the halls of Eblis, typhoid stalked leeringly through Arkham. It is by that satanic scourge that most recall the year, for truly horror brooded with bat wings over the piles of coffins in the tombs of Christ Church Cemetery. Yet for me, there is a greater horror in that time, a horror known to me alone now that Herbert West has disappeared. West and I were doing postgraduate work in summer classes at the Medical School of Miskatonic University, and my friend had attained a wide notoriety because of his experiments leading toward the revivification of the dead. After scientific slaughter of uncounted small animals, the freakish work had ostensibly stopped by order of our skeptical dean, Dr. Alan Halsey, though West had continued to perform certain secret tests in his dingy boarding house room, and had on one terrible and unforgettable occasion taken a human body from its grave in the potter's field to a deserted farmhouse beyond Meadow Hill. I was with him on that odious occasion, and saw him inject into the still veins the elixir which he thought would to some extent restore life's chemical and physical processes. It had ended horribly, in the delirium of fear which we gradually came to attribute to our own overwrought nerves, and West had never afterward been able to shake off the maddening sensation of being haunted and hunted. The body had not been quite fresh enough. It is obvious that to restore normal mental attributes, a body must be very fresh indeed, and the burning of the old house had prevented us from burying the thing. It would have been better if we could have known it was underground. After that experience, West had dropped his researches for some time, but the zeal of the born scientist slowly returned, and he again became importunate with the college faculty, pleading for the use of the dissecting room and of fresh human specimens for the work he regarded as so overwhelmingly important. His pleas, however, were wholly in vain, for the decision of Dr. Halsey was inflexible, and the other professors all endorsed the verdict of their leader. In the radical theory of reanimation, they saw nothing but the immature vagarities of a youthful enthusiast whose slight form, yellow hair, spectacled blue eyes, and soft voice gave no hint of the supernormal, almost diabolical power of the cold brain within. I can see him now as he was then, and I shiver. He grew sterner of face, but never elderly. And now Sefton Asylum has had the mishap, and West has vanished. West clashed disagreeably with Dr. Halsey near the end of our last undergraduate term in a wordy dispute that did less credit to him than to the kindly dean in point of courtesy. He felt that he was needlessly and irrationally retarded in a supremely great work, a work which he could of course conduct to suit himself in later years, but which he wished to begin while still possessed of the exceptional facilities of the university. That the tradition-bound elders should ignore his singular results on animals and persist in their denial of the possibility of reanimation was inexpressibly disgusting and almost incomprehensible to a youth of West's logical temperament. Only greater maturity could help him understand the chronic mental limitations of the professor-doctor type, the product of generations of pathetic puritanism, kindly, conscientious, and sometimes gentle and amiable, yet always narrow, intolerant, custom-ridden, and lacking in perspective. Age has more charity with these incomplete, yet high-souled characters, whose worst real vice is timidity, and who are ultimately punished by general ridicule for their intellectual sins. Sins like Ptolemaism, Calvinism, anti-Darwinism, and anti-Nietzscheism, and every sort of Sabbatinarianism and sumptuary legislation. West, young despite his marvelous scientific acquirements, had scant patience with good Dr. Halsey, and his erudite colleagues, and nursed an increasing resentment, coupled with a desire to prove his theories to these obtuse worthies in some striking and dramatic fashion. Like most youths, 
he indulged in elaborate daydreams of revenge, triumph, and final magnanimous forgiveness. And then had come the scourge, grinning and lethal, from the nightmare caverns of Tartarus. West and I had graduated about the time of its beginning, but had remained for additional work at the summer school, so that we were in Arkham when it broke with full demonic fury upon the town. Though not as yet licensed physicians, we now had our degrees, and were pressed frantically into the public service as the number of the stricken grew. The situation was almost past management, and deaths ensued too frequently for the local undertakers to handle. Burials without embalming were made in rapid succession, and even the Christchurch Cemetery receiving tomb was crammed with coffins of the unembalmed dead. This circumstance was not without effect on West who thought often of the irony of the situation, so many fresh specimens, yet none for his persecuted researches. We were frightfully overworked, and the terrific mental and nervous strain made my friend rude morbidly. But West's gentle enemies were no less harassed with prostrating duties. College had all but closed, and every doctor of the medical faculty was helping to fight the typhoid plague, Dr. Halsey in particular had distinguished himself in sacrificing service, applying his extreme skill with wholehearted energy to cases which many others shunned because of danger or apparent hopelessness. Before a month was over, the fearless Dean had become a popular hero, though he seemed unconscious of his fame as he struggled to keep from collapsing with physical fatigue and nervous exhaustion. West could not withhold admiration for the fortitude of his foe, but because of this was even more determined to prove to him the truth of his amazing doctrine. Taking advantage of the disorganization of both college work and municipal health regulations, he managed to get a recently deceased body smuggled into the university dissecting room one night, and in my presence injected a new modification of his solution. The thing actually opened its eyes but only stared at the ceiling with a look of soul-petrifying horror before collapsing in an inertness from which nothing could rouse it. West said it was not fresh enough. The hot summer air does not favor corpses. That time, we were almost caught before we incinerated the thing, and West doubted the advisability of repeating his daring misuse of the college laboratory. The peak of the epidemic was reached in August, West and I were almost dead, and Dr. Halsey did die on the 14th. The students all attended the hasty funeral on the 15th, and bought an impressive wreath, though the latter was quite overshadowed by the tributes sent by wealthy Arkham citizens and by the municipality itself. It was almost a public affair, for the dean had surely been a public benefactor. After the entombment, we were all somewhat depressed and spent the afternoon at the bar of the commercial house, where West, though shaken by the death of his chief opponent, chilled the rest of us with references to his notorious theories. Most of the students went home, or to various duties as the evening advanced, but West persuaded me to aid him in making a night of it. West's landlady saw us arrive at his room about two in the morning, with a third man between us, and told her husband that we had all evidently dined and wined rather well. Apparently, this assiduous matron was right. For about 3 a.m., the whole house was aroused by cries coming from West's room, where, when they broke down the door, they found the two of us unconscious on the blood-stained carpet, beaten, scratched, and mauled, and with the broken remnants of West's bottles and instruments around us. Only an open window told what had become of our assailant, and many wondered how he himself had fared after the terrific leap from the second story to the lawn which he must have made. There were some strange garments in the room, but West, upon regaining consciousness, said that they did not belong to the stranger, but were specimens collected for bacteriological analysis in the course of investigations on the transmission of germ diseases. He ordered them burnt as soon as possible in the capacious fireplace. To the police, we both declared ignorance of our late companion's identity. He was, West nervously said, a congenial stranger whom we had met at some downtown bar of uncertain location. We had all been rather jovial, and West and I did not wish to have our pugnacious companion hunted down. That same night saw the beginning of the second Arkham Horror, the horror that to me eclipsed the plague itself. Christchurch Cemetery was the scene of a terrible killing, a watchman having been clawed to death 
in a manner not only too hideous for description, but raising it out as to the human agency of the deed. The victim had been seen alive considerably after midnight. The dawn revealed the unutterable thing. The manager of a circus at the neighboring town of Bolton was questioned, but he swore that no beast had at any time escaped from its cage. Those who found the body noted a trail of blood leading to the receiving tomb, where a small pool of red lay on the concrete just outside the gate. A fainter trail led away toward the woods, but it soon gave out. The next night, devils danced on the roofs of our camp, and the natural madness howled in the wind. Through the fevered town had crept a curse which some said was greater than the plague, and which some whispered was the embodied demon soul of the plague itself. Eight houses were entered by a nameless thing which strewed red death in its wake. In all, seventeen maimed and shapeless remnants of bodies were left behind by a voiceless, sadistic monster that crept abroad. A few persons had half seen it in the dark, and said it was white and like a malformed ape or anthropomorphic fiend. It had not left behind quite all that it had attacked, for sometimes it had been hungry. The number it had killed was fourteen. Three of the bodies had been in stricken homes and had not been alive. On the third night, frantic bands of searchers, led by the police, captured it in a house on Crane Street near the Miskatonic campus. They had organized the quest with care, keeping in touch by means of volunteer telephone stations, and when someone in the college district had reported hearing a scratching at a shuttered window, the net was quickly spread. On account of the general alarm and precautions, there were only two more victims, and the capture was effected without major casualties. The thing was finally stopped by a bullet, though not a fatal one, and was rushed to the local hospital amidst universal excitement and loathing. For it had been a man. This much was clear despite the nauseous eyes, the voiceless simianism, and the demonic savagery. They dressed its wound and carted it to the asylum at Sefton, where it beat its head against the walls of a padded cell for sixteen years, until the recent mishap, when it escaped under circumstances that few liked to mention. What had most disgusted the searchers of Arkham was the thing they noticed when the monster's face was clean, the mocking, unbelievable resemblance to a learned and self-sacrificing martyr who had been entombed but three days before the late Dr. Alan Halsey, public benefactor and dean of the medical school of Miskatonic University. To the vanished Herbert West, and to me, the disgust and horror were supreme. I shudder tonight as I think of it, shudder even more than I did that morning when West muttered through his bandages, Damn, it wasn't quite fresh enough. Part 3. Six Shots by Moonlight it is uncommon to fire all six shots of a revolver with great suddenness when one would probably be sufficient, but many things in the life of Herbert West were uncommon. It is, for instance, not often that a young physician leaving college is obligated to conceal the principles which guide his selection of a house and office. Yet, that was the case with Herbert West. When he and I obtained our degrees at the medical school of Miskatonic University, and sought to relieve our poverty by setting up as general practitioners. We took great care not to say that we chose our home, because it was fairly well isolated and as near as possible to the potter's field. Reticence such as this is seldom without a cause, nor indeed was ours, for our requirements were those resulting from a life work distinctly unpopular. Outwardly, we were doctors only, but beneath the surface, were aims of far greater and more terrible moment. For the essence of Herbert West's existence was a quest amid black and forbidden realms of the unknown, in which he hoped to uncover the secret of life and restore to perpetual animation the graveyard's cold clay. Such a quest demands strange materials, among them fresh human bodies, and in order to keep supplied with these indispensable things one must live quietly, and not far from a place of informal internment. West and I had met in college, and I had been the only one to sympathize with his hideous experiments. Gradually, I had come to be his inseparable assistant, and now that we were out of college, we had to keep together. It was not easy to find a good opening for two doctors in company, but finally, the influence of the university secured us a practice in Bolton, a factory town near Arkham, the seat of the college. The Bolton Worsted Mills 
are the largest in the Miskatonic Valley, and their polyglot employees are never popular as patients with the local physicians. We chose our house with the greatest care, seizing at last on a rather run-down cottage near the end of Pond Street, five numbers from the closest neighbor, and separated from the local potter's field by only a stretch of meadowland bisected by a narrow neck of the rather dense forest which lies to the north. The distance was greater than we wished, but we could get no nearer house without going on the other side of the field, wholly out of the factory district. We were not much displeased, however, since there were no people between us and our sinister source of supplies. The walk was a trifle long, but we could haul our silent specimens undisturbed. Our practice was surprisingly large from the very first, large enough to please most young doctors and large enough to prove a bore and a burden to students whose real interest lay elsewhere. The mill hands were of somewhat turbulent inclinations, and besides their many natural needs, their frequent clashes and stabbing affrays gave us plenty to do. But what actually absorbed our minds was the secret laboratory we had fitted up in the cellar, the laboratory with the long table under the electric lights, where in the small hours of the morning we often injected West's various solutions into the veins of the things we dragged from the potter's field. West was experimenting madly to find something which would start man's vital motions anew after they had been stopped by the thing we called death, but had encountered the most ghastly obstacles. The solution had to be differently compounded for different types. What would serve for guinea pigs would not serve for human beings, and different human specimens required large modifications. The bodies had to be exceedingly fresh for the slight decomposition of brain tissue would render perfect reanimation impossible. Indeed, the greatest problem was to get them fresh enough. West had had horrible experiences during his secret college researches with corpses of doubtful vintage. The results of partial or imperfect animation were much more hideous than were the total failures, and we both held fearsome recollections of such things. Ever since our first demonic session in the deserted farmhouse on Meadow Hill in our camp, we had felt a brooding menace. And West, though a calm, blonde, blue-eyed scientific automaton in most respects, often confessed to a shuddering sensation of stealthy pursuit. He half felt that he was followed, a psychological delusion of shaken nerves, enhanced by the undeniably disturbing fact that at least one of our reanimated specimens was still alive, a frightful, carnivorous thing in a padded cell at Sefton. There was another, our first, whose exact fate we had never learned. We had fair luck with specimens in Bolton, much better than in our camp. We had not been settled a week before we got an accident victim on the very night of burial, and made it open its eyes with an amazingly rational expression before the solution failed. It had lost an arm. If it had been a perfect body, we might have succeeded better. Between then and the next January, we secured three more. One total failure, one case of marked muscular motion, and one rather shivery thing. It rose of itself and uttered a sound. Then came a period where luck was poor. Interments fell off, and those that did occur were of specimens either too diseased or too maimed for use. We kept track of all the deaths and their circumstances with systematic care. One March night, however, we unexpectedly obtained a specimen which did not come from the potter's field. In Bolton, the prevailing spirit of Puritanism had outlawed the sport of boxing, with the usual result. Surreptitious and ill-conducted bouts among the mill workers were common, and occasionally professional talent of low grade was imported. This late winter night, there had been such a match, evidently with disastrous results, since two timorous Poles had come to us with incoherently whispered entreaties to attend to a very secret and desperate case. We followed them to an abandoned barn, where the remnants of a crowd of frightened foreigners were watching a silent black form on the floor. The match had been between Kid O'Brien, a lubberly and now quaking youth with a most un-Hiberian hooked nose, and Buck Robinson, the Harlem smoke. The Negro had been knocked out, and a moment's examination showed us that he would permanently remain so. He was a loathsome, gorilla-like thing, with abnormally long arms which I could not help calling four legs, 
and a face that conjured up thoughts of unspeakable Congo secrets and tom-toms pounding under an eerie moon. The body must have looked even worse in life, but the world holds many ugly things. Fear was upon the whole pitiful crowd, for they did not know what the law would extract from them if the affair were not hushed up, and they were grateful when West, in spite of my involuntary shudders, offered to get rid of the thing quietly, for a purpose I knew too well. There was bright moonlight over the snowless landscape, but we dressed the thing and carried it home between us through the deserted streets and meadows as we had carried a similar thing one horrible night in our camp. We approached the house from the field in the rear and took the specimen in the back door and down the cellar stairs and prepared it for the usual experiment. Our fear of the police was absurdly great, though we had timed our trip to avoid the solitary patrolman of that section. The result was wearily anticlimactic. Ghastly as our prize appeared, it was wholly unresponsive to every solution we injected in its black arm. Solutions prepared from experience with white specimens only. So as the hour grew dangerously near to dawn, we did as we had done with the others, dragged the thing across the meadows to the neck of the woods near the potter's field, and buried it there in the best sort of grave the frozen ground would furnish. The grave was not very deep, but fully as good as that of the previous specimen, the thing which had risen of itself and uttered a sound. In the light of our dark lanterns, we carefully covered it with leaves and dead vines, fairly certain that the police would never find it in a forest so dim and dense. The next day, I was increasingly apprehensive about the police, for a patient brought rumors of a suspected fight and death. West had still another source of worry, for he had been called in the afternoon to a case which ended very threateningly. An Italian woman had become hysterical over her missing child, a lad of five who had strayed off early in the morning and failed to appear for dinner, and had developed symptoms highly alarming in view of an always weak heart. It was a very foolish hysteria, for the boy had often run away before, but Italian peasants are exceedingly superstitious, and this woman seemed as much harassed by omens as by facts. About seven o'clock in the evening she had died, and her frantic husband had made a frightful scene in his efforts to kill West, whom he wildly blamed for not saving her life. Friends had held him back when he drew a stiletto, but West departed amidst his inhuman shrieks, curses, and oaths of vengeance. In his latest affliction, the fellow seemed to have forgotten his child, who was still missing as the night advanced. There was some talk of searching the woods, but most of the family's friends were busy with the dead woman and the screaming man. Altogether, the nervous strain upon West must have been tremendous. Thoughts of the police and of the mad Italian both weighed heavily. We retired about eleven, but I did not sleep well. Bolton had a surprisingly good police force for so small a town, and I could not help fearing the mess which would ensue if the affair of the night before were ever tracked down. It might mean the end of all our local work, and perhaps prison for both West and me. I did not like those rumors of the fight which were floating about. After the clock had struck three, the moon shone in my eyes, but I turned over without rising to pull down the shade. Then came the steady rattling at the back door. I lay still and somewhat dazed, but before long heard West's rap on my door. He was clad in dressing gown and slippers, and had in his hands a revolver and an electric flashlight. From the revolver, I knew that he was thinking more of the crazed battalion than of the police. We'd better both go, he whispered. It wouldn't do not to answer it anyway, and it may be a patient. It would be like one of those fools to try the back door. So we both went down the stairs on tiptoe, with a fear partly justified, and partly that which comes only from the soul of the weird small hours. The rattling continued, growing somewhat louder. When we reached the door, I cautiously unbolted it and threw it open. As the moon streamed revealingly down on the form silhouetted there, West did a peculiar thing. Despite the obvious danger of attracting notice and bringing down on our heads the dreaded police investigation, a thing which after all was mercifully averted by the relative isolation of our cottage, my friend suddenly, excitedly, and unnecessarily emptied all six chambers of his revolver into the nocturnal visitor. For that visitor, 
was neither Italian nor policeman. Looming hideously against the spectral moon was a gigantic, misshapen thing not to be imagined save in nightmares. A glassy-eyed, ink-black apparition nearly on all fours, covered with bits of mold, leaves, and vines, foul with caked blood, and having between its glistening teeth a snow-white, terrible, cylindrical object terminating in a tiny hand. End of Herbert West, Reanimator, Part A obviously not a pleasing or ordinary occurrence, but I was used to similar experiences, hence suffered on this occasion only because of a particular circumstance, and, as I have implied, it was not of the dead man himself that I became afraid. Herbert West, whose associate and assistant I was, possessed scientific interests far beyond the usual routine of a village physician. That was why, when establishing his practice in Bolton, he had chosen an isolated house near the potter's field. Briefly and brutally stated, West's soul-absorbing interest was the secret study of the phenomena of life and its cessation, leading toward the reanimation of the dead through injections of an excitement solution. For this ghastly experimenting, it was necessary to have a constant supply of very fresh human bodies. Very fresh because the least decay hopelessly damaged the brain structure, and human because we found that the solution had to be compounded differently for different types of organisms. Scores of rabbits and guinea pigs had been killed and treated, but their trail was a blind one. West had never fully succeeded, because he had never been able to secure a corpse sufficiently fresh. What he wanted were bodies from which vitality had only just departed bodies with every cell intact, and capable of receiving again the impulse toward the mode of motion called life. There was hope that this second and artificial life might be made perpetual by repetitions of the injection, but we had learned that an ordinary natural life would not respond to the action. To establish the artificial motion, natural life must be extinct. The specimens must be very fresh, but genuinely dead. The awesome quest had begun when West and I were students at the Miskatonic University Medical School in Arkham, vividly conscious for the first time of the thoroughly mechanical nature of life. That was seven years before, but West looked scarcely a day older now. He was small, blonde, clean-shaven, soft-voiced, and spectacled with only an occasional flash of a cold blue eye to tell of the hardening and growing fanaticism of his character under the pressure of his terrible investigations. Our experiences had often been hideous in the extreme, the results of defective reanimation when lumps of graveyard clay had been galvanized into morbid, unnatural, and brainless motion by various modifications of the vital solution. One thing 
had uttered a nerve-shattering scream. Another had risen violently, beaten us both to unconsciousness, and run amok in a shocking way before it could be placed behind asylum bars. Still another, a loathsome African monstrosity, had clawed out of its shallow grave and done a deed. West had had to shoot that object. We could not get bodies fresh enough to show any trace of reason when reanimated, so had perforce created nameless horrors. It was disturbing to think that one, perhaps two of our monsters, still live. That thought haunted us shadowingly, till finally West disappeared under frightful circumstances. But at the time of the scream in the cellar laboratory of the isolated Bolton College, our fears were subordinate to our anxiety for extremely fresh specimens. West was more avid than I, so that it almost seemed to me that he looked half covetously at any very healthy living physique. It was in July 1910 that the bad luck regarding specimens began to turn. I had been on a long visit to my parents in Illinois, and upon my return found West in a state of singular elation. He had, he told me excitedly, in all likelihood solved the problem of freshness through an approach from an entirely new angle, that of artificial preservation. I had known that he was working on a new and highly unusual embalming compound, and was not surprised that it had turned out well, but until he explained the details, I was rather puzzled as to how such a compound would help in our work, since the objectionable staleness of the specimens was largely due to delay occurring before we secured them. This, I now saw, West had clearly recognized, creating his embalming compound for future rather than immediate use, and trusting to fate to supply again some very recent and unburied corpse, as it had years before when we obtained the Negro killed in the Bolton Prize fight. At last, fate had been kind, so that on this occasion, there lay in the secret cellar laboratory a corpse whose delay could not, by any possibility, have begun. What would happen on reanimation, and whether we could help for a revival of mind and reason, West did not venture to predict. The experiment would be a landmark in our studies, and he had saved the new body for my return, so that both might share in the spectacle in a custom fashion. West told me how he had obtained the specimen. It had been a vigorous man, a well-dressed stranger, just off the train, on his way to transact some business with the Bolton Worsted Mills. The walk through the town had been long, and by the time the stranger paused at our cottage to ask the way to the factories, his heart had become greatly overtaxed. He had refused a stimulant, and had suddenly dropped dead only a moment later, the body, as might be expected seemed to West a heaven-sent gift. In his brief conversation, the stranger had made it clear that he was unknown in Bolton, and a search of his pockets subsequently revealed him to be one Robert Levitt of St. Louis, apparently without a family to make instinctive queries about his disappearance. If this man could not be restored to life, no one would know of our experiment. We buried our materials in a dense strip of woods between the house and the potter's field. If, on the other hand, he could be restored, our fame would be brilliantly and perpetually established. So, without delay, West had injected into the body's wrist the compound which would hold it fresh for until after my arrival. The matter of the presumably weak heart, which, to my mind, imperiled the success of our experiment did not appear to trouble West extensively. He hoped, at least, to obtain what he had never obtained before, a rekindled spark of reason, perhaps a normal living creature. So on the night of July 18, 1910, Herbert West and I stood in the cellar laboratory and gazed at a white, silent figure beneath the dazzling arc light. The embalming compound had worked uncannily well, for as I stared fascinatedly at the sturdy frame which had laid two weeks without stiffening, I was moved to seek West's assurance that the thing was really dead. This assurance he gave readily enough, reminding me that the reanimating solution was never used without careful tests as to life, 
since it could have no effect if any of the original vitality was present. As West proceeded to take preliminary steps, I was impressed by the vast intricacy of the new experiment, an intricacy so vast that he could trust no hand less delicate than his own. Forbidding me to touch the body, he first injected a drug in the wrist just beside the place his needle had punctured when injecting the embalming compound. This, he said, was to neutralize the compound and release the system to a normal relaxation so that the reanimating solution might freely work when injected. Slightly later, when a change in a gentle tremor seemed to affect the dead limbs, West stuffed a pillow-like object violently over the twitching face, not withdrawing it until the corpse appeared quiet and ready for our attempt at reanimation. The pale enthusiast now applied some last prefunctory tests for absolute lifelessness, withdrew satisfied, and finally injected into the left arm an accurately measured amount of the vital elixir, prepared during the afternoon with a greater care than we had used since college days when our feats were new and groping. I cannot express the wild, breathless suspense with which we waited for results on this first really fresh specimen, the first we could reasonably expect to open its lips in rational speech, perhaps to tell of what it had seen beyond the unfathomable abyss. Quest was a materialist, believing in no soul and attributing all the working of consciousness to bodily phenomena. Consequently, he looked for no revelation of hideous secrets from the gulfs and caverns beyond death's barrier. I did not wholly disagree with him, theoretically, yet held vague instinctive remnants of the primitive faith of my forefathers, so that I could not help I, corpse, with a certain amount of awe and terrible expectation. Besides, I could not extract from my memory that hideous, inhuman shriek we heard on the night we tried our first experiment in the deserted farmhouse at Arkham. Very little time had elapsed before I saw the attempt was not to be a total failure. A touch of color came to cheeks hitherto chalk white, and spread out under the curiously ample stubble of sandy beard. West, who had his hand on the pulse of the left wrist, suddenly nodded significantly, and almost simultaneously a mist appeared on the ear and climbed above the body's mouth. There followed a few spasmodic muscular motions, and then an audible breathing and visible motion of the chest. I looked at the closed eyelids, and thought I detected a quivering. Then the lids opened, showing eyes which were gray, calm, and alive, but still unintelligent and not even curious. In a moment of fantastic whim, I whispered questions to the reddening ears, questions of other worlds, of which the memory might still be present. Subsequent terror drove them from my mind, but I think the last one which I repeated was, Where have you been? I do not yet know whether I was answered or not, for no sound came from the well-shaped mouth. But I do know that at that moment I firmly thought the thin lips moved silently, forming syllables which I would have vocalized as only now, if that phrase had possessed any sense or relevancy. At that moment, as I say, I was elated with the conviction that the one great goal had been attained, and that for the first time a reanimated corpse had uttered distinct words impelled by actual reason. In the next moment, there was no doubt about the triumph, no doubt that the solution had truly accomplished, at least temporarily, its full mission of restoring rational and articulate life to the dead. But in that triumph, there came to me the greatest of all horrors. Not horror of the thing that spoke, but of the deed that I had witnessed, and of the man with whom my professional fortunes were joined. For that very fresh body, at last writhing in the full and terrifying consciousness with eyes dilated at the memory of its last scene on earth, threw out its frantic hands in a life and death struggle with the air, and suddenly collapsing into a second and final dissolution, from which there could be no return screamed out the cry that will ring eternally in my aching brain. Help! Keep off, you cursed little toehead fiend! Keep that damned needle away from me!
Part 5. The Horror from the Shadows Many men have related hideous things, not mentioned in print, which happened on the battlefields of the Great War. Some of these things have made me faint, others have convulsed me with devastating nausea, while still others have made me tremble and look behind me in the dark. Yet despite the worst of them, I believe that I can myself relate the most hideous thing of all, the shocking, the unnatural, the unbelievable horror from the shadows. In 1915, I was a physician with the rank of first lieutenant in a Canadian regiment in Flanders, one of many Americans to precede the government itself into the gigantic struggle. I had not entered the army of my own initiative, but rather as a natural result of the enlistment of the man whose indispensable assistant I was, the celebrated Boston surgical specialist, Dr. Herbert West. Dr. West had been avid for a chance to serve as a surgeon in a great war, and when the chance had come, he carried me with him almost against my will. There were reasons why I could have been glad to let the war separate us, reasons why I found the practice of medicine and the companionship of West more and more irritating. But when he had gone to Ottawa and through a colleague's influence secured a medical commission as major, I could not resist the imperious persuasion of one determined that I should accompany him in my usual capacity. When I say that Dr. West was avid to serve in battle, I do not mean to imply that he was either naturally warlike or anxious for the safety of civilization, always an ice-cold intellectual machine, slight, blonde, blue-eyed and spectacled. I think he secretly sneered at my occasional martial enthusiasms and censures of supine neutrality. There was, however, something he wanted in embattled Flanders, and in order to secure it, had had to assume a military exterior. What he wanted was not a thing which many persons want, but something connected with the peculiar branch of medical science which he had chosen quite clandestinely to follow, and in which he had achieved amazing and occasionally hideous results. It was, in fact, nothing more or less than an abundant supply of freshly killed men in every stage of dismemberment. Herbert West needed fresh bodies because his life work was the reanimation of the dead. This work was not known to the fashionable clientele who had so swiftly built up his fame after his arrival in Boston, but was only too well known to me, who had been his closest friend and sole assistant since the old days at Miskatonic University Medical School at our camp. It was in those college days that he had begun his terrible experiments, first on small animals, and then on human bodies shockingly obtained. There was a solution which he injected into the veins of dead things, and if they were fresh enough, they responded in strange ways. He had had much trouble in discovering the proper formula, for each type of organism was found to need a stimulus especially adapted to it. Terror stalked him when he reflected on his partial failures, nameless things resulting from imperfect solutions or from bodies insufficiently fresh. A certain number of these failures had remained alive. One was at an asylum, while others had vanished. And as he thought of conceivable, yet virtually impossible eventualities, he often shivered beneath his usual stolidity. West had soon learned that absolute freshness was the prime requisite for useful specimens and had accordingly resorted to frightful and unnatural expedients in body snatching. In college, and during our early practice together in the factory town of Bolton, my attitude toward him had been largely one of fascinated admiration, but as his boldness and methods grew, I began to develop a gnawing fear. I did not like the way he looked at healthy living bodies. And then, there came a nightmarish session in the cellar laboratory, when I learned that a certain specimen had been a living body when he secured it. That was the first time he had ever been able to revive the quality of rational thought in the corpse, and his success, obtained at such a loathsome cost, had completely hardened him. Of his methods in the intervening five years I dare not speak. I was held to him by sheer force of fear, and witnessed sights that no human tongue could repeat. Gradually I came to find Herbert West himself more horrible than anything he did, that was when it dawned on me that his once normal scientific zeal for prolonged life 
had subtly degenerated into a mere morbid and ghoulish curiosity and secret sense of charnel picturesqueness. His interest became a hellish and perverse addiction to the repellently and fiendishly abnormal. He gloated calmly over artificial monstrosities which would make most healthy men drop dead from fright and disgust. He became, behind his pallid intellectuality, a fastidious Baudelaire of physical experiment, a languid elegabalus of the tombs. Dangers he met unflinchingly, crimes he committed unmoved. I think the climax came when he had proved his point that rational life can be restored, and had sought new worlds to conquer by experimenting on the reanimation of detached parts of bodies. He had wild and original ideas on the independent vital properties of organic cells and nerve tissue separated from the natural physiological system, and achieved some hideous preliminary results in the form of never-dying, artificially nourished tissue obtained from the nearly hatched eggs of an indescribable tropical reptile. Two biological points he was exceedingly anxious to settle. First whether any amount of consciousness and rational action be possible without the brain, proceeding from the spinal cord and various nerve centers, and second, whether any kind of ethereal, intangible relation distinct from material cells may exist to link the surgically separated parts of what had previously been a single living organism. All this research work required a prodigious supply of freshly slaughtered human flesh, and that was why Herbert West had entered the Great War. The phantasmal, unmentionable thing occurred one midnight late in March 1915 in a field hospital behind the lines of St. Eloy. I wonder even now if it could have been other than a demonic dream of delirium. West had a private laboratory in an east room of the barn-like temporary edifice assigned him on his plea that he was devising new and radical methods for the treatment of hitherto hopeless cases of maiming. There, he worked like a butcher in the midst of his gory wares. I could never get used to the levity with which he handled and classified certain things. At times, he actually did perform marvels of surgery for the soldiers, but his chief delights were of a less public and philanthropic kind, requiring many explanations of sounds which seemed peculiar even amidst that babble of the dam. Among these sounds were frequent revolver shots, surely not uncommon on a battlefield, but distinctly uncommon in a hospital. Dr. West's reanimated specimens were not meant for long existence or a large audience. Besides human tissue, West employed much of the reptile embryo tissue, which he had cultivated in such singular results. It was better than human material for maintaining life in organless fragments, and that was now my friend's chief activity. In a dark corner of the laboratory, over a queer incubating burner, he kept a large covered vat full of this reptilian cell matter, which multiplied and grew puffily and hideously. On the night of which I speak, we had a splendid new specimen, a man at once physically powerful and of such high mentality that a sensitive nervous system was assured. It was rather ironic, for he was the officer who had helped West to his commission, and who is now to have been our associate. Moreover, he had in the past secretly studied the theory of reanimation to some extent under West. Major Sir Eric Moreland Clapham Lee, DSO, was the greatest surgeon in our division, and had been hastily assigned to the St. Eloy sector when news of the heavy fighting reached headquarters. He had come in an airplane piloted by the intrepid Lieutenant Ronald Hill, only to be shot down when directly over his destination. The fall had been spectacular and awful. Hill was unrecognizable afterwards, but the wreck yielded up the great surgeon in a nearly decapitated but otherwise intact condition. West had greedily seized the lifeless thing, which had once been his friend and fellow scholar, and I shuddered when he finished severing the head placed it in his hellish vat of pulpy reptile tissue to preserve it for future experiments, and proceeded to treat the decapitated body on the operating table. He injected new blood, joined certain veins, arteries, and nerves at the headless neck, and closed the ghastly aperture. 
with engraft skin from an unidentified specimen which had worn an officer's uniform. I knew what he wanted, to see if this highly organized body could exhibit without its head any of the signs of mental life which had distinguished Sir Eric Moreland Clapham Lee. Once a student of reanimation, the silent trunk was now gruesomely called upon to exemplify it. I can still see Herbert West under the sinister electric light as he injected his reanimating solution into the arm of the headless body, a scene I cannot describe. I would faint if I tried it. For there is a madness in a room full of classified charnel things, with blood and lesser human debris almost ankle-deep on the slimy floor, and with hideous reptilian abnormalities sprouting, bubbling, and baking over a winking bluish-green specter of dim flame in a far corner of black shadow. The specimen, as West repeatedly observed, had a splendid nervous system. Much was expected of it, and as a few twitching motions began to appear, I could see the feverish interest on West's face. He was ready, I think, to see proof of his increasingly strong opinion that consciousness, reason, and personality can exist independently of the brain, that man has no central, connected spirit, but is merely a machine of nervous matter, each section more or less complete in itself. In one triumphant demonstration, West was about to relegate the mystery of life to the category of myth. The body now twitched more vigorously, and beneath our avid eyes commenced to heave in a frightful way. The arms stirred disquietingly, the legs drew up, and various muscles contracted in a repulsive kind of writhing. Then the headless thing threw its arms out in a gesture which was unmistakably one of desperation, an intelligent desperation, apparently sufficient to prove every theory of Herbert West. Certainly the nerves were recalling the man's last act in life the struggle to get free of the falling airplane. What followed, I shall never positively know. It may have been wholly a hallucination, from the shock caused at that instant by the sudden and complete destruction of the building in a cataclysm of German shell fire. Who can gainsay it, since West and I were the only proved survivors? West liked to think that before his recent disappearance, but there were times when he could not for it was queer that we both had the same hallucination. The hideous occurrence itself was very simple, notable only for what it implied. The body on the table had risen with a blind and terrible groping, and we had heard a sound. I should not call that sound a voice, for it was too awful, and yet its timber was not the most awful thing about it. Neither was its message. It had merely screamed, Jump, Ronald! For God's sake, jump! The awful thing was its source for it had come from the large covered vat in that ghoulish corner of crawling black shadows. Part 6. The Tomb Legion When Dr. Herbert West disappeared a year ago, the Boston police questioned me closely. They suspected that I was holding something back, and perhaps suspected graver things. But I could not tell them the truth, because they would not have believed it. They knew indeed that West had been connected with activities beyond the credence of ordinary men, for his hideous experiments in the reanimation of dead bodies had long been too extensive to admit of perfect secrecy. But the final, soul-shattering catastrophe held elements of demonic fantasy, which make even me doubt the reality of what I saw. I was West's closest friend and only confidential assistant. We had met years before in medical school, and from the first, I had shared his terrible researches. He had slowly tried to perfect a solution which, injected into the veins of the newly deceased, would restore life, a labor demanding an abundance of fresh corpses, and therefore involving the most unnatural actions. Still more shocking were the products of some of his experiments, grisly masses of flesh that had been dead, but that West waked to a blind, brainless, nauseous animation. These were the usual results, for in order to reawaken the mind, it was necessary to have specimens so absolutely fresh that no decay could possibly affect the delicate brain cells. This need for very fresh corpses had been West's moral undoing. They were hard to get, 
And one awful day, he had secured a specimen while it was still alive and vigorous. A struggle, a needle, and a powerful alkaloid had transformed it into a very fresh corpse. And the experiment had succeeded for a brief and memorable moment. But West had emerged with a soul callous and seared, a hardened eye which sometimes glanced with a kind of hideous and calculating appraisal at men of especially sensitive brain and especially vigorous physique. Toward the last, I became acutely afraid of West, for he began to look at me that way. People did not seem to notice his glances, but they noticed my fear, and after his disappearance, used that as a basis for some absurd suspicions. West, in reality, was more afraid than I, for his abominable pursuits entailed a life of furtiveness and dread of every shadow. Partially, it was the police he feared, but sometimes his nervousness was deeper and more nebulous, touching on certain indescribable things into which he had in injected a morbid life, and from which he had not seen that life depart. He usually finished his experiments with a revolver, but a few times he had not been quick enough. There was that first specimen on whose rifled grave marks of flying were later seen. There was also that our camp professor's body, which had done cannibal things before it had been captured and thrust unidentified into a madhouse cell at Sefton, where it beat the walls for sixteen years. Most of the other possibly surviving results were things less easy to speak of, for in later years, West's scientific zeal had degenerated into an unhealthy and fantastic mania. He had spent his chief skill in vitalizing not entire human bodies, but isolated parts of body, or parts joined to organic matter other than human. It had become fiendishly disgusting by the time he disappeared. Many of the experiments could not even be hinted at in print. The Great War, through which both of us served as surgeons, had intensified this side of West. In saying that West's fear of his specimens was nebulous, I have in mind particularly its complex nature. Part of it came merely from knowing of the existence of such nameless monsters, while another part rose from apprehension of the bodily harm they might under certain circumstances do him. Their disappearance added horror to the situation. Of them all, West knew the whereabouts of only one, the pitiful asylum thing. Then, there was a more subtle fear, a very fantastic sensation resulting from a curious experiment in the Canadian Army in 1950. West, in the midst of a severe battle, had reanimated Major Sir Eric Moreland Clapham Lee, DSO, a fellow physician who knew about his experiments and could have duplicated them. The head had been removed, so that the possibilities of quasi-intelligent life in the trunk might be investigated. Just as the building was wiped out by a German shell, there had been a success. The trunk had moved intelligently, and, unbelievable to relate, we were both sickeningly sure that articulate sounds had come from the detached head as it lay in a shadowy corner of the laboratory. The shell had been merciful in a way, but West could never feel as certain as he wished that we, too, were the only survivors. He used to make shuddering conjectures about the possible actions of a headless physician with the power of reanimating the dead. West's last quarters were in a venerable house of much elegance, overlooking one of the oldest burying grounds in Boston. He had chosen the place for purely symbolic and fantastical aesthetic reasons, since most of the internments were of the colonial period, and therefore of little use to a scientist seeking very fresh bodies. The laboratory was in a sub-cellar secretly constructed by imported workmen and containing a huge incinerator for the quiet and complete disposal of such bodies or fragments and synthetic mockeries of bodies as might remain from the morbid experiments and unhallowed amusements of the owner. During the excavation of this cellar, the workmen had struck some exceedingly ancient masonry, undoubtedly connected with the old burying ground, yet far too deep to correspond with any known sepulchre therein. After a number of calculations, West decided that it represented some secret chamber beneath the tomb of the Averroes, where the last interment had been made in 1768. 
I was with him when he studied the nitrous, dripping walls, laid bare by the spades and mattocks of the men, and was prepared for the gruesome thrill which would attend the uncovering of centuries' grave secrets. But, for the first time, West's new timidity conquered his natural curiosity, and he betrayed his degenerating fiber by ordering the masonry left intact and plastered over. Thus, it remained until the final hellish night, part of the walls of the secret laboratory. I speak of West's decadence, but must add that it was a purely mental and intangible thing. Outwardly, he was the same to the last, calm, cold, slight, yellow-haired, with spectacled blue eyes and a general aspect of youth, which years and fears seemed never to change. He seemed calm, even when he thought of that flawed grave and looked over his shoulder, even when he thought of the carnivorous thing that gnawed and pawed at Sefton Bars. The end of Herbert West began one evening in our joint study, when he was dividing his curious glance between the newspaper and me. A strange headline item had struck at him from the crumpled page, and a nameless titan claw had seemed to reach down through sixteen years. Something fearsome and incredible had happened at Sefton Asylum fifty miles away, stunning the neighborhood and baffling the police. In the small hours of the morning, a body of silent men had entered the grounds, and their leader had aroused the attendants. He was a menacing military figure who talked without moving his lips, and whose voice seemed almost ventriloquially connected with an immense black case he carried. The expressionless face was handsome to the point of radiant beauty, and had shocked the superintendent when the hall light fell on it. For it was a wax face, with eyes painted black. Some nameless accident had befallen this man. A larger man guided his steps, a repellent hulk whose bluish face seemed half eaten away by some unknown malady. The speaker had asked for the custody of the cannibal monster committed from our camp sixteen years before, and upon being refused, gave a signal which precipitated a shocking riot. The fiends had beaten, trampled, and bitten every attendant who did not flee, killing four and finally succeeding in the liberation of the monster. Those victims, who could recall the event without hysteria, swore that the creatures had acted less like men than like unthinkable automata guided by the waxed-faced leader. By the time help could be summoned, every trace of the men and their mad chart had vanished. From the hour of reading this item until midnight, West sat almost paralyzed. At midnight the doorbell rang, startling him fearfully. All the servants were asleep in the attic, so I answered the bell. As I have told the police, there was no wagon in the street, but only a group of strange-looking figures bearing a large, square box, which they deposited in the hallway after one of them had grunted in a highly unnatural voice. Express. Prepaid. They filed out of the house with a jerky tread, and as I watched them go, I had an odd idea that they were turning toward the ancient cemetery on which the back of the house abutted. When I slammed the door after them, West came downstairs and looked at the box. It was about two feet square, and bore West's correct name and present address. It also bore the inscription, From Eric Moreland, Clapham Lee, St. Eloid, Flanders. Six years before, in Flanders, a shelled hospital had fallen upon the headless reanimated trunk of Dr. Clapham Lee and upon the detached head which, perhaps, had uttered articulate sounds. West was not even excited now. His condition was more ghastly. Quickly, he said, It's the finish, but let's incinerate this. We carried the thing down to the laboratory, listening. I do not remember many particulars. You can imagine my state of mind. But it is a vicious lie to say that it was Herbert West's body which I put into the incinerator. We both inserted the whole unopened wooden box, closed the door, and started the electricity. Nor did any sound come from the box after all. It was West who first noticed the falling plaster on that part of the wall where the ancient tomb masonry had been covered up. I was going to run, but he stopped me. Then I saw a small black aperture, felt a ghoulish wind of ice, and smelled the carnal bowels of a putrescent earth. There was no sound. But just then the electric lights went out, 
and I saw outlined against some phosphorescence of the netherworld a horde of silent, toiling things which only an insanity or worse could create. Their outlines were human, semi-human, fractionally human, and not human at all. The horde was grotesquely heterogeneous. They were removing the stones quietly, one by one, from the century's wall, and then, as the breach became large enough, they came out into the laboratory single file, led by a talking thing with a beautiful head made of wax. A sort of mad-eyed monstrosity behind the leader seized on Herbert West. West did not resist or utter a sound. Then they all sprang at him and tore him to pieces before my eyes, bearing the fragments away into that subterranean vault of fabulous abominations. West's head was carried off by the wax-headed leader, who wore a Canadian officer's uniform. As it disappeared, I saw that the blue eyes behind the spectacles were hideously blazing with their first touch of frantic visible emotion. Servants found me unconscious in the morning. West was gone. The incinerator contained only unidentifiable ashes. Detectives have questioned me, but what can I say? The Sefton tragedy they will not connect with West. Not that, nor the men with the box whose existence they deny. I told them of the vault, and they pointed to the unbroken plaster wall and laughed, so I told them no more. They imply that I am either a madman or a murderer. Probably I am mad, but I might not be mad though the cursed tomb legions had not been so silent. End of Herbert West, Reanimated. Recording by Matt Bonehoff. Recording by Vera Unreal Memory by H.P. Lovecraft In the valley of Nis, the accursed waning moon shines thinly, tearing a path for its light with feeble horns through the lethal foliage of a great uber tree. And within the depths of the valley, where the light reaches not, moon forms not meant to be beheld. Rank is the herbage on each slope where evil vines and creeping plants crawl amidst the stones of ruined palaces, twining tightly about broken columns and strange monoliths, and heaving up marble pavements played by forgotten hands. And in trees that grow gigantic in crumbling courtyards, deep little eggs, while in and out of deep treasure vaults, live poison serpents and scaly things without a name. Vast are the stones which sleep beneath coverlets of dank moss, and mighty were the walls from which they fell. For all time did their builders erect them, and in sooth they yet serve nobly, for beneath them the grey toad makes his habitation. At the very bottom of the valley lies the river Tham, whose waters are slimy and filled with weeds. From hidden springs it rises, and to subterranean grottoes it flows, so that the demon of the valley knows not why its waters are red, nor whither they are bound. The genie that haunts the moonbeams spake to the demon of the valley, saying, I am old, and forget much. Tell me the deeds and aspect, the name of them who built these things of stone. And the demon replied, I am memory, and am wise in law of the past, but I too am old. These things were like the waters of the river Thang, not to be understood. Their deeds I recall not, for they were but of the moment. Their respect I recall dimly, it was like to that of the little apes in the trees. Their name I recall clearly, for it rhymed with that of the river. These things of yesterday were called men. So the genie flew back to the thin horned moon, 
and the demon looked intently at a little egg in a tree that grew in a crumbling courtyard. End of memory. Recording by Cameron Hall. The Music of Eric Zahn by H. B. Lovecraft. I have examined maps of the city with the greatest care, yet have never again found the Rue d'Orsay. These maps have not been modern maps alone, for I know that names change. I have, on the contrary, delved deeply into all the antiquities of the place, and have personally explored every region of whatever name which could possibly answer to the street I knew as the Rue d'Orsay. But despite all I have done, it remains an humiliating fact that I cannot find the house, the street, or even the locality where during the last months of my impoverished life as a student of metaphysics at the university, I heard the music of Eric Zahn. That my memory is broken, I do not wonder, for my health, physical and mental, was gravely disturbed throughout the period of my residence in the Rue d'Orsay, and I recall that I took none of my few acquaintances there. But that I cannot find the place again is both singular and perplexing, for it was within a half-hour's walk of the university, and was distinguished by peculiarities which could hardly be forgotten by anyone who had been there. I have never met a person who has seen the Rue d'Orsay. The Rue d'Orsay lay across a dark river bordered by precipitous brick, blear-windowed warehouses and spanned by a ponderous bridge of dark stone. It was always shadowy along that river, as if the smoke of neighboring factories shut out the sun perpetually. The river was also odorous with evil stenches which I have never smelled elsewhere and which may someday help me to find it since I should recognize them at once. Beyond the bridge were narrow, cobbled streets with rails, and then came the ascent, at first gradual but incredibly steep as the Rue d'Orsay was reached. I have never seen another street as narrow and steep as the Rue d'Orsay. It was almost a cliff, closed to all vehicles, consisting in several places of flights of steps, and ending at the top in a lofty, ivied wall. Its paving was irregular, sometimes stone slabs, sometimes cobblestones, and sometimes bare earth with struggling greenish-gray vegetation. The houses were tall, peaked-roofed, incredibly old, and crazily leaning backward, forward, and sideways. Occasionally, an opposite pair, both leaning forward, almost met across the street like an arch, and certainly they kept most of the light from the ground below. There were a few overhead bridges from house to house across the street. The inhabitants of that street impressed me peculiarly. At first I thought it was because they were all silent and reticent, but later I decided it was because they were all very old. I do not know how I came to live on such a street, but I was not myself when I moved there. I had been living in many poor places, always evicted for want of money, until at last I came upon that tottering house in the Rue d'Orsay kept by the paralytic Grandeau. It was the third house from the top of the street and by far the tallest of them all. My room was on the fifth story, the only inhabited room there since the house was almost empty. On the night I arrived, I heard strange music from the peaked garret overhead, and the next day asked old Blandot about it. He told me it was an old German viol player, a strange dumb man who signed his name as Eric Zahn, and who played evenings in a cheap theater orchestra, adding that Zahn's desire to play in the night after his return from the theater was the reason he had chosen this lofty and isolated garret room whose single gable window was the only point on the street from which one could look over the terminating wall at the declivity and panorama beyond. Thereafter I heard Zahn every night, and although he kept me awake, I was haunted by the weirdness of his music. Knowing little of the art myself, I was yet certain that none of his harmonies had any relation to music I had heard before, and concluded that he was a composer of highly original genius. The longer I listened, the more I was fascinated, until after a week I resolved to make the old man's acquaintance. One night, as he was returning from his work, I intercepted Zahn in the hallway and told him that I would like to know him and be with him when he played. He was a small, lean, bent person with shabby clothes, blue eyes, grotesque, satire-like face, and nearly bald head, and at my first words seemed both angered and frightened. My obvious friendliness, however, finally melted him, and he grudgingly motioned for me to follow him up the dark, creaking, and rickety attic stairs. His room, one of only two in the steeply pitched garret, was on the west side, toward the high wall that formed the upper end of the street. Its size was very great, and seemed the greater because of its extraordinary barrenness and neglect. Of furniture, there was only a narrow iron bedstead, a dingy washstand, a small table, a large bookcase, 
an iron music rack, and three old-fashioned chairs. Sheets of music were piled in disorder about the floor. The walls were of bare boards and had probably never known plaster, whilst the abundance of dust and cobwebs made the place seem more deserted than inhabited. Evidently, Eric Zahn's world of beauty lay in some far cosmos of imagination. Motioning me to sit down, the dumb man closed the door, turned the large wooden bolt, and lighted a candle to augment the one he had brought with him. He now removed his vial from its moth-eaten covering, and taking it, seated himself in the least uncomfortable of the chairs. He did not employ the music rack, but, offering no choice, and playing from memory, enchanted me for over an hour with strains I had never heard before, strains which must have been of his own devising. To describe their exact nature is impossible for one unversed in music. They were a kind of few, with recurrent passages of the most captivating quality, but to me were notable for the absence of any of the weird notes I had overheard from my room below on other occasions. Those haunting notes I had remembered, and had often hummed and whistled inaccurately to myself, so when the player at length laid down his bow, I asked him if he would render some of them. As I began my request, the wrinkled, satyr-like face lost the bored placidity it had possessed during the playing, and seemed to show the same curious mixture of anger and fright which I had noticed when first I accosted the old man. For a moment I was inclined to use persuasion, regarding rather lightly the whims of senility, and even tried to awaken my host's weirder mood by whistling a few of the strains to which I had listened the night before. But I did not pursue this course for more than a moment, for when the dumb musician recognized the whistled air, his face grew suddenly distorted with an expression wholly beyond analysis, and his long, cold, bony right hand reached out to stop my mouth and silence the crude imitation. As he did this, he further demonstrated his eccentricity by casting a startled glance toward the lone, curtained window, as if fearful of some intruder, a glance doubly absurd since the garret stood high and inaccessible above all the adjacent roofs, this window being the only point on the steep street, as the concierge had told me, from which one could see over the wall at the summit. The old man's glance brought Blandot's remark to my mind, and with a certain capriciousness I felt a wish to look out over the wide and dizzying panorama of moonlit roofs and city lights beyond the hilltop, which of all the dwellers in the Rue d'Orsay only this crabbed musician could see. I moved toward the window and would have drawn aside the nondescript curtains, when with a frightened rage even greater than before the dumb lodger was upon me again, this time motioning with his head toward the door as he nervously strove to drag me thither with both hands. Now thoroughly disgusted with my host, I ordered him to release me, and told him I would go at once. His clutch relaxed, and as he saw my disgust and offense, his own anger seemed to subside. He tightened his relaxing grip, but this time in a friendly manner, forcing me into a chair. Then, with an appearance of wistfulness, crossing to the littered table where he wrote many words with a pencil in the labored French of a foreigner. Zahn said that he was old, lonely, and afflicted with strange fears and nervous disorders connected with his music and with other things. He had enjoyed my listening to his music, and wished I would come again and not mind his eccentricities, but he could not play to another his weird harmonies, and could not bear hearing them from another, nor could he bear having anything in his room touched by another. He had not known until our hallway conversation that I could overhear his playing in my room, and now asked me if I would arrange with Blandot to take a lower room where I could not hear him in the night. He would, he wrote, defray the difference in rent. As I sat deciphering the execrable French, I felt more lenient toward the old man. He was a victim of physical and nervous suffering, as was I, and my metaphysical studies had taught me kindness. In the silence there came a slight sound from the window. The shutter must have rattled in the night wind, and for some reason I started almost as violently as did Eric Zahn. So when I had finished reading, I shook my host by the hand and departed as a friend. The next day, Blendot gave me a more expensive room on the third floor, between the apartments of an aged moneylender and the room of a respectable upholsterer. There was no one on the fourth floor. It was not long before I found that Zahn's eagerness for my company was not as great as it had seemed while he was persuading me to move down from the fifth story. He did not ask me to call on him, and when I did call, he appeared uneasy and played listlessly. This was always at night, in the day he slept and would admit no one. My liking for him did not grow, though the attic room and the weird music seemed to hold an odd fascination for me. I had a curious desire to look out of that window, over the wall and down the unseen slope at the glittering roofs and spires which must lie outspread there. Once I went up to the garret during theater hours when Zahn was away, but the door was locked. 
What I did succeed in doing was to overhear the nocturnal playing of the dumb old man. At first I would tiptoe up to my old fifth floor, then I grew bold enough to climb the last creaking staircase to the peaked garret. There, in the narrow hall, outside the bolted door with the covered keyhole, I often heard sounds which filled me with an indefinable dread. The dread of vague wonder and brooding mystery. It was not that the sounds were hideous, for they were not, but that they held vibrations suggesting nothing on this globe of Earth, and that at certain intervals they assumed a symphonic quality which I could hardly conceive as produced by one player. Certainly, Eric Zahn was a genius of wild power. As the weeks passed, the playing grew wilder, whilst the old musician acquired an increasing haggardness and furtiveness pitiful to behold. He now refused to admit me at any time, and shunned me whenever we met on the stairs. Then, one night, as I listened at the door, I heard the shrieking viol swell into a chaotic babble of sound, a pandemonium which would have led me to doubt my own shaking sanity had there not come from behind that barred portal a piteous proof that the horror was real. The awful, inarticulate cry which only a mute can utter, and which rises only in moments of the most terrible fear or anguish. I knocked repeatedly at the door, but received no response. Afterward, I waited in the black hallway, shivering with cold and fear, till I heard the poor musician's feeble effort to rise from the floor by the aid of a chair. Believing him just conscious after a fainting fit, I renewed my rapping, at the same time calling out my name reassuringly. I heard Zahn stumble to the window and close both shutter and sash, then stumble to the door which he falteringly unfastened to admit me. This time, his delight at having me present was real, for his distorted face gleamed with relief while he clutched at my coat as a child clutches at its mother's skirts. Shaking pathetically, the old man forced me into a chair whilst he sank into another, beside which his viol and bow lay carelessly on the floor. He sat for some time inactive, nodding oddly, but having a paradoxical suggestion of intense and frightened listening. Subsequently, he seemed to be satisfied, and crossing to a chair by the table, wrote a brief note, handed it to me, and returned to the table, where he began to write rapidly and incessantly. The note implored me, in the name of mercy and for the sake of my own curiosity, to wait where I was while he prepared a full account in German of all the marvels and terrors which beset him. I waited, and the dumb man's pencil flew. It was perhaps an hour later, while I still waited, and while the old musician's feverishly written sheets still continued to pile up, that I saw Zahn start, as from the hint of a horrible shock. Unmistakably, he was looking at the curtained window, and listening shudderingly. Then I half fancied I heard a sound myself, though it was not a horrible sound, but rather an exquisitely low, an infinitely distant musical note suggesting a player in one of the neighboring houses, or in some abode beyond the lofty wall over which I had never been able to look. Upon Zahn the effect was terrible, for dropping his pencil, suddenly he rose, seized his viol, and commenced to rend the night with the wildest playing I had ever heard from his bow save when listening at the barred door. It would be useless to describe the playing of Eric Zahn on that dreadful night. It was more horrible than anything I had ever overheard, because I could now see the expression of his face, and I could realize that this time the motive was stark fear. He was trying to make a noise, to ward something off or drown something out, what I could not imagine awesome, though I felt it must be. The playing grew fantastic, danous, and hysterical, yet kept to the last the qualities of supreme genius which I knew this strange old man possessed. I recognized the air, it was a wild Hungarian dance popular in the theaters, and I reflected for a moment that this was the first time I had ever heard Zahn play the work of another composer. Louder and louder, wilder and wilder, mounted the shrieking and whining of that desperate viol. The player was dripping with an uncanny perspiration and twisted like a monkey, always looking frantically at the curtained window. In his frenzied strains, I could almost see shadowy satyrs and bacchanals dancing and whirling insanely through seething abysses of clouds and smoke and lightning. And then I thought I heard a shriller, steadier note that was not from the viol. A calm, deliberate, purposeful mocking note from far away in the west. At this juncture, the shutter began to rattle in a howling night wind which had sprung up outside as if in answer to the mad playing within. Zahn's screaming viol now outdid itself emitting sounds I had never thought a vial could emit. The shutter rattled more loudly, unfastened, and commenced slamming against the window. Then the glass broke shiveringly under the persistent impact, 
and the chill wind rushed in, making the candles sputter and rustling the sheets of paper on the table where Zahn had begun to write out his horrible secret. I looked at Zahn and saw that he was past conscious observation. His blue eyes were bulging, glassy and sightless, and the frantic playing had become a blind, mechanical, unrecognizable orgy that no pen could even suggest. A sudden gust, stronger than the others, caught up the manuscript and bore it toward the window. I followed the flying sheets in desperation, but they were gone before I reached the demolished panes. Then I remembered my old wish to gaze from this window, the only window in the Rue d'Orsay from which one might see the slope beyond the wall and the city outspread beneath. It was very dark, but the city's lights always burned, and I expected to see them there amidst the rain and the wind. Yet when I looked from that highest of all gabled windows, looked while the candles sputtered and the insane viol howled with the night wind, I saw no city spread below, and no friendly lights gleamed from remembered streets, but only the blackness of space illimitable, unimagined space alive with motion and music, and having no semblance of anything on earth. And as I stood there, looking in terror, the wind blew out both candles in that ancient peaked garret, leaving me in savage and impenetrable darkness, with chaos and pandemonium before me, and the demon madness of that night-baying vial behind me. I staggered back in the dark, without the means of striking a light, crashing against the table, overturning a chair, and finally groping my way to the place where the blackness screamed with shocking music. To save myself and Eric Zahn, I could at least try, whatever the powers opposed to me. Once I thought some chill thing brushed me, and I screamed, but my scream could not be heard above that hideous vial. Suddenly, out of the blackness, the madly sawing bow struck me, and I knew I was close to the player. I felt ahead, touched the back of Zahn's chair, and then found and shook his shoulder in an effort to bring him to his senses. He did not respond, and still the vial shrieked on without slackening. I moved my hand to his head, whose mechanical nodding I was able to stop, and shouted in his ear that we must both flee from the unknown things of the night. But he neither answered me, nor abated the frenzy of his unutterable music, while all through the garret strange currents of wind seemed to dance in the darkness and babble. When my hand touched his ear, I shuddered, though I knew not why, knew not why till I felt the still face, the ice-cold, stiffened, unbreathing face whose glassy eyes bulged uselessly into the void. And then, by some miracle, finding the door and the large wooden bolt, I plunged wildly away from that glassy-eyed thing in the dark and from the ghoulish howling of that accursed vial whose fury increased even as I plunged. Leaping, floating, flying down those endless stairs through the dark house, racing mindlessly out into the narrow, steep, and ancient street of steps and tottering houses, clattering down steps and over cobbles to the lower streets and the putrid canyon-walled river, panting across the great dark bridge to the broader, healthier streets and boulevards we know. All these are terrible impressions that linger with me, and I recall that there was no wind, and that the moon was out, and that all the lights of the city twinkled. Despite my most careful searches and investigations, I have never since been able to find the Rue d'Orsay. But I'm not wholly sorry, either for this or for the loss in undreamable abysses of the closely written sheets which alone could have explained the music of Eric Zahn. End of The Music of Eric Zahn by H.P. Lovecraft. Recording by Cameron Halkett. Recording by Scott Carpenter The Nameless City by H. P. Lovecraft When I drew nigh the Nameless City I knew it was accursed. I was traveling in a parched and terrible valley under the moon, and afar I saw it protruding uncannily above the sands, as parts of a corpse may protrude from an ill-made grave. Fear spoke from the age-worn stones of this hoary survivor of the deluge, this great-grandfather of the eldest pyramid, and a viewless aura repelled me and bade me retreat from antique and sinister secrets that no man should see, and no man else had dared to see. Remote in the desert of Araby lies the nameless city, crumbling and inarticulate, its low walls nearly hidden by the sands of uncounted ages. 
It must have been thus before the first stones of Memphis were laid, and while the bricks of Babylon were yet unbaked. There is no legend so old as to give it a name, or to recall that it was ever alive, but it is told of in whispers around campfires, and muttered about by grandmams in the tents of sheiks, so that all tribes shun it without wholly knowing why. It was of this place that Abdul al Hazred, the mad poet, dreamed of the night before he sang his unexplained couplet, That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. I should have known that the Arabs had good reason for shunning the nameless city, the city told of in strange tales but seen by no living man. Yet I defied them, and went into the untrodden waste with my camel. I alone have seen it, and that is why no other face bears such hideous lines of fear as mine, why no other man shivers so horribly when the night wind rattles the windows. When I came upon it in the ghastly stillness of unending sleep, it looked at me, chilly from the rays of a cold moon amidst the desert's heat, and as I returned its look I forgot my triumph at finding it, and stopped still with my camel to wait for the dawn. For hours I waited till the east grew gray and the stars faded, and the gray turned to roseate light edged with gold. I heard a moaning, and saw a storm of sand stirring among the antique stones, though the sky was clear and the vast breaches of desert still. Then suddenly above the desert's far rim came the blazing edge of the sun, seen through the tiny sandstorm which was passing away, and in my fevered state I fancied that from some remote depth there came a crash of musical metal to hail the fiery disk as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile. My ears rang and my imagination seethed as I led my camel slowly across the sand to that unvocal place, that place which I alone of living men had seen. In and out amongst the shapeless foundations of houses and places I wandered, finding never a carving or inscription to tell of these men, if men they were, who built this city and dwelt therein so long ago. The antiquity of the spot was unwholesome, and I longed to encounter some sign or device to prove that the city was indeed fashioned by mankind. There were certain proportions and dimensions in the ruins which I did not like. I had with me many tools, and dug much within the walls of the obliterated edifices, but progress was slow, and nothing significant was revealed. When night and the moon returned, I felt a chill wind, which brought new fear, so that I did not dare to remain in the city. And as I went outside the antique walls to sleep, a small, sighing sandstorm gathered behind me, blowing over the gray stones, though the moon was bright and most of the desert still. I awakened just at dawn from a pageant of horrible dreams, my ears ringing as from some metallic peal. I saw the sun peering redly through the last gusts of a little sandstorm that hovered over the nameless city, and marked the quietness of the rest of the landscape. Once more I ventured within those brooding ruins that swelled beneath the sand like an ogre under a coverlet, and again dug vainly for relics of the forgotten race. At noon I rested, and in the afternoon I spent much time tracing the walls and bygone streets, and the outlines of the nearly vanished buildings. I saw that the city had been mighty indeed, and wondered at the sources of its greatness. To myself I pictured all the splendors of an age so distant that Chaldea could not recall it, and thought of Sarnath the doomed, that stood in the land of Nar when mankind was young, and of Ib, that was carven of gray stone before mankind existed. All at once I came upon a place where the bedrock rose stark through the sand, and formed a low cliff, and here I saw with joy what seemed to promise further traces of the antediluvian people. Hewn rudely on the face of the cliff were the unmistakable facades of several small, squat rock houses or temples, whose interiors might preserve many secrets of ages too remote for calculation, though sandstorms had long effaced any carvings which may have been outside. Very low and sand-choked were all the dark apertures near me, but I cleared one with my spade and crawled through it, carrying a torch to reveal whatever mysteries it might hold. When I was inside I saw that the cavern was indeed a temple, and beheld plain signs of the race that had lived and worshipped before the desert was a desert. Primitive altars, pillars, and niches, all curiously low, were not absent, and though I saw no sculptures or frescoes, there were many singular stones clearly shaped into symbols by artificial means. The lowness of the chiseled chamber was very strange, for I could hardly kneel upright, 
but the area was so great that my torch showed only part of it at a time. I shuddered oddly in some of the far corners, for certain altars and stones suggested forgotten rites of terrible, revolting, and inexplicable nature, and made me wonder what manner of men could have made and frequented such a temple. When I had seen all that the place contained, I crawled out again, avid to find what temples might yield. Night had now approached, yet the tangible things I had seen made curiosity stronger than fear, so that I did not flee from the long moon-cast shadows that had daunted me when I first saw the nameless city. In the twilight I cleared another aperture and with a new torch crawled into it, finding more vague stones and symbols, though nothing more definite than the other temple had contained. The room was just as low, but much less broad, ending in a very narrow passage crowded with obscure and cryptical shrines. About these shrines I was prying, when the noise of a wind and my camel outside broke through the stillness and drew me forth to see what could have frightened the beast. The moon was gleaming vividly over the primitive ruins, lighting a dense cloud of sand that seemed blown by a strong but decreasing wind from some point along the cliff ahead of me. I knew it was this chilly, sandy wind which had disturbed the camel and was about to lead him to a place of better shelter, when I chanced to glance up and saw that there was no wind atop the cliff. This astonished me and made me fearful again, but I immediately recalled the sudden local winds that I had seen and heard before at sunrise and sunset, and judged it was a normal thing. I decided it came from some rock fissure leading to a cave, and watched the troubled sand to trace it to its source, soon perceiving that it came from the black orifice of a temple a long distance south of me, almost out of sight. Against the choking sand cloud I plodded toward this temple, which as I neared it loomed larger than the rest, and shewed a doorway far less clogged with caked sand. I would have entered had not the terrific force of the icy wind almost quenched my torch. It poured madly out of the dark door, sighing uncannily as it ruffled the sand and spread among the weird ruins. Soon it grew fainter, and the sand grew more and more still, till finally all was at rest again but a presence seemed stalking among the spectral stones of the city, and when I glanced at the moon it seemed to quiver as though mirrored in unquiet waters. I was more afraid than I could explain, but not enough to dull my thirst for wonder, so as soon as the wind was quite gone, I crossed into the dark chamber from which it had come. This temple, as I had fancied from the outside, was larger than either of those I had visited before, and was presumably a natural cavern since it bore winds from some region beyond. Here I could stand quite upright, but saw that the stones and altars were as low as those in the other temples. On the walls and roof I beheld for the first time some traces of the pictorial art of the ancient race, curious curling streaks of paint that had almost faded or crumbled away, and on two of the altars I saw with rising excitement a maze of well-fashioned curvilinear carvings. As I held my torch aloft, it seemed to me that the shape of the roof was too regular to be natural, and I wondered what the prehistoric cutters of stone had first worked upon. Their engineering skill must have been vast. Then a brighter flare of fantastic flame showed that form which I had been seeking, the opening to those remoter abysses, whence the sudden wind had blown. And I grew faint when I saw that it was a small and plainly artificial door, chiseled in the solid rock. I thrust my torch within, beholding a black tunnel with the roof arching low over a rough flight of very small, numerous, and steeply descending steps. I shall always see those steps in my dreams, for I came to learn what they meant. At the time I hardly knew whether to call them steps or mere footholds in a precipitous descent. My mind was whirling with mad thoughts, and the words and warning of Arab prophets seemed to float across the desert from the land that men know to the nameless city that men dare not. Yet I hesitated only for a moment before advancing through the portal and commencing to climb cautiously down the steep passage, feet first, as though on a ladder. It is only in the terrible phantasms of drugs or delirium that any other man can have such a descent as mine. The narrow passage led infinitely down like some hideous haunted well, and the torch I held above my head could not light the unknown depths toward which I was crawling. I lost track of the hours and forgot to consult my watch, though I was frightened when I thought of the distance I must have been traversing. There were changes of direction and of steepness, and once I came to a long, low, level passage where I had to wriggle my feet first along the rocky floor, holding torch at arm's length beyond my head. The place was not high enough for kneeling. After that were more of the steep steps, and I was still scrambling down interminably when my failing torch died out. I do not think I noticed it at the time, for when I did notice it, I was still holding it above me as if it were ablaze. 
I was quite unbalanced with that instinct for the strange and the unknown, which had made me a wanderer upon earth and a hunter of far ancient and forbidden places. In the darkness there flashed before my mind fragments of my cherished treasury of demonic lore, sentences from Alhazred the Mad Arab, paragraphs from the apocryphal nightmares of Damascus, and infamous lines from the delirious image du monde of Gautier de Metz. I repeated queer extracts and muttered of Afrasia and the daemons that floated with him down the Oxus, later chanting over and over again a phrase from one of Lord Dunsany's tales, the unreverberate blackness of the abyss. Once, when the descent grew amazingly steep, I recited something in sing-song from Thomas Moore, until I feared to recite more. A reservoir of darkness, black, as witches' cauldrons are when filled, with moon drugs in the eclipse distilled, leaning to look a foot might pass. Down through that chasm I saw beneath, as far as vision could explore, the jetty sides as smooth as glass, looking as if just varnished o'er. With that dark pitch the seat of death throws out upon its slimy shore. Time had quite ceased to exist when my feet again felt a level floor, and I found myself in a place slightly higher than the rooms in two smaller temples, now so incalculably far above my head. I could not quite stand, but could kneel upright, and in the dark I shuffled and crept hither and thither at random. I soon knew that I was in a narrow passage, whose walls were lined with cases of wood having glass fronts. As in that paleozoic and abysmal place I felt of such things as polished wood and glass, I shuddered at the possible implications. The cases were apparently ranged along each side of the passage at regular intervals, and were oblong and horizontal hideously like coffins in shape and size. When I tried to move two or three for further examination, I found that they were firmly fastened. I saw that the passage was a long one, so floundered ahead rapidly, in a creeping run that would have seemed horrible had any eye watched me in the blackness, crossing from side to side occasionally to feel of my surroundings, and be sure that the walls and rows of cases still stretched on. Man is so used to thinking visually that I almost forgot the darkness and pictured the endless corridor of wood and glass in its low-studded monotony as though I saw it, and then in a moment of indescribable emotion I did see it. Just when my fancy merged into real sight I cannot tell, but there came a gradual glow ahead, and all at once I knew that I saw the dim outlines of a corridor and cases revealed by some unknown subterranean phosphorescence. For a little while all was exactly as I had imagined it, since the glow was very faint, but as I mechanically kept stumbling ahead into the stronger light, I realized that my fancy had been but feeble. This hall was no relic of crudity like the temples in the city above, but a monument of the most magnificent and exotic art. Rich, vivid, and daringly fantastic designs and pictures formed a continuous scheme of mural paintings whose lines and colors were beyond description. The cases were of a strange golden wood, with fronts of exquisite glass, and containing the mummified forms of creatures, outreaching in grotesqueness the most chaotic dreams of man. To convey any idea of these monstrosities is impossible. They were of the reptile kind, with body lines suggesting sometimes the crocodile, sometimes the seal, but more often nothing of which either the naturalist or the paleontologist ever heard. In size they approximated a small man, and their forelegs bore delicate and evident feet, curiously like human hands and fingers. But strangest of all were their heads, which presented a contour violating all known biological principles. To nothing can such things be well compared. In one flash I thought of comparisons as varied as the cat, the bullfrog, the mythic satyr, and the human being. Not Jove himself had had so colossal and protuberant a forehead, yet the horns and the noselessness and the alligator-like jaw placed things outside of all established categories. I debated for a time on the reality of the mummies, half suspecting they were artificial idols, but soon decided they were indeed some Paleogean species which had lived when the nameless city was alive. To crown their grotesqueness, most of them were gorgeously enrobed in the costliest of fabrics, and lavishly laden with ornaments of gold, jewels, and unknown shining metals. The importance of these crawling creatures must have been vast, for they held first place among the wild designs on the frescoed walls and ceiling. With matchless skill had the artist drawn them in a world of their own, wherein they had cities and gardens fashioned to suit their dimensions, and I could not help but think that their pictured history was allegorical, perhaps showing the progress of the race that worshipped them. 
These creatures, I said to myself, were to men of the nameless city what the she-wolf was to Rome, or some totem beast is to a tribe of Indians. Holding this view, I could trace roughly a wonderful epic of the nameless city, the tale of a mighty sea-coast metropolis that ruled the world before Africa rose out of the waves, and of its struggles as the sea shrank away and the desert crept into the fertile valley that held it. I saw its wars and triumphs, its troubles and defeats, and afterwards its terrible fight against the desert, when thousands of its people, here represented in allegory by the grotesque reptiles, were driven to chisel their way down through the rocks in some marvelous manner to another world whereof their prophets had told them. It was all vividly weird and realistic, and its connection with the awesome descent I had made was unmistakable. I even recognized the passages. As I crept along the corridor toward the brighter light, I saw stages of the painted epic, the leave-taking of the race that had dwelt in the nameless city and the valley around for ten million years, the race whose souls shrank from quitting scenes their bodies had known so long, where they had settled as nomads in the earth's youth, hewing in the virgin rock those primal shrines at which they had never ceased to worship. Now that the light was better, I studied the pictures more closely, and remembering that the strange reptiles must represent the unknown men, pondered upon the customs of the nameless city. Many things were peculiar and inexplicable. The civilization, which included a written alphabet, had seemingly risen to a higher order than those immeasurably later civilizations of Egypt and Chaldea, yet there were curious omissions. I could, for example, find no pictures to represent deaths or funeral customs, save such as were related to wars, violence, and plagues. And I wondered at the reticence shown concerning natural death. It was as though an ideal of immortality had been fostered as a cheering illusion. Still nearer the end of the passage was painted scenes of the utmost picturesqueness and extravagance, contrasted views of the nameless city and its desertion and growing ruin, and of the strange new realm of paradise to which the race had hewed its way through the stone. In these views the city and the desert valley were shewn always by moonlight, golden nimbus hovering over the fallen walls, and half revealing the splendid perfection of former times, shown spectrally and elusively by the artist. The paradisal scenes were almost too extravagant to be believed, portraying a hidden world of eternal day filled with glorious cities and ethereal hills and valleys. At the very last I thought I saw signs of an artistic anticlimax. The paintings were less skillful and much more bizarre than even the wildest of the earlier scenes. They seemed to record a slow decadence of the ancient stock, coupled with a growing ferocity toward the outside world from which it was driven by the desert. The forms of the people, always represented by the sacred reptiles, appeared to be gradually wasting away, though their spirit, as shown hovering above the ruins by moonlight, gained in proportion. Emaciated priests, displayed as reptiles in ornate robes, cursed the upper air and all who breathed it, and one terrible final scene showed a primitive-looking man, perhaps a pioneer of ancient era, the city of pillars, torn to pieces by members of the elder race. I remember how the Arabs feared the nameless city, and was glad that beyond this place the gray walls and ceiling were bare. As I viewed the pageant of mural history, I had approached very closely to the end of the low-sealed hall, and was aware of a gate through which came all of the illuminating phosphorescence. Creeping up to it, I cried aloud in transcendent amazement at what lay beyond, for instead of other and brighter chambers, there was only an illimitable void of uniform radiance, such as one might fancy when gazing down from the peak of Mount Everest upon a sea of sunlit mist. Behind me was a passage so cramped that I could not stand upright in it. Before me was an infinity of subterranean effulgence. Reaching down from the passage into the abyss was the head of a steep flight of steps, small, numerous steps like those of black passages I had traversed, but after a few feet the glowing vapors concealed everything. Swung back open against the left-hand wall of the passage was a massive door of brass, incredibly thick and decorated with fantastic bar-reliefs, which could have closed, shut the whole inner world of light away from the vaults and passages of rock. I looked at the step, and for the nonce dared not to try them. I touched the open brass door, and could not move it. Then I sank prone to the stone floor, my mind aflame with prodigious reflections which not even a death-like exhaustion could banish. As I lay still with closed eyes, free to ponder, many things I had lightly noted in the frescoes came back to me with new and terrible significance. Scenes representing the nameless city in its heyday, the vegetations of the valley around it, and 
the distant lands with which its merchants traded. The allegory of the crawling creatures puzzled me by its universal prominence, and I wondered that it would be so closely followed in a pictured history of such importance. In the frescoes, the nameless city had been shown in proportions fitted to the reptiles. I wondered what its real proportions and magnificence had been, and reflected a moment on certain oddities I had noticed in the ruins. I thought curiously of the lowness of the primal temples, and of the underground corridor, which were doubtless hewn thus out of deference to the reptile deities there honored, though it perforce reduced the worshippers to crawling. Perhaps the very rites here involved crawling in imitation of the creatures. No religious theory, however, could easily explain why the level passages in that awesome descent should be as low as the temples, or lower, since one could not even kneel. As I thought of the crawling creatures whose hideous, mummified forms were so close to me, I felt a new throb of fear. Mental associations are curious, and I shrank from the idea that except for the poor primitive man torn to pieces in the last painting, mine was the only human form amidst the many relics and symbols of the primordial life. But as always in my strange and roving existence, wonder soon drove out fear, for the luminous abyss and what it might contain presented a problem worthy of the greatest explorer. That a weird world of mystery lay far down that flight of peculiarly small steps I could not doubt, and I hoped to find there those human memorials which the painted corridor had failed to give. The frescoes had pictured unbelievable cities and valleys in this lower realm, and my fancy dwelt on the rich and colossal ruins that awaited me. My fears, indeed, concerned the past rather than the future. Not even the physical horror of my position in that cramped corridor of dead reptiles and antediluvian frescoes, miles below the world I knew and faced by another world of eerie light and mist, could match the lethal dread I felt at the abysmal antiquity of the scene and its soul. An ancientness so vast that measurement is feeble seemed to leer down from the primal stones and rock-hewn temples in the nameless city while the very latest of the astounding maps in the frescoes shoot oceans and continents that man has forgotten, with only here and there some vaguely familiar outlines. Of what could have happened in the geological ages since the paintings ceased and the death-hating race resentfully succumbed to decay, no man might say. Life had once teemed in these caverns and in the luminous realm beyond. Now I was alone with vivid relics and I trembled to think of the countless ages through which these relics had kept a silent, deserted vigil. Suddenly there came another burst of that acute fear which had intermittently seized me ever since I first saw the terrible valley and the nameless city under a cold moon, and despite my exhaustion I found myself starting frantically to a sitting posture and gazing back along the black corridor toward the tunnels that rose to the outer world. My sensations were like those which had made me shun the nameless city at night, and were as inexplicable as they were poignant. In another moment, however, I received a still greater shock in the form of a definite sound, the first which had broken the utter silence of these tomb-like depths. It was a deep, low moaning, as of a distant throng of condemned spirits, and came from the direction in which I was staring. Its volume rapidly grew, till it soon reverberated rightfully through the low passage, and at the same time I became conscious of an increasing draft of old air, likewise flowing from the tunnels and the city above. The touch of this air seemed to restore my balance, for I instantly recalled the sudden gusts which had risen around the mouth of the abyss, each sunset and sunrise, one of which had indeed revealed the hidden tunnels to me. I looked at my watch and saw that sunrise was near, so bracing myself to resist the gale that was sweeping down to its cavern home, as it had swept forth at evening. My fear again waned low, since a natural phenomenon tends to dispel broodings over the unknown. More and more madly poured the shrieking, moaning night wind into the gulf of the inner earth. I dropped prone again and clutched vainly at the floor for fear of being swept bodily through the open gate into the phosphorescent abyss. Such fury I had not expected, and as I grew aware of an actual slipping of my form toward the abyss, I was beset by a thousand new terrors of apprehension and imagination. The malignancy of the blast awakened incredible fancies. Once more I compared myself shudderingly to the only human image in that frightful corridor, the man who was torn to pieces by the nameless race. For in the fiendish clawing of the swirling currents there seemed to abide a vindictive rage, all the stronger because it was largely impotent. I think I screamed frantically near the last. I was almost mad of the howling wind raids. I tried to crawl against the murderous, invisible torrent, but I could not even hold my own as I was pushed slowly and inexorably toward the unknown world. If 
finally reason must have wholly snapped, for I fell babbling over and over that unexplainable couplet of the mad Arab al Hazred, who dreamed of the nameless city. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Only the grim, brooding desert gods know what really took place, what indescribable struggles and scrambles in the dark I endured, or what Abaddon had guided me back to life where I must always remember and shiver in the night wind, till oblivion or worse claims me. Monstrous, unnatural, colossal was the thing, too far beyond all the ideas of man to be believed except in the silent, damnable small hours of the morning when one cannot sleep. I have said that the fury of the rushing blast was infernal, cacodemoniacal, and that its voices were hideous with the pent-up viciousness of desolate eternities. Presently these voices, while still chaotic before me, seemed to my beating brain to take articulate form behind me, and down there in the grave of unnumbered eon-dead antiquities, leagues below the dawn-lit world of men, I heard the ghastly cursing and snarling of strange-tongued fiends. Turning, I saw outlined against the luminous ether of the abyss what could not be seen against the dusk of the corridor a nightmare horde of rushing devils, hate-distorted, grotesquely panoplied, half-transparent devils of a race no man might mistake, the crawling reptiles of the nameless city. And as the wind died away, I was plunged into the ghoul-pooled darkness of the earth's bowels, for behind the last of the creatures the great brazen door clanged shut with a deafening peal of metallic music whose reverberations swelled out to the distant world to hail the rising sun as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile. End of The Nameless City Recorded by Durant Hare, Nyarlathotep, by H. P. Lovecraft. Nyarlathotep, the crawling chaos, I am the last. I will tell the audient void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger, a danger widespread and all-embracing, such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces, and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abysses between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demoniac alteration in the sequence of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world, and perhaps the universe, had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Nyarlathotep came out of Egypt. Who he was, none could tell, but he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The fellahin knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of twenty-seven centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilization came Nyarlathotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister always buying strange instruments of glass and metal, and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Nyarlathotep, and shuddered, and where Nyarlathotep went, rest vanished for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pitying moon as it glimmered on green waters gliding under bridges 
and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Nyarlathotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him, and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friend said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginings, and what was thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesied things none but Nyarlathotep dared prophesy, and in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which shewed only in the eyes, and I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Nyarlathotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowd to see Nyarlathotep. Through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room. And shadowed on a screen I saw hooded forms amidst ruins, and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments. And I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end, whilst shadows more grotesque than I can tell came out and squatted on the heads. And when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity, Nyarlathotep drove us all out, down the dizzy stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I never could be afraid, and others screamed with me for solace. We swore to one another that the city was exactly the same, and still alive. And when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again, and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious involuntary marching formations, and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal to shoe where the tramways had run. And again we saw a tram car, lone, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country, and presently I felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn, for as we stalked out on the dark moor we beheld around us the hellish moon glitter of evil snows. Trackless, inexplicable snows swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind. For the black rift in the green-litten snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard the reverberations of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished, but my power to linger was slight. As if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering and afraid into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable. Screamingly sentient, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low. Beyond the worlds, vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums, and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping 
Burren to dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic, tenebrous, ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is Nyarlathotep. End of Nyarlathotep. Recording by Sandra Zero. The Picture in the House by H. P. Lovecraft. Searchers after horror haunt strange, far places. For them are the catacombs of Ptolemais and the coven mausolea of the nightmare countries. They climb to the moonlit towers of ruined Rhine castles and falter down the black cobweb steps beneath the scattered stones of forgotten cities in Asia. The haunted wood and the desolate mountain are their shrines, and they linger around the sinister monoliths on uninhabited islands. But the true epicure in the terrible, to whom a new thrill of an unutterable ghastliness is the chief end and justification of existence, esteems most of all the ancient lonely farmhouses of Beckwood's New England. For there, the dark elements of strength, solitude, grotesqueness and ignorance combine to form the perfection of the hideous. Most horrible of all sights are the little unpainted wooden houses, remote from travelled ways, usually squatted upon some damp grassy slope or leaning against some gigantic outcropping of rock. Two hundred years and more they have leaned or squatted there, while the vines have crawled and the trees have swelled and spread. They are almost hidden now, in lawless luxuriances of green and guardian shrouds of shadow. But the small paint windows still stare shockingly, as if blinking through a little stopper, which was of madness by dulling the memory of an terrible things. In such houses have dwelled generations of strange people, whose like the world has never seen. Sized with a gloomy and fanatical belief, which exiled them from their kind, their ancestors sought the wilderness for freedom. There the science of a conquering race indeed flourished free from the restrictions of their fellows, but cowered in an appalling slavery to the dismal phantasms of their own minds. Diversed from the enlightenment of civilization, the strength of the Puritans turned into singular channels, and in their isolation, morbid self-repression and struggle for life with relentless nature, there came to them dark furtive traits from the prehistoric depths of the cold northern heritage. By necessity practical and by philosophy stern, these folks were not beautiful in their sins. Erring, as all mortals must, they were forced by their rigid code to seek concealment above all else, so that they came to use less and less taste in what they concealed. Only the silent, sleepy, staring houses in the backwoods can tell all that has lain hidden since the early days, and they are not communicative, being loath to shake off the drowsiness which helps them forget. Sometimes one feels that it would be merciful to tear down these houses, for they must often dream. It was to a time-battered edifice of this description that I was driven one afternoon in November 1896 by a rain of such chilling copiousness that any shelter was preferable to exposure. I had been travelling for some time amongst the people of the Miskatonic Valley in quest of certain genealogical data and from the remote, devious and problematical nature of my curse, had deemed it convenient to employ a bicycle, despite the lateness of the season. Now I found myself upon an apparently abandoned road, which I had chosen as the shortest cut to Arkham, overtaken by the storm at a point far from any town, and confronted with no refuge, save the antique and repellent wooden building, which blinked with blurred windows from between two huge leafless elms, near the foot of a rocky hill. Distant though it is from the remnant of a road, this house nonetheless impressed me unfavorably the very moment I espied it. 
honest, wholesome structures do not stare at travelers so slyly and hauntingly. And in my genealogical researches, I had encountered legends of a century before, which biased me against places of this kind. Yet, the force of the elements was such as to overcome my scruples, and I did not hesitate to wheel my machine up the widdy rise to the closed door which seemed at once so suggestive and secretive. I had somehow taken it for granted that the house was abandoned, yet as I approached it I was not so sure, for though the walks were indeed overgrown with weeds, they seemed to retain their nature a little too well to argue complete desertion. Therefore, instead of trying the door, I knocked, feeling as I did so a trepidation I could scarcely explain. As I waited on the rough, mossy rock which served as a doorstep, I glanced at the neighboring windows and the panes of the transom above me, and noticed that although old, rattling, and almost opaque with dirt, they were not broken. The building then must still be inhabited, despite its isolation and general neglect. However, my rapping evoked no response, so after repeating the summons, I tried the rusty latch and found the door unfastened. Inside was a little vestibule, with walls from which the plaster was falling, and through the doorway came a faint but peculiarly hateful odor. I entered, carrying my bicycle, and closed the door behind me. Ahead rose a narrow staircase, flanked by a small door, probably leading to a cellar, while to the left and right were closed doors leading to rooms on the ground floor. Leaning my cycle against the wall, I opened the door at the left and crossed into a small, low-sealed chamber, but dimly lighted by its two dusty windows, and furnished in the barest and most primitive possible way. It appeared to be a kind of sitting room, for it had a table and several chairs, and an immense fireplace, above which ticked an antique clock on the mantel. Books and papers were very few, and in the prevailing gloom I could not readily discern the titles. What interested me was the uniform air of archaism as displayed in every visible detail. Most of the houses in this region I had found rich in relics of the past, but here the antiquity was curiously complete, for in all the room I could not discover a single article of definitely post-revolutionary date. Had the furnishings been less humble, the place would have been a collector's paradise. As I surveyed this quiet apartment, I felt an increase in the aversion first excited by the bleak exterior of the house. Just what it was that I feared or loathed, I could by no means define, but something in the whole atmosphere seemed redolent of unhallowed age, of unpleasant crudeness, and of secrets which should be forgotten. I felt disinclined to sit down and wandered about examining the various articles which I had noticed. The first object of my curiosity was a book of medium size lying upon the table and presenting such an antediluvian aspect that I marveled at beholding it outside a museum or library. It was bound in leather with metal fittings and was in an excellent state of preservation being altogether an unusual sort of volume to encounter in an abode so lowly. When I opened it to the title page, my wonder grew even greater, for it proved to be nothing less rare than Pigafetta's account of the Congo region, written in Latin from the notes of the sailor Lopex and printed at Frankfurt in 1598. I had often heard of this work, with its curious illustrations by the brothers de Bray, hence for a moment forgot my uneasiness in my desire to turn the pages before me. The engravings were indeed interesting, drawn wholly from imagination and careless descriptions, and represented negroes with white skins and Caucasian features. Nor would I soon have closed the book had not an exceedingly trivial circumstance upset my tired nerves and revived my sensation of disquiet. What annoyed me 
was merely the persistent way in which the volume tended to fall open of itself at plate 12, which represented in gruesome detail a butcher's shop of the cannibal antiques. I experienced some shame at my susceptibility to so slight a thing, but the drawing nevertheless disturbed me, especially in connection with some adjusted passages descriptive on antiques gastronomy. I had turned to a neighboring shelf and was examining its meager literary contents, an 18th century Bible, a pilgrim's progress of like period illustrated with grotesque woodcuts and printed by the almanac maker Isaiah Thomas, the rotting book of Cotton Mother's Magnalia Christi Americana, and a few other books of evidently equal age, when my attention was aroused by the unmistakable sound of walking in the room overhead. At first astonished and startled, considering the lack of response to my recent knocking at the door, I immediately afterward concluded that the walker had just awakened from a sound sleep, and listened with less surprise as the footsteps sounded on the creaking stairs. The tread was heavy, yet seemed to contain a curious quality of consciousness, a quality which I disliked the more because the tread was heavy. When I had entered the room, I had shut the door behind me. Now, after a moment of silence, during which the walker may have been inspecting my bicycle in the hall, I heard a fumbling at the latch and saw the panelled portal swing open again. In the doorway stood a person of such singular appearance that I should have exclaimed aloud but for the restraints of good breeding. Old, white-bearded and ragged, my host possessed a countenance and physique which inspired equal wonder and respect. His height could not have been less than six feet, and despite a general air of age and poverty, he was stout and powerful in proportion. His face, almost hidden by a long beard which grew high on the cheeks, seemed abnormally ruddy and less wrinkled than one might expect, while over a high forehead fell a shock of white hair little thinned by the years. His blue eyes, though a trifle bloodshot, seemed inexplicably keen and burning. But for his horrible unkemptness, the man would have been as distinguished looking as he was impressive. This unkemptness, however, made him offensive despite his face and figure. Of what his clothing consisted, I could hardly tell for it seemed to me no more than a mass of tatters surmounting a pair of high, heavy boots, and his lack of cleanliness surpassed description. The appearance of this man, and the instinctive fear he inspired, prepared me for something like enmity, so that I almost shuddered through surprise and a sense of uncanny incongruity, when he motioned me to a chair, and addressed me in a thin, weak voice full of foaming respect, and ingratiating hospitality. His speech was very curious, an extreme form of Yankee dialect I had thought long extinct, and I studied it closely as he sat down opposite me for conversation. Catch in the rain, beer, he greeted, glad he was nigh the house and had the sense to come right in. I calculate I was asleep, else I'd heard ye. I ain't as young as I asked to be and I need a powerful sight on apps nowadays. Traveling for? I hain't seen many folks long this route since they took off the Arkham stage. I replied that I was going to Arkham and apologized for my rude entry into his domicile, whereupon he continued. Glad to see ya, young sir. New faces is scarce around here, and I hain't got much to cheer me up these days. Guess you hail from busting, don't ya? I never been there, but I can tell a town man when I see him. We had one fair district schoolmaster in 84, but he quit sudden, and no one never heard on him since. Here the old man lapsed into a kind of chuckle, and made no explanation when I questioned him. He seems to be in an aboundingly good humor, yet to possess those eccentricities which one might guess from his grooming. For some time he rambled on with an almost feverish denality, when it struck me to ask him how he came by so rare a book as Picafetta's Regnum Congo. 
The effect of this volume had not left me, and I felt a certain hesitancy in speaking of it, but curiosity overmastered all the vague fears which had steadily accumulated since my first glimpse of this house. To my relief, the question did not seem an awkward one, for the old man answered freely and volubly. Oh, that a freaky book! Captain Ebenezer Holt traded me that in 68. He must was killed in the war. Something about the name of Ebenezer Holt caused me to look up sharply. I had encountered it in my genealogical work, but not in any record since the revolution. I wondered if my host could help me in the task at which I was laboring, and resolved to ask him about it later on. He continued, Ebenezer was on Salem merchantman for years, and picked up a sight of queer stuff in every port. He got this in London, I guess. He asked her like to buy things at the shops. I was up to his house once, on the hill treading horses, when I see this book. I relished the pictures, so he gave it in on a swap. This a queer book. Here, let me get on my spectacles. The old man fumbled among his rags, producing a pair of dirty and amazingly antique glasses, with small octagonal lenses and steel bows. Donning these, he reached for the volume on the table and turned the pages lovingly. Ebenezer could read a little of this, this Latin, but I can't. I had two or three schoolmasters read me a bit, and passing Clark, him, they said, got drowned in the pond. Can you make anything out in it? I told him that I could, and translated for his benefit a paragraph near the beginning. If I erred, he was not scholar enough to correct me, for he seemed childishly pleased at my English version. His proximity was becoming rather obnoxious, yet I saw no way to escape without offending him. I was amused at the childish fondness of this ignorant old man for the pictures in a book he could not read, and wondered how much better he could read the few books in English which adorned the room. This revelation of simplicity removed much of the ill-defined apprehension I had felt, and I smiled as my host rambled on. Queer how pictures can set a body thinking. Take this one here near the front. Hey, you ever see trees like that, with big leaves a flopping over and down? And them men, them can't be niggers, they do be tall. Kinds are like Indians, I guess, even if they be in Africa. Some of these here creatures looks like monkeys, or half monkeys and half men, but I never heard on nothing like this one. Here he pointed to a fabulous creature of the artist, which one might describe as a sort of dragon with the head of an alligator. But now I'll show you the best one over here, nigh the middle. The old man's speech grew a trifle thicker, and his eyes assumed a brighter glow, but his fumbling hands, though seemingly clumsier than before, were entirely adequate to their mission. The book fell open, almost of its own accord, and as if from frequent consultation at this place, to the repellent twelfth plate showing a butcher's shop amongst the antique cannibals. My sense of restlessness returned, though I did not exhibit it. The especially bizarre thing was that the artist had made his Africans look like white men. The limbs and quarters hanging about the walls of the shop were ghastly, while the butcher with his axe was hideously incongruous. But my host seemed to relish the view as much as I disliked it. What do you think of this? I never seen the like hereabouts, eh? When I see this, I tell Ebholt, that's something to steer ye up and make ye blood tickle. When I read the scripture about slaying, like the Midianites was slew, I kinder think things, but I ain't got no picture of it. Here a body can see all there is to see. I suppose it's sinful, but ain't we all born and living in sin? That fella being chopped up gives me a tickle every time I look at him. I hate I keep looking at him, see where the butcher cut off his feet, toss his head on that bench with one arm side of it and other arms on the other side of the mid-block. 
as the man mumbled on in his shocking ecstasy, the expression on his hairy spectacled face became indescribable, but his voice sank rather than mounted. My own sensations can scarcely be recorded. All the terror I had dimly felt before rushed upon me actively and vividly, and I knew that I loathed the ancient and abhorrent creature so near me with an infinite intensity. His madness, or at least his partial perversion, seemed beyond dispute. He was almost whispering now, with a huskiness more terrible than a scream, and I trembled as I listened. As I say, tis queer how pictures set you thinking. Do you know, young sir, I'm right set on this one here. After I got the book of F, I asked to look at it a lot. Especially when I'd hear passing Clark run on Sundays in his big wig. Almost I tried something funny. Here, young sir, don't get scared. All I done was to look at their picture afore I killed the ship for market. Killing ship was kinder more fun after looking at it. The tone of the old man now sank very low, sometimes becoming so faint that his words were hardly audible. I listened to the rain and to the rattling of the blurred small paned windows, and marked a rumbling of approaching thunder, quite unusual for the season. Once a terrific flash and peal shook the frail house to its foundations, but the whisperer seemed not to notice it. Killing ship was kinder more fun, but, you know, it weren't quite satisfying. Queer how a craving gets a halt on yet, as ye love the Almighty, young man, don't tell nobody, but I swear to God, the picture began to make me hungry for victuals I couldn't rise nearby. Here, sit still, what's ailing yet? I didn't do nothing, only I wondered how it would be if I did. They say meat makes blood and flesh and gives ye new life, so I wondered if it wouldn't make a man live longer and longer if it was more the same. But the whisperer never continued. The interruption was not produced by my fright, nor by the rapidly increasing storm, amidst whose fury I was presently to open my eyes on a smoky solitude of blackened ruins. It was produced by a very simple, though somewhat unusual, happening. The open book lay flat between us, with the picture staring repulsively upward. As the old man whispered the words, more the same, a tiny spluttering impact was heard, and something showed on the yellowed paper of the upturned volume. I thought of the rain and of a leaky roof, but rain is not red. On the butcher's shop of the antique cannibals, a small red sputtering glistened picturesquely, lending vividness to the horror of the engraving. The old man saw it and stopped whispering even before my expression of horror made it necessary. Saw it and glanced quickly towards the floor of the room he had left an hour before. I followed his glance and beheld just above us on the loose plaster of the ancient ceiling a large irregular spot of wet crimson which seemed to spread even as I viewed it. I did not shriek or move but merrily shut my eyes. A moment later came the titanic thunderbolt of thunderbolts, blasting that accursed house of unutterable secrets and bringing the oblivion which alone saved my mind. End of the picture in the house. Recording by James Pontolillo. Polaris by H.P. Lovecraft. Into the north window of my chamber glows the pole star with uncanny light. All through the long hellish hours of blackness it shines there, and in the autumn of the year, when the winds from the north curse and whine, and the red-leaved trees of the swamp mutter things to one another in the small hours of the morning under the horned waning moon, I sit by the easement and watch that star. Down from the heights reels the glittering Cassiopeia as the hours wear on, while Charles's wain lumbers up from behind the vapor-soaked swamp trees that sway in the night wind. Just before dawn, Arcturus winks ruddily from above the cemetery on the low hillock, 
and Coma Berenices shimmers weirdly, afar off in the mysterious east. But still the pole star leers down from the same place in the black vault, winking hideously like an insane watching eye which strives to convey some strange message, yet recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey. Sometimes, when it is cloudy, I can sleep. Well do I remember the night of the great aurora, when over the swamp lay the shocking coruscations of the daemon light. After the beams came clouds, and then I slept. And it was under a horned waning moon that I saw the city for the first time. Still and somnolent did it lie, on a strange plateau in a hollow betwixt strange peaks. Of ghastly marble were its walls and its towers, its columns, domes, and pavements. In the marble streets were marble pillars, the upper parts of which were carven into the images of grave bearded men. The air was warm and stirred not, and overhead, scarce ten degrees from the zenith, glowed that watching pole star. Long did I gaze on the city, but the day came not. When the red Aldebaran, which blinked low in the sky but never set, had crawled a quarter of the way around the horizon, I saw light and motion in the houses and the streets. Forms strangely robed, but at once noble and familiar, walked abroad, and under the horned waning moon, men talked wisdom in a tongue which I understood, though it was unlike any language I had ever known. And when the red Aldebaran had crawled more than halfway around the horizon, there were again darkness and silence. When I awaked, I was not as I had been. Upon my memory was graven the vision of the city, and within my soul had arisen another and vaguer recollection, of whose nature I was not then certain. Thereafter, on the cloudy nights when I could sleep, I saw the city often, sometimes under that horned waning moon, and sometimes under the hot yellow rays of a sun which did not set, but which wheeled low around the horizon. And on the clear nights, the pole star leered as never before. Gradually, I came to wonder what might be my place in that city on the strange plateau betwixt strange peaks. At first content to view the scene as an all-observant uncorporeal presence, I now desired to define my relation to it, and to speak my mind amongst the grave men who conversed each day in the public squares. I said to myself, This is no dream, for by what means can I prove the greater reality of that other life in the house of stone and brick south of the sinister swamp and the cemetery on the low hillock where the pole star peers into my north window each night? One night, as I listened to the discourse in the large square containing many statues, I felt a change, and perceived that I had at last a bodily form. Nor was I a stranger in the streets of Olathoe, which lies on the plateau of Sarkis, betwixt the peaks Notan and Kariponek. It was my friend Alos who spoke, and his speech was one that pleased my soul, for it was the speech of a true man and patriot. That night had the news come of Dykos's fall, and of the advance of the Inutos, squat, hellish, yellow fiends who five years ago appeared out of the unknown west to ravage the confines of our kingdom, and finally to besiege our towns. Having taken the fortified places at the foot of the mountains, their way now lay open to the plateau, unless every citizen could resist with the strength of ten men. For the squat creatures were mighty in the arts of war, and knew not the scruples of honor, which held back our tall, gray-eyed men of Lomar from ruthless conquest. Alos, my friend, was commander of all the forces of the plateau, and in him lay the last hope of our country. On this occasion he spoke of the perils to be faced, and exhorted the men of Olathoe, bravest of the Lomarians, to sustain the traditions of their ancestors, who when forced to move southward from Zavna before the advance of the great ice sheet, even as our descendants must someday flee from the land of Lomar, valiantly and victoriously swept aside the hairy, long-armed cannibal Gnupkes that stood in their way. To me, Alos denied a warrior's part, for I was feeble and given to strange faintings when subjected to stress and hardships. But my eyes were the keenest in the city, despite the long hours I gave each day to the study of the Nakotic manuscripts and the wisdom of the Zubnarian fathers. So my friend, desiring not to doom me to inaction, rewarded me with that duty which was second to nothing in importance. 
to the watchtower of Thapnen he sent me, there to serve as the eyes of our army. Should the Anutos attempt to gain the citadel by the narrow pass behind the peak Notan, and thereby surprise the garrison, I was to give the signal of fire which would warn the waiting soldiers and save the town from immediate disaster. Alone I mounted the tower, for every man of stout body was needed in the passes below. My brain was sore dazed with excitement and fatigue, for I had not slept in many days, yet my purpose was firm, for I loved my native land of Lomar and the marble city of Olathaway that lies betwixt the peaks of Notan and Kadiphonek. But as I stood in the tower's topmost chamber, I beheld the horned waning moon, red and sinister, quivering through the vapors that hovered over the distant valley of Banach, and through an opening in the roof glittered the pale pole star, fluttering as if alive, and leering like a fiend and tempter. Methought its spirit whispered evil counsel, soothing me to traitorous somnolence with a damnable rhythmical promise which it repeated over and over. Slumber, watcher, till the spheres six and twenty thousand years have revolved, and I return to the spot where now I burn. Other stars anon shall rise to the axis of the skies, stars that soothe and stars that bless with a sweet forgetfulness. Only when my round is o'er shall the past disturb thy door. Vainly did I struggle with my drowsiness, seeking to connect these strange words with some lore of the skies which I had learned from the narcotic manuscripts. My head, heavy and reeling, drooped to my breast, and when next I looked up, it was in a dream, with a pole star grinning at me through a window from over the horrible swaying trees of a dream swamp. And I am still dreaming. In my shame and despair, I sometimes scream frantically, begging the dream creatures around me to waken me ere the Anutos steal up the pass behind the peak Notan and take the citadel by surprise. But these creatures are demons, for they laugh at me and tell me I am not dreaming. They mock me whilst I sleep, and whilst the squat yellow foe may be creeping silently upon us. I have failed in my duty and betrayed the marble city of Alathaway. I have proven false to Alos, my friend and commander. But still these shadows of my dream deride me. They say there is no land of Lomar, save in my nocturnal imaginings. That in those realms where the pole star shines high and red Aldebaran crawls low around the horizon, there has been naught save ice and snow for thousands of years, and never a man save squat yellow creatures blighted by the cold whom they call Eskimal. And as I writhe in my guilty agony, frantic to save the city whose peril every moment grows, and vainly striving to shake off this unnatural dream of a house of stone and brick south of a sinister swamp and on a cemetery on a low hillock. The pole star, even and monstrous, leers down from the black vault, winking hideously like an insane watching eye which strives to convey some strange message. Yet recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey. This is the end of Polaris by H. P. Lovecraft. Recording by Cameron Halkett. A Reminiscence of Dr. Samuel Johnson by H. P. Lovecraft. The privilege of reminiscence however rambling or tiresome, is one generally allowed to the very aged. Indeed, tis frequently by means of such recollections that the obscure occurrences of history and the lesser anecdotes of the great are transmitted to posterity. Though many of my readers have at times observed and remarked a sort of antique flow in my style of writing, it hath pleased me to pass amongst the members of this generation as a young man, giving out the fiction that I was born in 1890 in America. I am now, however, resolved to unburden myself of a secret which I have hitherto kept through dread of incredulity, and to impart to the public a true knowledge of my long years, in order to gratify their taste for authentic information of an age with whose famous personages I was on familiar terms. Be it then known that I was born on the family estate in Devonshire of the 10th day of August, 1690, 
or in the new Gregorian style of reckoning, the 20th of August, being therefore now in my 228th year. Coming early to London, I saw as a child many of the celebrated men of King William's reign, including the lamented Mr. Dryden, who sat much at the tables of Will's Coffee House. With Mr. Addison and Dr. Swift, I later became very well acquainted and was an even more familiar friend to Mr. Pope, whom I knew and respected till the day of his death. But since it is of my more recent associate, the late Dr. Johnson, that I am at this time desired to write, I will pass over my youth for the present. I had first knowledge of the doctor in May of the year 1738, though I did not at that time meet him. Mr. Pope had just completed his epilogue to his satires, the piece beginning not twice a twelve-month you appear in print, and had arranged for its publication. On the very day it appeared, there was also published a satire in Imitation of Juvenal, entitled London by the then unknown Johnson, and this so struck the town that many gentlemen of taste declared it was the work of a greater poet than Mr. Pope. Notwithstanding what some detractors have said of Mr. Pope's petty jealousy, he gave the verses of his new rival no small praise, and having learnt through Mr. Richardson who the poet was, told me that Mr. Johnson would soon be deterred. I had no personal acquaintance with the doctor till 1763, when I was presented to him at the Mitre Tavern by Mr. James Boswell, a young Scotchman of excellent family and great learning, but small wit, whose metrical effusions I had sometimes revised. Dr. Johnson, as I beheld him, was a full Percy man, very ill-dressed and of slovenly aspect. I recall him to have worn a bushy bob wig, untied and without powder, and much too small for his head. His clothes were of rusty brown, much wrinkled, and with more than one button missing. His face, too full to be handsome, was likewise marred by the effects of some scrofulous disorder, and his head was continually rolling about in a sort of convulsive way. Of this infirmity, indeed, I had known before, having heard of it from Mr. Pope, who took the trouble to make particular inquiries. Being nearly seventy-three, full nineteen years older than Dr. Johnson, I say doctor, though his degree came not till two years afterward, I naturally expected him to have some regard for my age, and was therefore not in that fear of him which others confessed. On my asking him what he thought of my favorable notice of his dictionary in the Londoner, my periodical paper, he said, Sir, I possess no recollection of having perused your paper, and have not a great interest in the opinions of the less thoughtful part of mankind. Being more than a little piqued at the incivility of one whose celebrity made me solicitous of his approbation, I ventured to retaliate in kind, and told him I was surprised that a man of sense should judge the thoughtfulness of one whose productions he admitted never having read. Why, sir, replied Johnson, I do not require to become familiar with a man's writings in order to estimate the superficiality of his attainments, when he plainly skews it by his eagerness to mention his own productions in the first question he puts to me. Having thus become friends, we conversed on many matters. When to agree with him, I said I was distrustful of the authenticity of Ocean's poems, Mr. Johnson said, That, sir, does not do your understanding particular credit. For what all the town is sensible of is no great discovery for a Grub Street critic to make. You might as well say you have a strong suspicion that Milton wrote Paradise Lost. I thereafter saw Johnson very frequently, most often at meetings of the Literary Club, which was founded the next year by the doctor, together with Mr. Burke, the parliamentary orator, Mr. Beauclerk, a gentleman of fashion, Mr. Langton, a pious man and captain of militia, Sir J. Reynolds, the widely known painter, Dr. Goldsmith, the prose and poetic writer, Dr. Nugent, father-in-law to Mr. Burke, Sir John Hawkins, Mr. Anthony Charmier, and myself. We assembled generally at seven o'clock of an evening, once a week, at the Turk's Head in Gerard Street, Soho, till that tavern was sold and made into a private dwelling. After which event, we moved our gatherings successively to Prince's in Sackville Street, Letelier's in Dover Street, and Parslow's and the Thatched House in St. James's Street. In these meetings, we preserved a remarkable degree of amity and tranquility, which contrasts very favorably with some of the dissensions and disruptions I observe in the literary and amateur press associations of today. This tranquility was the more remarkable because we had amongst us gentlemen of very opposed opinions. Dr. Johnson and I, as well as many others, were high Tories, whilst Mr. Burke was a Whig and against the American War, many of his speeches on that subject having been widely published. The least congenial member was one of the founders, Sir John Hawkins, who hath since written many misrepresentations of our society. Sir John, an eccentric fellow, once declined to pay his part of the reckoning for supper because twas his custom at home to eat no supper. Later, he insulted Mr. Burke in so intolerable a manner that we all took pains to show our disapproval. 
after which incident he came no more to our meetings. However, he never openly fell out with the doctor and was the executor of his will, though Mr. Boswell and others have reason to question the genuineness of his attachment. Other and later members of the club were Mr. David Garrick, the actor and early friend of Dr. Johnson, Messrs. Thomas and Joseph Wharton, Dr. Adam Smith, Dr. Percy, author of The Reliquist, Mr. Edward Gibbon, the historian, Dr. Burney, the musician, Mr. Malone, the critic, and Mr. Boswell. Mr. Garrick obtained admittance only with difficulty, for the doctor, notwithstanding his great friendship, was forever affecting to decry the stage and all things connected with it. Johnson, indeed, had a most singular habit of speaking for Davy when others were against him, and of arguing against him when others were for him. I have no doubt that he sincerely loved Mr. Garrick, for he never alluded to him as he did to Foote, who was a very coarse fellow despite his comic genius. Mr. Gibbon was none too well liked, for he had an odious, sneering way which offended even those of us who most admired his historical productions. Mr. Goldsmith, a little man, very vain of his dress and very deficient in brilliancy of conversation, was my particular favorite, since I was equally unable to shine in the discourse. He was vastly jealous of Dr. Johnson, though nonetheless liking and respecting him. I remember that once a foreigner, a German, I think, was in our company, and that whilst Goldsmith was speaking, he observed the doctor preparing to utter something. Unconsciously looking upon Goldsmith as a mere encumbrance when compared to the greater man, the foreigner bluntly interrupted him and incurred his lasting hostility by crying, Hush! Dr. Johnson is going to speak! In this luminous company, I was tolerated more because of my years than for my wit or learning, being no match at all for the rest. My friendship for the celebrated Monsieur Voltaire was ever a cause of annoyance to the doctor, who was deeply orthodox and who used to say of the French philosopher, Vir est acarimi ingenii et pocaram literarum. Mr. Boswell, a little teasing fellow whom I'd known for some time previously, used to make sport of my awkward manners and old-fashioned wig and clothes. Once coming in a little the worse for wine, to which he was addicted, he endeavored to lampoon me by means of an impromptu in verse writ on the surface of the table. But lacking the aid he usually had in his composition, he made a bad grammatical blunder. I told him he should not try to poskina the source of his poesy. At another time, Bozzy, as we used to call him, complained of my harshness toward new writers in the articles I prepared for the monthly review. He said I pushed every aspirant off the slopes of Parnassus. Sir, I replied, you are mistaken. They who lose their hold do so from their own want of strength. But desiring to conceal their weakness, they attribute the absence of success to the first critic that mentions them. I am glad to recall that Dr. Johnson upheld me in this matter. Dr. Johnson was second to no man in the pains he took to revise the bad verses of others. Indeed, tis said that in the book of poor blind old Mrs. Williams, there are scarce two lines which are not the doctor's. At one time, Johnson recited to me some lines by a servant to the Duke of Leeds, which had so amused him that he had got them by heart. They are on the Duke's wedding, and so much resemble in quality the work of other and more recent poetic dunces that I cannot forbear copying them. When the Duke of Leeds shall marry it be to a fine young lady of high quality, how happy will that gentlewoman be in his grace of Leeds' good company? I asked the doctor if he had ever tried making sense of this piece, and upon his saying he had not, I amused myself with the following amendment of it. When gallant leads auspiciously shall wed, the virtuous fair of ancient lineage bred, how must the maid rejoice with conscious pride to win so great an husband to her side? On showing this to Dr. Johnson, he said, Sir, you have straightened out the feet, but you have put neither wit nor poetry into the lines. It would afford me gratification to tell more of my experiences with Dr. Johnson and his circle of wits, but I am an old man and easily fatigued. I seem to ramble along without much logic or continuity when I endeavor to recall the past, and I fear I light upon but few incidents which others have not before discussed. Should my present recollections meet with favor, I might later set down some further anecdotes of old times of which I am the only survivor. I recall many things of Sam Johnson and his club, having kept up my membership in the latter long after the doctor's death, at which I sincerely mourned. I remember how John Burgoyne, Esquire, the general, whose dramatic and poetical works were printed after his death, was blackballed by three votes, probably because of his unfortunate defeat in the American War at Saratoga. Poor John. His son fared better, I think, and was made a baronet. But I am very tired. I am old, very old, and it's time for my afternoon nap. End of A Reminiscence of Dr. Samuel Johnson 
recorded by Cameron Halton. Recording by Joseph Kim. The Statement of Randolph Carter by H.P. Lovecraft. Again I say, I do not know what has become of Harley Warren, though I think, almost hope, that he is in peaceful oblivion, if there be anywhere so blessed a thing. It is true that I have for five years been his closest friend, and a partial sharer of his terrible researches into the unknown. I will not deny, though my memory is uncertain and indistinct, that this witness of yours may have seen us together, as he says, on the Gainesville Pike, walking toward Big Cypress Swamp half past eleven on that awful night. That we bore electric lanterns, spades, and a curious coil of wire with attached instruments I will even affirm, for these things all played a part in the single hideous scene which remains buried in my shaken recollection. But of what followed, and of the reason I was found alone and dazed on the edge of the swamp the next morning, I must insist that I know nothing save what I was told over and over again. You say to me that there is nothing in the swamp or near if which I could form the setting of that awful episode. I reply that I knew nothing beyond what I saw. Vision or nightmare it may have been. Vision or nightmare I fervently hope it was. Yet it is all that my mind retains of what took place in those shocking hours after we left the sight of men. And why Harley Warren did not return he or his shade, or some nameless thing I cannot describe, alone can tell. As I have said before, the weird studies of Harley Warren were well known to me and to some extent shared by me. Of his vast collection of strange, rare books on forbidden subjects, I have read all that are written in the languages of which I am master. But these are few as compared with those languages I can understand. Most, I believe, are in Arabic, and the fiend-inspired book which brought on the end, the book which he carried in his pocket out of this world, was written in characters whose like I never saw elsewhere. Warren would never tell me just what was in the book. As to the natures of our studies, must I say again that I no longer retain full comprehension? It seems to me rather merciful that I do not, for they were terrible studies which I pursued more through reluctant fascination than through actual inclination. Warren always dominated me, and sometimes I feared him. I remember how I shuddered at his facial expressions on the night before the awful happenings, when he talked so incessantly of his theory, why certain corpses never decay but rest firm and fat in their tomb for a thousand years. But I do not fear him now, for I suspect that he has known horrors beyond my ken. Now I fear for him. Once more I say that I have no clear idea of our object on that night. Certainly it had much to do with something in the book which Warren carried with him, that ancient book in undecipherable characters which had come to him from India a month before. But I swear I do not know what it was we expected to find. Your witness says he saw us at half past eleven on the Gainesville Pike, headed for Big Cypress Swamp. This is probably true, but I have no distinct memory of it. The picture seared into my soul is one scene only, and the hour must have been long after midnight, for a waning crescent moon was high in the vaporous heavens. The place was an ancient cemetery, so ancient that I trembled at the manifold signs of immemorial years. It was in a deep, damp hollow overgrown with rank grass, moss, and curious creeping weeds, and filled with a vague stench which my idle fancy associated absurdly with rotting stone. On every hand were the signs of neglect and decrepitude, and I seemed haunted by the notion that Warren and I were the first living creatures to invade a lethal silence of centuries. Over the valley's rim, a waning crescent moon peered through the noisome vapors that seemed to emanate from unheard-of catacombs and by its feeble, wavering beams I could distinguish a repellent array of antique slabs, urns, cenotaphs, and mausoleum facades, all crumbling, moss-grown, and moisture-stained, and partly concealed by the gross luxuriance of the unhealthy vegetation. My first vivid impression of my own presence in this terrible necropolis concerns the act of pausing with Warren before a certain half-obliterated sepulchre, and of throwing down some burdens which we seem to have been carrying. I now observed that I had with me an electric lantern and two spades, whilst my companion was supplied with a similar lantern and a portable telephone outfit. No word was uttered, for the spot and the task seemed known to us, and without delay we seized our spades and commenced to clear away the grass, weeds, and drifted earth from the flat, archaic mortuary. 
After uncovering the entire scene, which consisted of three immense granite slabs, we stepped back some distance to survey the carnal scene, and Warren appeared to make some mental calculations. Then he returned to the sepulchre, and using his spade as a lever, sought to pry up the slab ne lying nearest to the stony ruin, which may have been a monument in its day. He did not succeed in motion to me to come to his assistance. Finally, our combined strength loosened the stone, which we raised and tipped to one side. The removal of the slab revealed a black aperture, from which rushed an affluence of miasmal gases so nauseous that we started back in horror. After an interval, however, we approached the pit again, and found the exhalations less unbearable. Our lanterns disclosed a top of a flight of stone steps, dripping with some detestable ichor of the inner earth, and bordered by moist walls encrusted with nitre. And now, for the first time, my memory records verbal discourse, Warren addressing me at length in his mellow, tenor voice, a voice singularly unperturbed by our awesome surroundings. I'm sorry to have to ask you to stay on the surface, he said, but it'd be a crime to let anyone with your frail nerves go down there. You can't imagine, even from what you've read and what I've told you, the things I shall have to see and do. It's fiendish work, Carter. And I doubt if any man with ironclad sensibilities could ever see it through and come up alive and sane. I don't wish to offend you, and heaven knows I'd be glad enough to have you with me, but the responsibility is in a certain sense mine, and I couldn't drag a bundle of nerves like you down to probable death or madness. I tell you, you can't imagine what the thing is really like, but I promise to keep you informed over the telephone of every move. You see, I have enough wire here to reach the center of the earth and back. I can still hear in memory those coolly spoken words, and I can still remember my remonstrances. I seem desperately anxious to accompany my friend into those sepulchral depths, yet he proved inflexibly obdurate. At one time he threatened to abandon the expedition if I remained insistent, a threat which proved effective, since he alone held the key to the thing. All this I can remember, though I no longer know what manner of thing we sought. After he had obtained my reluctant acquiescence in his design, Warren picked up the reel of wire and adjusted the instruments. At his nod, I took one of the latter and seated myself upon an aged, discolored gravestone, close by the newly uncovered aperture. Then he shook my hand, shouldered the coil of wire, and disappeared within that indescribable ossuary. For a minute, I kept the sight of the glow of his lantern and heard the rustle of the wire as he laid it down after him. But the glow soon disappeared abruptly, as if a turn in the stone staircase had been encountered the sound died away almost as quickly. I was alone, yet bound to the unknown depths by those magic strands whose insulated surface lay green beneath the struggling beams of that waning crescent moon. I constantly consulted my watch by the light of my electric lantern and listened with feverish anxiety at the receiver of the telephone, but for more than a quarter of an hour heard nothing, and a faint clicking came from the instrument, and I called down to my friend with a tense voice. Apprehensive as I was, I was nevertheless unprepared for the words which came up from the uncanny vault in accents more alarmed and quivering than any I had heard before from Harley Warren. He, who was so calmly left me a little while previously, now called from below in a shaky whisper, more portentous than the loudest shriek. God, if you could see what I am seeing! I could not answer. Speechless, I could only wait. Then came the frenzied tones again. Carter, it's terrible, monstrous, unbelievable! This time my voice did not even fail me, and I poured into the transmitter a flood of excited questions. Terrified, I continued to repeat, Warren, what is it? What is it? Once more came the voice of my friend, still hoarse with fear and now apparently tinged with despair. I can't tell you, Carter. It's too utterly beyond thought. I dare not tell you. No man could know it and live. Great God, I never dreamed of this. Stillness again, save for my now incoherent torrent of shuddering inquiry in the voice of Warren in a pitch of wilder consternation. Carter, for the love of God, put back the slab and get out of this if you can. Quick, leave everything else and make for the outside. It's your only chance. Do as I say and don't ask me to explain. I heard. I was able only to repeat my frantic questions. Around me were the tombs and the darkness and the shadows. Below me, some peril beyond the radius of the human imagination. But my friend was in greater danger than I. And through my fear, I felt a vague resentment that he should deem me capable of deserting him under such circumstances. More clicking, and after a pause of piteous cries from Warren, Beat it! For God's sakes, put back the slab and beat it, Carter! 
Something in the boyish slang of my evidently stricken companion unleashed my faculties. I formed and shouted a resolution. Warn! Brace yourself, I'm coming down! But at this offer, the tone of my auditor changed to a scream of utter despair. Don't! You can't understand. It's too late in my own fault. Put back the slab and run. There's nothing else you or anyone can do now. The tone changed again, this time acquiring a softer quality, as of hopeless resignation, yet it remained tense through anxiety for me. Quick, before it's too late. I tried not to heed him, tried to break through the paralysis which held me, and to fulfill my vow to rush down to his aid, but his next whisper found me, still held inert in a chain of stark horror. Carter, hurry! It's no use. You must go. Better one than two. The slab. A pause, more clicking, and the faint voice of Warren. It's nearly over now. Don't make it harder. Cover up those tan steps and run for your life. You're losing time so long, Carter. I won't see you again. Here, Warren's whisper swelled into a cry. A cry that gradually rose to a shriek fraught with all the horrors of the ages. Curse these hellish things, legions, my god! Beat it! Beat it! Beat it! After that was silence. I know not how many interminable eons I sat stupefied, whispering, muttering, calling, screaming into that telephone. Over and over again through those eons I whispered and muttered, called, shouted, and screamed, Warren! Warren, answer me! Are you there? And then there came to me the crowning horror of all, the unbelievable, unthinkable, almost unmentionable thing I have said that eons seemed to elapse after Warren shrieked forth his last despairing warning and that only my own cries now broke the hideous silence. But after a while, there was a further clicking in the receiver, and I strained my ears to listen. Again I called down, Warren, are you there? And in answer heard the thing which had brought this cloud over my mind. I do not try, to, gentlemen, to account for that thing, that voice, nor can I venture to describe it in detail, since the first words took away my consciousness and created a mental blank which reaches to the time of my awakening in the hospital. Shall I say that the voice was deep, hollow, gelatinous, remote, unearthly, inhuman, disembodied? What shall I say? It was the end of my experience, and is the end of my story. I heard it, and knew no more. Heard it as I sat petrified in an unknown cemetery in the hollow, amidst the crumbling stones and the falling tombs, the rank vegetation and the miasmal vapors. Heard it well up from the innermost steps of that damnable open sepulchre as I watched amorphous, necrophagous shadows dance beneath an incursed waning moon. And this is what it said. You fool. Warren is dead. End of the Statement of Randolph Carter. Recording by Joseph Canna, Chicago, Illinois. Recording by Sarah Jennings The Street by H. P. Lovecraft There be those who say that things and places have souls, and there be those who say they have not. I dare not say myself, but I will tell of the street. Men of strength and honor fashioned that street, good valiant men of our blood who had come from the blessed isles across the sea. At first it was but a path trodden by bearers of water from the woodland spring to the cluster of houses by the beach. Then, as more men came to the growing cluster of houses, and looked about for places to dwell, they built cabins along the north side, cabins of stout oaken logs with masonry on the side toward the forest, for many Indians lurked there with fire arrows. And in a few years more, men built cabins on the south side of the street. Up and down the street walked grave men in conical hats, who most of the time carried muskets or fowling pieces, and there were also their bonneted wives and sober children. In the evening these men with their wives and children would sit about gigantic hearths and read and speak. Very simple were the things of which they read and spoke, yet things which gave them courage and goodness, and helped them by day to subdue the forests and till the fields and the children would listen and learn of the laws and deeds of old, 
and of that dear England which they had never seen or could not remember. There was war, and thereafter no more Indians troubled the street. The men, busy with labor, waxed prosperous and as happy as they knew how to be. And the children grew up comfortable, and more families came from the motherland to dwell on the street. And the children's children, and the newcomers' children, grew up. The town was now a city, and one by one the cabins gave place to houses. Simple, beautiful houses of brick and wood, with stone steps and iron railings and fan lights over the doors. No flimsy creations were these houses, for they were made to serve many a generation. Within, there were carven mantles and graceful stairs, and sensible, pleasing furniture, china and silver, brought from the motherland. So the street drank in the dreams of a young people, and rejoiced as its dwellers became more graceful and happy. Where once had been only strength and honor, taste and learning now abode as well. Books and painting and music came to the houses, and the young men went to the university which rose above the plain to the north. In the place of conical hats and small swords, of lace and snowy periwigs, there were cobblestones over which clattered many a blooded horse and rumbled many a gilded coach, and brick sidewalks with horse blocks and hitching posts. There were in that street many trees, elms and oaks and maples of dignity, so that in the summer the scene was all soft verdure and twittering bird song. And behind the houses were walled rose gardens with hedged paths and sundials, where at evening the moon and stars would shine bewitchingly, while fragrant blossoms glistened with dew. So the street dreamed on, past wars, calamities, and change. Once, most of the young men went away, and some never came back. That was when they furled the old flag and put up a new banner of stripes and stars. But though men talked of great changes, the street felt them not, for its folk were still the same, speaking of the old familiar things and the old familiar accounts. And the trees still sheltered singing birds, and at evening the moon and stars looked down upon dewy blossoms in the walled rose gardens. In time there were no more swords, three-cornered hats, or periwigs in the street. How strange seemed the inhabitants with their walking sticks, tall beavers, and cropped heads. New sounds came from the distance. First the strange puffings and shrieks from the river a mile away, and then many years later strange puffings and shrieks and rumblings from other directions. The air was not quite so pure as before, but the spirit of the place had not changed. The blood and soul of their ancestors had fashioned the street. Nor did the spirit change when they tore open the earth to lay down strange pipes, or when they set up tall posts bearing weird wires. There was so much ancient lore in that street that the past could not easily be forgotten. Then came the days of evil, when many who had known the street of old knew it no more, and many knew it who had not known it before, and went away, for their accents were coarse and strident, and their mien and faces unpleasing. Their thoughts, too, fought with the wise, just spirit of the street, so that the street pined silently as its houses fell into decay, and its trees died one by one, and its rose gardens grew rank with weeds and waste. But it felt a stir of pride one day when again marched forth young men, some of whom never came back. These young men were clad in blue. With the years, worse fortune came to the street. Its trees were all gone now, and its rose gardens were displaced by the backs of cheap, ugly new buildings on parallel streets. Yet the houses remained, despite the ravages of the years and the storms and worms, for they had been made to serve many a generation. New kinds of faces appeared in the street, swarthy, sinister faces with furtive eyes and odd features, whose owners spoke in unfamiliar words and placed signs in known and unknown characters upon most of the musty houses. Pushcarts crowded the gutters. A sordid, undefinable stench settled over the place, and the ancient spirit slept. Great excitement once came to the street. War and revolution were raging across the seas. A dynasty had collapsed, and its degenerate subjects were flocking with dubious intent to the western land. Many of these took lodgings in the battered houses that had once known the songs of birds and the scent of roses. 
then the Western land itself awoke, and joined the motherland in her titanic struggle for civilization. Over the cities once more floated the old flag, companioned by the new flag, and by a plainer yet glorious tricolor. But not many flags floated over the street, for therein brooded only fear and hatred and ignorance. Again young men went forth, but not quite as did the young men of those other days. Something was lacking, and the sons of those young men of other days, who did indeed go forth in olive drab with the true spirit of their ancestors, went from distant places, and knew not the street and its ancient spirit. Over the seas there was a great victory, and in triumph most of the young men returned. Those who had lacked something lacked it no longer. Yet did fear and hatred and ignorance still brood over the street, for many had stayed behind, and many strangers had come from distant places to the ancient houses, and the young men who had returned dwelt there no longer. Swarthy and sinister were most of the strangers, yet among them one might find a few faces like those who fashioned the street and molded its spirit. Like and yet unlike, for there was in the eyes of all a weird, unhealthy glitter as of greed, ambition, vindictiveness, or misguided zeal. Unrest and treason were abroad amongst an evil few who plotted to strike the western land its death blow, that they might mount to power over its ruins, even as assassins had mounted in that unhappy frozen land from whence most of them had come. And the heart of that plotting was in the street whose crumbling houses teemed with alien markers of discord, and echoed with the plans and speeches of those who yearned for the appointed day of blood, flame, and crime. Of the various odd assemblages in the street, the law said much but could prove little. With great diligence did men of hidden badges linger and listen about such places as Petrovich's bakery, the squalid Rifkin school of modern economics, the Circle Social Club, and the Liberty Café. There congregated sinister men in great numbers, yet always was their speech guarded or in a foreign tongue. And still the old houses stood, with their forgotten lore of nobler departed centuries, of sturdy colonial tenants, and dewy rose gardens in the moonlight. Sometimes a lone poet or traveler would come to view them, and would try to picture them in their vanished glory. Yet of such travelers and poets there were not many. The rumor now spread widely that these houses contained the leaders of a vast band of terrorists, who on a designated day were to launch an orgy of slaughter for the extermination of America, and of all the fine old traditions which the street had loved. Handbills and papers flooded about filthy gutters, handbills and papers printed in many tongues and in many characters, yet all bearing messages of crime and rebellion. In these writings the people were urged to tear down the laws and virtues that our fathers had exalted, to stamp out the soul of the old America, the soul that was bequeathed through a thousand and a half years of Anglo-Saxon freedom, justice, and moderation. It was said that the swart men who dwelt in the street, and congregated in its rotting edifices, were the brains of a hideous revolution, that at their word of command many millions of brainless, besotted beasts would stretch forth their noisome talons from the slums of thousand cities, burning, slaying, and destroying till the land of our fathers should be no more. All this was said and repeated, and many looked forward in dread to the fourth day of July, about which the strange writings hinted much. Yet could nothing be found to place the guilt. None could tell just whose arrest might cut off the damnable applauding at its source. Many times came bands of blue-coated police to search the shaky houses, though at last they ceased to come. For they too had grown tired of law and order, and had abandoned all the city to its fate. Then men in all of drab came, bearing muskets, till it seemed as if in its sad sleep the street must have had some haunting dreams of those other days when musket-bearing men in conical hats walked along it from the woodland spring to the cluster of houses by the beach. Yet could no act be performed to check the impending cataclysm, for the swart, sinister men were old and cunning. So the street slept uneasily on, till one night there gathered in Petrovich's bakery, and the Rifkin School of Modern Economics, and the Circle Social Club, and Liberty Café, and in other places as well, 
vast hordes of men whose eyes were big with horrible triumph and expectation. Over hidden wires, strange messages traveled, and much was said of still stranger messages yet to travel. But most of this was not guessed till afterward, when the western land was safe from the peril. The men in all of Drab could not tell what was happening, or what they ought to do, for the swart sinister men were skilled in subtlety and concealment. And yet the men in all of Drab will always remember that night, and will speak of the street as they tell it to their grandchildren, for many of them were sent there toward morning on a mission unlike that which they had expected. It was known that this nest of anarchy was old, and that the houses were tottering from the ravages of the years and the storms and the worms. Yet was the happening of that summer night a surprise because of its very queer uniformity. It was indeed an exceedingly singular happening, though after all a simple one. For without warning, in one of the small hours beyond midnight, all the ravages of the years and the storms and the worms came to a tremendous climax. And after the crash there was nothing left standing in the street save two ancient chimneys and part of a stout brick wall. Nor did anything that had been alive come alive from the ruins. A poet and traveler, who came with the mighty crowd that sought the scene, tell odd stories. The poet says that all through the hours before dawn, he beheld sordid ruins indistinctly in the glare of the arc lights, that there loomed above the wreckage another picture, wherein he could describe moonlight and fair houses, and elms and oaks and maples of dignity. And the traveler declares that instead of the place's wanted stench, there lingered a delicate fragrance as of roses in full bloom. But are not the dreams of poets and the tales of travelers notoriously false? There be those who say that things and places have souls, and there be those who say they have not. I dare not say myself, but I have told you of the street. End of The Street Recording by Keith Worrell. The Terrible Old Man by H.P. Lovecraft. It was the design of Angelo Rigi and Joe Chesnek and Manuel Silva to call on the Terrible Old Man. This old man dwells all alone in the very ancient house on Walter Street near the sea and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly evil, which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of misers. Chanek and Silva, that profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man would generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ricky and his colleagues despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day. So old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few knew his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones oddly grouped and painted so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard, or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal up to the house to peer through the dusty panes. These folks say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles in each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string, and they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to the bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if an answer. 
Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ricci and Joe Chanek and Manuel Silva were not of the Kingsport blood. They were of that new and heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions. And they saw the terrible old man merely tottering, almost helpless, gray beard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane, and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow, whom everybody shunned and at whom all the dog barked singularly. But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in the profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank, and who pays for his few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Ricky, Chanek, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ricky and Mr. Silva were to interview the old gentleman, whilst Mr. Chanek waited for them and their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street. By the gate in the tall rear wall of their host grounds, desire to avoid needless explanations in the case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unostentatious departure. As prearranged, these three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterward. Mesner, Ricky, and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones of budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old man loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for H.C. captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Messrs. Ricky and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling person voluble, and the screams of a weak and exceptionally venerable man can be easily muffled. So they moved up to the one lighted window and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Chanek as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously, he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivory-clad stone wall. Frequently, he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden, and had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Chanak did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow, heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street lamp, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected, for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Chanak had never before noticed the color of the man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in our little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer about the three unidentical bodies, horribly slashed as with many cutlasses, and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot heels, which the tide washed in, and some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street, or certain especially inhuman cries, probably of a stray animal or migratory bird, heard in the night by the wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. End of The Terrible Old Man by H.P. Lovecraft Recording by Keith Worrell Please visit my website at www.nakedpenguins.org Recording by James Pontolillo. The Tomb by H. P. Lovecraft. Sedibus ut saltum placidis in morte quiescam, and in a peaceful grave my corpse repose. Virgil. 
In relating the circumstances which have led to my confinement within this refuge for the demented, I am aware that my present position will create a natural doubt of the authenticity of my narrative. It is an unfortunate fact that the bulk of humanity is too limited in its mental vision to weigh with patience and intelligence those isolated phenomena, seen and felt only by a psychologically sensitive few, which lie outside its common experience. Men of broader intellect know that there is no sharp distinction betwixt the real and the unreal, that all things appear as they do only by virtue of the delicate individual physical and mental media through which we are made conscious of them. But the prosaic materialism of the majority condemns as madness the flashes of supersight which penetrate the common veil of obvious empiricism. My name is Jervis Dudley, and from earliest childhood I have been a dreamer and a visionary. Wealthy beyond the necessity of a commercial life, and temperamentally unfitted for the formal studies and social recreations of my acquaintances, I have dwelt ever in realms apart from the visible world, spending my youth and adolescence in ancient and little-known books and in roaming the fields and groves of the region near my ancestral home. I do not think that what I read in those books or saw in those fields and groves is exactly what other boys read and saw there, but of this I must say little, since detailed speech would but confirm those cruel slanders upon my intellect which I sometimes overhear from the whispers of the stealthy attendants around me. It is sufficient for me to relate events without analyzing causes. I have said that I dwelt apart from the visible world, but I have not said that I dwelt alone. This no human creature may do, for lacking the fellowship of the living, he inevitably draws upon the companionship of things that are not or are no longer living. Close by my home there lies a singular wooded hollow in whose twilight deeps I spent much of my time, reading, thinking, and dreaming. Down its moss-covered slopes my first steps of infancy were taken, and around its grotesquely gnarled oak trees my first fancies of boyhood were woven. Well did I come to know the presiding dryads of those trees, and often have I watched their wild dances in the struggling beams of waning moon, but of these things I must not now speak. I will tell only of the lone tomb in the darkest of the hillside thickets, the deserted tomb of the hides, an old and exalted family whose last direct descendant had been laid within its black recesses many decades before my birth. The vault to which I refer is an ancient granite, weathered and discolored by the mists and dampness of generations. Excavated back into the hillside, the structure is visible only at the entrance. The door, a ponderous and forbidding slab of stone, hangs upon rusted iron hinges and is fastened ajar in a queerly sinister way by means of heavy iron chains and padlocks, according to a gruesome fashion of half a century ago. The abode of the race whose scions are inured had once crowned the declivity which holds the tomb, but had long since fallen victim to the flames which sprang up from a disastrous stroke of lightning. Of the midnight storm which destroyed this gloomy mansion, the older inhabitants of the region sometimes speak in hushed and uneasy voices, alluding to what they call divine wrath, in a manner that in later years vaguely increased the always strong fascination which I felt for the forest darkened sepulchre. One man only had perished in the fire. When the last of the hides was buried in this place of shade and stillness, the sad urnful of ashes had come from a distant land, to which the family had repaired when the mansion burned down. No one remains to lay flowers before the granite portal and few care to brave the depressing shadows which seem to linger strangely about the water-worn stones. I shall never forget the afternoon when I first stumbled upon the half-hidden house of the dead. It was in midsummer when the alchemy of nature transmutes the sylvan landscape to one vivid and almost homogeneous mass of green, when the senses are well-nigh intoxicated with the surging seas of moist verdure and the subtly indefinable odors of the soil and the vegetation. In such surroundings, the mind loses its perspective. Time and space become trivial and unreal, and echoes of a forgotten prehistoric past beat insistently upon the enthralled consciousness. All day I had been wandering through the mystic groves of the hollow, thinking thoughts I need not discuss and conversing with things I need not name. 
In years a child of ten, I had seen and heard many wonders unknown to the throng, and was oddly aged in certain respects. When, upon forcing my way between two savage clumps of briars, I suddenly encountered the entrance of the vault, I had no knowledge of what I had discovered. The dark blocks of granite, the door so curiously ajar, and the funereal carvings above the arch aroused in me no associations of mournful or terrible character. Of graves and tombs I knew and imagined much, but had on account of my peculiar temperament been kept from all personal contact with churchyards and cemeteries. The strange stone house on the woodland slope was to me only a source of interest and speculation, and its cold, damp interior, into which I vainly peered through the aperture so tantalizingly left, contained for me no hint of death or decay. But in that instant of curiosity was born the madly unreasoning desire which has brought me to this hell of confinement. Spurred on by a voice which must have come from the hideous soul of the forest, I resolved to enter the beckoning gloom in spite of the ponderous chains which barred my passage. In the waning light of day I alternately rattled the rusty impediments with a view to throwing wide the stone door, and essayed to squeeze my slight form through the space already provided but neither plan met with success. At first curious, I was not frantic, and when in the thickening twilight I returned to my home, I had sworn to the hundred gods of the grove that at any cost I would someday force an entrance to the black chilly depths that seemed calling out to me. The physician with the iron gray beard who comes each day to my room once told a visitor that this decision marked the beginnings of a pitiful monomania. But I will leave final judgment to my readers when they shall have learnt all. The months following my discovery were spent in futile attempts to force the complicated padlock of the slightly opened vault, and in carefully guarded inquiries regarding the nature and history of the structure. With the traditionally receptive ears of the small boy, I learned much, though an habitual secretiveness caused me to tell no one of my information or my resolve. It is perhaps worth mentioning that I was not at all surprised or terrified on learning of the nature of the vault. My rather original ideas regarding life and death had caused me to associate the cold clay with the breathing body in a vague fashion, and I felt that the great sinister family of the burned-down mansion was in some way represented within the stone space I sought to explore. Mumbled tales of the weird rites and godless revels of bygone years in the ancient hall gave to me a new and potent interest in the tomb, before whose door I would sit for hours at a time each day. Once I thrust a candle within the nearly closed entrance, but could see nothing save a flight of damp stone steps leading downward. The odor of the place repelled, yet bewitched me. I felt I had known it before, in a past remote beyond all recollection, beyond even my tenancy of the body I now possess. The year after I first beheld the tomb, I stumbled upon a worm-eaten translation of Plutarch's Lives in the book-filled attic of my home. Reading the life of Theseus, I was much impressed by that passage telling of the great stone beneath which the boyish hero was to find his tokens of destiny whenever he should become old enough to lift its enormous weight. This legend had the effect of dispelling my keenest impatience to enter the vault, for it made me feel that the time was not yet ripe. Later, I told myself, I should grow to a strength and ingenuity which might enable me to unfasten the heavily chained door with ease. But until then, I would do better by conforming to what seemed the will of fate. Accordingly, my watches by the dank portal became less persistent, and much of my time was spent in other, though equally strange, pursuits. I would sometimes rise very quietly in the night, stealing out to walk in those churchyards and places of burial from which I had been kept by my parents. What I did there I may not say, for I am not now sure of the reality of certain things. But I know that on the day after such a nocturnal ramble, I would often astonish those about me with my knowledge of topics almost forgotten for many centuries. It was after a night like this that I shocked the community with a queer conceit about the burial of the rich and celebrated Squire Brewster, a maker of local history who was interred in 1711, and whose slate headstone, bearing a graven skull and crossbones, was slowly crumbling to powder. In a moment of childish imagination, I vowed not only that the undertaker, Goodman Simpson, had stolen the silver buckled shoes, silken hose, and satin small clothes of the deceased before burial, 
but that the squire himself, not fully inanimate, had turned twice in his mound-covered coffin on the day of interment. But the idea of entering the tomb never left my thoughts. Being indeed stimulated by the unexpected genealogical discovery that my own maternal ancestry possessed at least a slight link with the supposedly extinct family of the Hydes. Last of my paternal race, I was likewise the last of this older and more mysterious line. I began to feel that the tomb was mine, and to look forward with hot eagerness to the time when I might pass within that stone door and down those slimy stone steps in the dark. I now formed the habit of listening very intently at the slightly open portal choosing my favorite hours of midnight stillness for the odd vigil. By the time I came of age, I had made a small clearing in the thicket before the mold-stained facade of the hillside, allowing the surrounding vegetation to encircle and overhang the space like the walls and roof of a sylvan bower. This bower was my temple, the fastened door my shrine, and here I would lie outstretched on the mossy ground, thinking strange thoughts and dreaming of strange dreams. The night of the first revelation was a sultry one. I must have fallen asleep from fatigue, for it was with a distinct sense of awakening that I heard the voices. Of those tones and accents I hesitate to speak. Of their quality I will not speak. But I may say that they presented certain uncanny differences in vocabulary, pronunciation, and mode of utterance. Every shade of New England dialect, from the uncouth syllables of the Puritan colonists, to the precise rhetoric of fifty years ago seemed represented in that shadowy colloquy, though it was only later that I noticed the fact. At the time, indeed, my attention was distracted from this matter by another phenomenon, a phenomenon so fleeting that I could not take oath upon its reality. I barely fancied that as I awoke a light had been hurriedly extinguished within the sunken sepulchre. I do not think I was either astounded or panic-stricken but I know that I was greatly and permanently changed that night. Upon returning home, I went with much directness to a rotting chest in the attic, wherein I found the key which next day unlocked with ease the barrier I had so long stormed in vain. It was in the soft glow of late afternoon that I first entered the vault on the abandoned slope. A spell was upon me, and my heart leapt with an exultation I can but ill describe. As I closed the door behind me and descended the dripping steps by the light of my lone candle, I seemed to know the way. And though the candle sputtered with the stifling reek of the place, I felt singularly at home in the musty charnel house air. Looking about me, I beheld many marble slabs bearing coffins, or the remains of coffins. Some of these were sealed and intact, but others had nearly vanished, leaving the silver handles and plates isolated amid certain curious heaps of whitish dust. Upon one plate I read the name of Sir Geoffrey Hyde, who had come from Sussex in 1640 and died here a few years later. In a conspicuous alcove was one fairly well-preserved and untenanted casket, adorned with a single name which brought to me both a smile and a shudder. An odd impulse caused me to climb upon the broad slab, extinguish my candle, and lie down within the vacant box. In the gray light of dawn, I staggered from the vault and locked the chain of the door behind me. I was no longer a young man, though but twenty-one winters had chilled my bodily frame. Early rising villagers who observed my homeward progress looked at me strangely and marveled at the signs of ribald revelry which they saw in one whose life was known to be sober and solitary. I did not appear before my parents till after a long and refreshing sleep. Henceforward, I haunted the tomb each night, seeing, hearing, and doing things I must never reveal. My speech, always susceptible to environmental influences, was the first thing to succumb to the change, and my suddenly acquired archaism of diction was soon remarked upon. Later, a queer boldness and recklessness came into my demeanor, till I unconsciously grew to possess the bearing of a man of the world despite my lifelong seclusion. My formerly silent tongue waxed voluble with the easy grace of a Chesterfield, or the godless cynicism of a Rochester. I displayed a peculiar erudition utterly unlike the fantastic monkish lore over which I had poured in youth, and covered the flyleaves of my books with facile impromptu epigrams which brought up suggestions of gay, prior, 
and the sprightliest of Augustine wits and rhymesters. One morning at breakfast I came close to disaster by declaiming, in palpably licorice accents, an effusion of 18th century Bacchanalian mirth, a bit of Georgian playfulness never recorded in a book, which ran something like this. Come hither, my lads, with your tankards of veil, and drink to the present beef, for it shall fail. Pile each on your platter a mountain of beef, for tis eating and drinking that brings us relief. So fill up your glass, so life will soon pass. When you're dead, you'll ne'er drink to your king or your lass. Anacreon had a red nose, so they say, but what's a red nose if you're happy and gay? Gad split me, I'd rather be red whilst I'm here, than white as a lily and dead half a year. So Betty, my miss, come give me a kiss, in hell there's no innkeeper's daughter like this. Young Harry propped up just as straight as he's able, will soon lose his wig and slip under the table. But fill up your goblets and pass them around, better under the table than under the ground. So revel and chaff as he thirstily quaff, under six feet of dirt tis less easy to laugh. The fiend strike me blue, I'm scarce able to walk, and damn me if I can stand upright or talk. Here landlord bid Betty to summon a chair, I'll try home for a while for my wife is not there. So lend me a hand, I'm not able to stand, but I'm gay whilst I linger on top of the land. About this time, I conceived my present fear of fire and thunderstorms. Previously indifferent to such things, I had now an unspeakable horror of them, and would retire to the innermost recesses of the house whenever the heavens threatened an electrical display. A favorite haunt of mine during the day was the ruined cellar of the mansion that had burned down, and in fancy I would picture the structure as it had been in its prime. On one occasion I startled a villager by leading him confidently to a shallow sub-cellar, of whose existence I seemed to know in spite of the fact that it had been unseen and forgotten for many generations. At last came that which I had long feared. My parents, alarmed at the altered manner and appearance of their only son, commenced to exert over my movements a kindly espionage, which threatened to result in disaster. I had told no one of my visits to the tomb, having guarded my secret purpose with religious zeal since childhood. But now I was forced to exercise a care in threading the mazes of the woodland hollow, that I might throw off a possible pursuer. My key to the vault I kept suspended from a cord about my neck, its presence known only to me. I never carried out of the sepulchre any of the things I came upon whilst within its walls. One morning, as I emerged from the damp tomb and fastened the chain of the portal with none too steady hand, I beheld in an adjacent thicket the dreaded face of a watcher. Surely the end was near, for my bower was discovered and the objective of my nocturnal journeys revealed. The man did not accost me, so I hastened home in an effort to overhear what he might report to my careworn father. Were my sojourns beyond the chain door about to be proclaimed to the world? Imagine my delighted astonishment on hearing the spy inform my parent in cautious whisper that I had spent the night in the bower outside the tomb. My sleep-filmed eyes fixed upon the crevice where the padlocked portal stood ajar. By what miracle had the Watcher been thus deluded? I was now convinced that a supernatural agency protected me. Made bold by this heaven-sent circumstance, I began to resume perfect openness in going to the vault, confident that no one could witness my entrance. For a week I tasted to the full the joys of that charnel conviviality which I must not describe, when the thing happened, and I was borne away to this accursed abode of sorrow and monotony. I should not have ventured out that night, for the taint of thunder was in the clouds, and hellish phosphorescence rose from the rank swamp at the bottom of the hollow. The call of the dead, too, was different. Instead of the hillside tomb, it was the charred cellar on the crest of the slope whose presiding daemon beckoned to me with unseen fingers. As I emerged from an intervening grove upon the plain before the ruin, I beheld in the misty moonlight a thing I had always vaguely expected. The mansion, gone for a century, once more reared its stately height to the raptured vision, every window ablaze with the splendor of many candles. Up the long drive rolled the coaches of the Boston gentry, whilst on foot came a numerous assemblage of powdered exquisites from the neighboring mansions. With this throng I mingled, 
though I knew I belonged with the hosts rather than the guests. Inside the hall were music, laughter, and wine on every hand. Several faces I recognized, though I should have known them better had they been shriveled or eaten away by death and decomposition. Amid a wild and reckless throng, I was the wildest and most abandoned. Gay blasphemy poured in torrents from my lips, and in my shocking sallies I heeded no law of God, man, or nature. Suddenly, a peal of thunder, resonant even above the din of the swinish revelry, claved the very roof and laid a hush of fear upon the boisterous company. Red tongues of flame and searing gusts of heat engulfed the house, and the roisterers, struck with terror at the descent of a calamity which seemed to transcend the bounds of unguided nature, fled shrieking into the night. I alone remained, riveted to my seat by a groveling fear which I had never felt before. And then a second horror took possession of my soul. Burnt alive to ashes, my body dispersed by the four winds, I might never lie in the tomb of the hides. Was not my coffin prepared for me? Had I not a right to rest till eternity among the descendants of Sir Geoffrey Hyde? Aye, I would claim my heritage of death, even though my soul goes seeking through the ages for another corporeal tenement to represent it on that vacant slab in the alcove of the vault. Jervis Hyde should never share the sad fate of Palinurus. As the phantom of the burning house faded, I found myself screaming and struggling madly in the arms of two men one of whom was the spy who had followed me to the tomb. Rain was pouring down in torrents, and upon the southern horizon were flashes of the lightning that had so lately passed over our heads. My father, his face lined with sorrow, stood by as I shouted my demands to be laid within the tomb, frequently admonishing my captors to treat me as gently as they could. A blackened circle on the floor of the ruined cellar told of a violent stroke from the heavens, and from this spot a group of curious villagers with lanterns were prying a small box of antique workmanship which the thunderbolt had brought to light. Ceasing my futile and now objectless writhing, I watched the spectators as they viewed the treasure trove and was permitted to share in their discoveries. The box, whose fastenings were broken by the stroke which had unearthed it, contained many papers and objects of value, but I had eyes for one thing alone. It was the porcelain miniature of a young man in a smartly curled bag wig and bore the initials J.H. The face was such that as I gazed, I might well have been studying my mirror. On the following day, I was brought to this room with the barred windows, but I had been kept informed of certain things through an aged and simple-minded servitor, for whom I bore a fondness in infancy and who, like me, loves the churchyard. What I have dared relate of my experiences within the vault has brought me only pitying smiles. My father, who visits me frequently, declares that at no time did I pass the chained portal, and swears that the rusted padlock had not been touched for fifty years when he examined it. He even says that all the village knew of my journeys to the tomb, and that I was often watched as I slept in the bower outside the grim façade, my half-open eyes fixed on the crevice that leads to the interior. Against these assertions, I have no tangible proof to offer, since my key to the padlock was lost in the struggle on that night of horrors. The strange things of the past which I learned during those nocturnal meetings with the dead he dismisses as the fruits of my lifelong and omnivorous browsing amongst the ancient volumes of the family library. Had it not been for my old servant Hiram, I should have by this time been quite convinced of my madness. But Hiram, loyal to the last, has held faith in me, and has done that which impels me to make public at least a part of my story. A week ago he burst open the lock which changed the door of the tomb perpetually ajar, and descended with a lantern into the murky depths. On a slab in an alcove he found an old but empty coffin whose tarnished plate bears the single word, Jervis. In that coffin, and in that vault, they have promised me I shall be buried. This is the end of The Tomb by H. P. Lovecraft. Editorial End Note The Latin quote at the beginning of this story was from Virgil's The Aeneid, Book 6, Line 371.
Recording by Michael Sample. The Tree by H.P. Lovecraft. On a verdant slope of Mount Manolith in Arcadia, there stands an olive grove about the ruins of a villa. Close by is a tomb, once beautiful with the sublimest sculptures, but now fallen into as great decay as the house. At one end of that tomb, its curious roots deplacing the time-stained blocks of panhelic marble, grows an unnaturally large olive tree of oddly repellent shape, so like to some grotesque man or death-distorted body of a man, that the country folk fear to pass it at night when the moon shines faintly through the crooked boughs. Mount Manolis is a chosen haunt of dreaded Pan, whose queer companions are many, and simple swains believe that the tree must have some hideous kinship to these weird penishi. But an old beekeeper who lives in the neighboring cottage told me a different story. Many years ago, when the hillside villa was new and resplendent, there dwelt within it the two sculptors Kalos and Musides. From Lydia to Neapolis, the beauty of their work was praised, and none dared say that one excelled the other in skill. The Hermes of Kalos stood in a marble shrine in Corinth, and the palace of Musides surmounted a pillar in Athens near the Parthenon. All men paid homage to Kalos and Musides, and marveled that no shadow of artistic jealousy cooled the warmth of their brotherly friendship. But though Kalos and Musides dwelt in unbroken harmony, their natures were not alike. While Musides reveled by night amidst the urban gaieties of Tegea, Kalos would remain at home, stealing away from the sight of his slaves into the cool recesses of the olive grove. There he would meditate upon the visions that filled his mind, and there devise the forms of beauty which later became immortal in breathing marble. Idle folk, indeed, said that Kalos conversed with the spirits of the grove, and that his statues were but images of the fauns and dryads he met there, for he patterned his work after no living model. So famous were Kalos and Musides that none wondered when the tyrant of Syracuse sent them deputies to speak of the costly statue of Tyche, which he had planned for his city. Of great size and cunning workmanship must the statue be, for it was to form a wonder of nations and a goal of travelers. Exalted beyond thought would be he whose work should gain acceptance, and for this honor Kalos and Musides were invited to compete. Their brotherly love was well known, and the crafty tyrant surmised that each, instead of concealing his work from the other, would offer aid and advice. This charity producing two images of unheard of beauty, the lovelier of which would eclipse even the dreams of poets. With joy the sculptors hailed the tyrant's offer, so that in the days that followed their slaves heard the ceaseless blows of chisels. Not from each other did Kalos and Musides conceal their work, but the sight was for them alone. Saving theirs, no eyes beheld the two divine figures released by skillful blows from the rough blocks that had imprisoned them since the world began. At night, as of yore, Musides sought the banquet halls of Tegea whilst Kalos wandered alone in the olive grove. But as time passed, men observed a want of gaiety in the once sparkling Musides. It was strange, they said amongst themselves, that depression should thus seize one with so great a chance to win art's loftiest rewards. Many months passed yet in the sour face of Musides came nothing of the sharp expectancy which the situation should arouse. Then one day Musides spoke of the illness of Kalos, after which none marveled again at his sadness, since the sculptor's attachment was known to be deep and sacred. Subsequently, many went to visit Kalos, and indeed noticed the pallor of his face, but there was about him a happy serenity, which made his glance more magical than the glance of Musides, who was clearly distracted with anxiety, and who pushed aside all the slaves in his eagerness to feed and wait upon his friend with his own hands. Hidden behind heavy curtains stood the two unfinished figures of Tyche, little touched of late by the sick man and his faithful attendant. 
As Kalos grew inexplicably weaker and weaker despite the ministrations of puzzled physicians and of his assiduous friend, he desired to be carried often to the grove which he so loved. There he would ask to be left alone, as if wishing to speak with unseen things. Musides ever granted his requests, though his eyes filled with visible tears at the thought that Kalos should care more for the fauns and the dryads than for him. At last the end drew near, and Kalos discoursed of things beyond this life. Musides, weeping, promised him a sepulchre more lovely than the tomb of Mausolus, but Kalos bade him speak no more of marble glories. Only one wish now haunted the mind of the dying man, that twigs from certain olive trees in the grove be buried by his resting place, close to his head. And one night, sitting alone in the darkness of the olive grove, Kalos died. Beautiful beyond words was the marble sepulchre which stricken Musides carved for his beloved friend. None but Kalos himself could have fashioned such bas-reliefs, wherein were displayed all the splendors of Elysium. Nor did Musides fail to bury close to Kalos' head the olive twigs from the grove. As the first violence of Musides' grief gave place to resignation, he labored with diligence upon his figure of Tyche. All honor was now his, since the tyrant of Syracuse would have the work of none save him or Kalos. His task proved a vent for his emotion, and he toiled more steadily each day, shunning the gaieties he had once relished. Meanwhile, his evenings were spent beside the tomb of his friend, where a young olive tree had sprung up near the sleeper's head. So swift was the growth of this tree, and so strange was its form, that all who beheld it exclaimed in surprise, and Musides seemed at once fascinated and repelled. Three years after the death of Kalos, Musides dispatched a messenger to the tyrant, and it was whispered in the Agora of Tegea that the mighty statue was finished. By this time, the tree by the tomb had attained amazing proportions, exceeding all other trees of its kind, and sending out a singularly heavy branch above the apartment in which Musides labored. As many visitors came to view the prodigious tree, as to admire the art of the sculptor, so that Musides was seldom alone. But he did not mind his multitude of guests. Indeed, he seemed to dread being alone now that his absorbing work was done. The bleak mountain wind, sighing through the olive grove and the tomb tree, had an uncanny way of forming vaguely articulate sounds. The sky was dark on the evening that the tyrant's emissaries came to Tegea. It was definitely known that they had come to bear away the great image of Tyche and bring eternal honor to Musides, so their reception by the Proxenoi was of great warmth. As the night wore on, a violent storm of wind broke over the crest of Maimilus, and the men from far Syracuse were glad that they rested snugly in the town. They talked of their illustrious tyrant, and of the splendor of his capital, and exulted in the glory of the statue which Musides had wrought for them. And then the men of Tegea spoke of the goodness of Musides, and of his heavy grief for his friend, and how not even the coming laurels of art could console him in the absence of Kalos, who might have worn those laurels instead. Of the tree which grew by the tomb, near the head of Kalos, they also spoke. The wind shrieked more horribly, and both the Syracusians and the Arcadians prayed to Ilos. In the sunshine of the morning, the Proxenoi led the tyrant's messengers up the slope to the abode of the sculptor, but the night wind had done strange things. Slaves' cries ascended from a scene of desolation, and no more amidst the olive grove rose the gleaming colonnades of the vast hall wherein Musides had dreamed and toiled. Lone and shaken mourned the humble courts in the lower walls, for upon the sumptuous greater peristyle had fallen squarely the heavy overhanging bough of the strange new tree, reducing the stately poem in marble with odd completeness to a mound of unsightly ruins. Strangers and Tegeans stood aghast, looking from the wreckage to the great sinister tree whose aspect was so weirdly human, and whose roots reached so queerly into the sculptured sepulchre of Kalos. And their fear and dismay increased when they searched the fallen apartment, 
For of the gentle Musides and of the marvelously fashioned image of Tyche, no trace could be discovered. Amidst such stupendous ruin only chaos dwelt, and the representatives of two cities left disappointed. Syracusians, that they had no statue home to bear, and Tegeans, that they had no artist to crown. However, the Syracusians obtained, after a while, a very splendid statue in Athens, and the Tegeans consoled themselves by erecting in the Agora a marble temple commemorating the gifts, virtues, and brotherly piety of Musides. But the olive grove still stands, as does the tree growing out of the tomb of Kalos, and the old beekeeper told me that sometimes the boughs whisper to one another in the night wind, saying over and over again, Oida, Oida, I know, I know. End of the tree. The White Ship by H.P. Lovecraft I am Basil Elton, keeper of the North Point Light that my father and grandfather kept before me. Far from the shore stands the grey lighthouse, above sunken slimy rocks that are seen when the tide is low, but unseen when the tide is high. Past that beacon for a century have swept the majestic barks of the seven seas. In the days of my grandfather there were many, in the days of my father not so many, and now there are so few that I sometimes feel strangely alone, as though I were the last man on our planet. From far shores came those white-sailed argosies of old, from far eastern shores where warm suns shine and sweet odors linger about strange gardens and gay temples. The old captains of the sea came often to my grandfather and told him of these things which in turn he told to my father, and my father told to me in the long autumn evenings when the wind howled eerily from the east. And I have read more of these things, and of many things besides, in the books men gave me when I was young, and filled with wonder. But more wonderful than the lore of old men and the lore of books is the secret lore of ocean. Blue, green, gray, white, or black, smooth, ruffled, or mountainous, that ocean is not silent. All my days have I watched it and listened to it, and I know it well. At first it told to me only the plain little tales of calm beaches and near ports, but with the years it grew more friendly and spoke of other things, of things more strange and more distant in time and space. Sometimes at twilight the gray vapors of the horizon have parted to grant me glimpses of the ways beyond, and sometimes at night the deep waters of the sea have grown clear and phosphorescent to grant me glimpses of the ways beneath. And these glimpses have been as often of the ways that were and the ways that might be as of the ways that are. For ocean is more ancient than the mountains and freighted with the memories and the dreams of time. Out of the south it was that the white ship used to come when the moon was full and high in the heavens. Out of the south it would glide very smoothly and silently over the sea. And whether the sea was rough or calm, and whether the wind was friendly or adverse, it would always glide smoothly and silently, its sails distant, and its long strange tiers of oars moving rhythmically. One night I espied upon the deck a man, bearded and robed, and he seemed to beckon me to embark for far unknown shores. Many times afterward I saw him under the full moon, and ever did he beckon me. Very brightly did the moon shine on the night I answered the call, and I walked out over the waters to the white ship on a bridge of moonbeams. The man who had beckoned now spoke a welcome to me in a soft language I seemed to know well, 
and the hours were filled with soft songs of the oarsmen as we glided away into a mysterious south, golden with the glow of that full, mellow moon. And when the day dawned, rosy and effulgent, I beheld the green shore of far lands, bright and beautiful, and to me unknown. Up from the sea rose lordly terraces of verdure, tree-studded, and showing here and there the gleaming white roofs and colonnades of strange temples. As we drew nearer the green shore, the bearded man told me of that land, the land of Tsar, where dwell all the dreams and thoughts of beauty that come to men once and then are forgotten. And when I looked upon the terraces again, I saw that what he said was true, for among the sights before me were many things I had once seen through the mists beyond the horizon and in the phosphorescent depths of ocean. There, too, were forms and fantasies more splendid than any I had ever known, the visions of young poets who died in want before the world could learn of what they had seen and dreamed. But we did not set foot upon the sloping meadows of Tsar, for it is told that he who treads them may never more return to his native shore. As the white ship sailed silently away from the templed terraces of Tsar, we beheld on the distant horizon ahead the spires of a mighty city, and the bearded man said to me, This is the Larian, the city of a thousand wonders, wherein reside all those mysteries that man has striven in vain to fathom. And I looked again, at closer range, and saw that the city was greater than any city I had known or dreamed of before. Into the sky the spires of its temples reached, so that no man might behold their peaks, and far back beyond the horizon stretched the grim gray walls, over which one might spy only a few roofs, weird and ominous, yet adorned with rich friezes and alluring sculptures. I yearned mightily to enter this fascinating yet repellent city, and besought the bearded man to land me at the stone pier by the huge carven gate, Akario. But he gently denied my wish, saying, Into Thalarian, the city of a thousand wonders, many have passed, but none returned. Therein walk only demons and mad things that are no longer men, and the streets are white with the unburied bones of those who have looked upon the idol of Lathi that reigns over the city. So the white ship sailed on past the walls of Thalarion, and followed for many days a southward flying bird whose glossy plumage matched the sky out of which it had appeared. Then came we to a pleasant coast, gay with blossoms of every hue, where as far inland as we could see vast lovely groves and radiant arbors beneath a meridian sun. From bowers beyond our view came bursts of song and snatches of lyric harmony, interspersed with faint laughter, so delicious that I urged the rowers onward in my eagerness to reach the scene. And the bearded man spoke no word, but watched me as we approached the lily-lined shore. Suddenly, a wind blowing from over the flowery meadows and leafy woods brought a scent at which I trembled. The wind grew stronger, and the air was filled with the lethal, charnel odor of plague-stricken towns and uncovered cemeteries. And as we sailed madly away from that damnable coast, the bearded man spoke at last, saying, This is Zura, the land of pleasures unattained. So once more the white ship followed the bird of heaven over warm, blessed seas fanned by caressing, aromatic breezes. Day after day and night after night did we sail, and when the moon was full we would listen to soft songs of the oarsmen, sweet as on that distant night when we sailed away from my far native land. And it was by moonlight that we anchored at last, in the harbor of Sonan Nil, which is guarded by twin headlands of crystal that rise from the sea and meet in a resplendent arch. This is the land of fancy, 
and we walked to the verdant shore upon a golden bridge of moonbeams. In the land of Sonanil, there is neither time nor space, neither suffering nor death, and there I dwelt for many eons. Green are the groves and pastures, bright and fragrant the flowers, blue and musical the streams, clear and cool the fountains, and stately and gorgeous the temples, castles, and cities of Sonanil. Of that land there is no bound, for beyond each vista of beauty rises another more beautiful. Over the countryside and amidst the splendor of cities can move at will the happy folk, of whom all are gifted with unmarred grace and unalloyed happiness. For the eons I dwelt there, I wandered blissfully through gardens where quaint pagodas peep from pleasing clumps of bushes, and where the white walks are bordered with delicate blossoms. I climbed gentle hills from whose summits I could see entrancing panoramas of loveliness, with steepled towns nestling in verdant valleys, and with the golden domes of gigantic cities glittering on the infinitely distant horizon. And I viewed by moonlight the sparkling sea, the crystal headlands, and the placid harbor wherein lay anchored the white ship. It was against the full moon one night in the immemorial year of Tharp that I saw outlined the beckoning form of the celestial bird and felt the first stirrings of unrest. Then I spoke with the bearded man and told him of my new yearnings to depart for remote Cathuria, which no man hath seen, but which all believe to lie beyond the basalt pillars of the west. It is the land of hope, and in it shine the perfect ideals of all that we know elsewhere, or at least so men relate. But the bearded man said to me, Beware of those perilous seas wherein men say Cathoria lies. In Sonanil there is no pain or death, but who can tell what lies beyond the basalt pillars of the west? Nevertheless, at the next full moon I boarded the white ship, and with the reluctant bearded man, left the happy harbor for untraveled seas. And the bird of heaven flew before, and led us toward the basalt pillars of the west. But this time, the oarsmen sang no soft songs under the full moon. In my mind, I would often picture the unknown land of Cathuria with its splendid groves and palaces, and would wonder what new delights there awaited me. Cathuria, I would say to myself, is the abode of gods and the land of unnumbered cities of gold. Its forests are of aloe and sandalwood, even as the fragrant groves of Camorin, and among the trees flutter gay birds sweet with song. On the green and flowery mountains of Cathuria stand temples of pink marble, rich with carven and painted glories, and having in their courtyards cool fountains of silver, where purr with ravishing music the scented waters that come from the grotto-born river Narg. And the cities of Cathuria are cinctured with golden walls, and their pavements also are of gold. In the gardens of these cities are strange orchids and perfumed lakes whose beds are of coral and amber. At night, the streets and the gardens are lit with gray lanterns, fashioned from the three-colored shell of the tortoise, and here resound the soft notes of the singer and the lutenist. And the houses of the cities of Cathuria are all palaces, each built over a fragrant canal bearing the waters of the sacred Narg. Of marble and porphyry are the houses, and roofed with glittering gold that reflects the rays of the sun and enhances the splendor of the cities as blissful gods view them from the distant peaks. Fairest of all is the palace of the great monarch Dori, whom some say to be a demigod and others a god. High is the palace of Dori, and many are the turrets of marble upon its walls. In its wide halls many multitudes assemble, and here hang the trophies of the ages. And the roof is of pure gold, set upon tall pillars of ruby and azure, and having such carven figures of gods and heroes that he who looks up to those heights 
seems to gaze upon the living Olympus, and the floor of the palace is of glass, under which flow the cunningly lighted waters of the Narg, gay with gaudy fish not known beyond the bounds of lovely Cathuria. Thus would I speak to myself of Cathuria, but ever would the bearded man warn me to turn back to the happy shore of Sonanil, for Sonanil is known of men, while none hath ever beheld Cathuria. And on the thirty-first day that we followed the bird we beheld the basalt pillars of the west. Shrouded in mist they were, so that no man might peer beyond them, or see their summits, which indeed some say reach even to the heavens. And the bearded man again implored me to turn back, but I heeded him not, for from the mists beyond the basalt pillars I fancied there came the notes of singers and lutenists, sweeter than the sweetest songs of Sonanil, and sounding mine own praises, the praises of me who had voyaged far from the full moon and dwelt in the land of fancy. So to the sound of melody, the white ship sailed into the mist betwixt the basalt pillars of the west, and when the music ceased, and the mist lifted, we beheld not the land of Cathuria, but a swift rushing restless sea, over which our helpless bark was borne toward some unknown goal. Soon to our ears came the distant thunder of falling waters, and to our eyes appeared on the far horizon ahead the titanic spray of a monstrous cataract, wherein the oceans of the world dropped down to abysmal nothingness. Then did the bearded man say to me, with tears on his cheek, We have rejected the beautiful land of Sonanil, which we may never behold again. The gods are greater than men, and they have and I closed my eyes before the crash that I knew would come, shutting out the sight of the celestial bird which flapped its mocking blue wings over the brink of the torrent. Out of that crash came darkness, and I heard the shrieking of men and of things which were not men. From the east, tempestuous winds arose and chilled me as I crouched on the slab of damp stone which had risen beneath my feet. Then, as I heard another crash, I opened my eyes and beheld myself upon the platform of that lighthouse whence I had sailed so many eons ago. In the darkness below there loomed the vast blurred outlines of a vessel breaking up on the cruel rocks and as I glanced out over the waste, I saw that the light had failed for the first time since my grandfather had assumed its care. And in the later watches of the night, when I went within the tower, I saw on the wall a calendar which still remained as when I had left it in the hour I sailed away. With the dawn I descended the tower and looked for wreckage upon the rocks, but what I found was only this, a strange dead bird whose hue was as of the azure sky, and a single shattered spar of a whiteness greater than that of the wave tips or of the mountain snow. And thereafter the ocean told me its secrets no more, and though many times since has the moon shone full and high in heaven, the white ship in the south This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Keith Worrell. The Alchemist by H.P. Lovecraft. High up, crowning the grassy summit of a swelling mount whose sides are wooded near the base with the gnarled trees of a primeval forest, stands the old chateau of my ancestors. For centuries, its lofty battlements have frowned down upon the wild and rugged countryside about, serving as a home and stronghold for the proud houses whose honored line is older even than moss-grown castle walls. These ancient turrets, 
sustained by the storms of generations and crumbling under the slow yet mighty pressure of time, formed in the ages of federalism one of the most dreaded and formidable fortresses in all France. From its mocky collated parapets and mounted battlements, barons, counts, and even kings have been defied, yet never has its spacious hall resounded to the footsteps of the invader. But since those glorious years all is changed, a poverty but little above the level of dire want, together with a pride of name that forbids its alleviation by the pursuits of commercial life, have prevented the scions of our line from maintaining their estates in pristine splendor, and the falling stone of the walls, the overgrown vegetation of the parks, the dry and dusty moat, the ill-paved courtyards, and toppling towers without, as well as the sagging floors, the worm-eaten waincoats, and the faded tapestries within all tell a gloomy tale of fallen grandeur. As the ages passed, first one, then another, of the four great turrets were left a ruin, until at last but a single tower housed the sadly reduced descendants of the once mighty lords of the estate. It was in one of the vast and gloomy chambers of this remaining tower that I, Antone, last of the unhappy and accursed counts of the sea, first saw the light of day ninety long years ago. Within these walls and amongst the dark and shadowy forests, the wild ravines and grottoes of the hillside below were spent the first years of my troubled life. My parents I never knew. My father had been killed at the age of 32, a month before I was born, by the fall of a stone somehow dislodged from one of the deserted parapets of the castle. And my mother having died at my birth, my care and education devolved solely upon one remaining servitor, an old and trusted man of considerable intelligence whose name I remember as Pierre. I was an only child, and the lack of companionship which this fact entailed upon me was augmented by the strange care exercised by my aged guardian in excluding me from the society of the peasant children whose abodes were scattered here and there upon the plains that surround the base of the hill. At the time, Pierre said that this restriction was imposed upon me because my noble birth placed me above association with such Libyan company. Now I know its real object was to keep from my ears the idle tales of the dread curse upon our line that were nightly told and magnified by the simple tenantry as they conversed in their hushed accents in the glow of their cottage hearths. Thus isolated and thrown upon my own resources, I spent the hours of my childhood in poring over the ancient tombs that filled the shadow-haunted library of the chateau, and in roaming without aim or purpose through the perpetual dust of the spectral wood that clothed the side of the hill near its foot. It was perhaps an effect of such surrounding that my mind early acquired a shade of melancholy. Those studies and pursuit which partake of the dark and occult in nature most strongly claimed my attention. Of my own race I was permitted to learn singularly little, yet what small knowledge of it I was able to gain seemed to depress me much. Perhaps it was at first only the manifest reluctance of my old preceptor to discuss with me my paternal ancestry that gave rise to the terror which I ever felt at the mention of my great house. Yet as I grew out of childhood, I was able to piece together disconnected fragments of discourse, let it slip from the unwilling tongue which had begun to falter in approaching senility, and had a sort of relation to a certain circumstance which I had always deemed strange, but which now became dimly terrible. The circumstances to which I allude is the early age at which all the counts of my line had met their end. Whilst I had hitherto considered this but a natural attribute of a family of short-lived men, I afterwards pondered long upon the premature deaths, and began to connect them with the wanderings of the old man, who often spoke of a curse which for centuries had prevented the lives of the holders of my title from much exceeding the span of thirty-two years. Upon my twenty-first birthday, the aged Pierre gave to me a family document which he said had for many generations been handed down from father to son, and continued by each possessor. Its contents were of the most startling nature, and its perusal confirmed the gravest of my apprehension. At this time, my belief in the supernatural was firm and deep-seated, else I would have dismissed with scorn the incredible narrative unfolded before my eyes. The paper carried me back to the days of the thirteenth century, when the old castle in which I sat had been a feared and impregnable fortress. It told of a certain ancient man who had once dwelled on our estates, a person of no small accomplishments, though little above the rank of peasant, by name Michael, usually designated by a surname of Malvase the Evil, on account of his sinister reputation. He had studied beyond the custom of his kind, seeking such things as a philosopher's stone or the elixir of eternal life, and was reputed wise in the terrible secrets of black magic and alchemy. Michael Malvaeus had one son, named Charles, a youth as proficient as himself in the hidden arts who had therefore become called Le Sorcerer, or the Wizard. This pair, shunned by all honest folk, were suspected of the most hideous practices. 
Old Michael was said to have burned his wife alive as a sacrifice to the devil, and the unaccountable disappearance of many small peasant children was laid at the dreaded door of these two. Yet through the dark natures of the father and son ran one seemingly ray of humanity. The old man loved his offspring with fierce intensity, whilst the youth had for his parent a more than filial affection. One night the castle on the hill was thrown into the wild confusion by the vanishment of a young Godfrey, son to Henry, the Count. A searching party headed by the frantic father invaded the cottage of the sorcerers and there came upon old Michael Malveus, busy over a huge and violently bouldering cauldron. Without certain cause in the ungoverned madness of fury and despair, the Count laid hands on the aged wizard and ere he released his murderous hold, his victim was no more. Meanwhile, joyful servants were proclaiming the finding of young Godfrey in a distant and unused chamber of the great edifice, telling too late that poor Michael had been killed in vain. As the Count and his associates turned away from the lovely abode of the alchemist, the form of Charles Le Sorcerer appeared through the trees. The excited chatter of menials standing about told him what had occurred, yet he seemed at first unmoved at his father's fate. Then, slowly advancing to meet the Count, he pronounced in dull yet terrible accents the curse that ever afterward haunted the House of Sea. May never a noble of thy murderous line survive to reach a greater age than thine, spoke he when suddenly leaping backwards into the black woods, he drew from his tunic a vial of colorless liquid, which he threw into the faces of his father's slayer as he disappeared behind the inky curtain of the night. The Count died without utterance and was buried the next day, but little more than two and thirty years from the hour of his birth. No trace of the assassin could be found, though relentless bands of peasants scoured the neighboring woods and the meadowland around the hill. Thus time and the want of a remainder dulled the memory of the curse in the minds of the late Count's family, so that when Godfrey, innocent cause of the whole tragedy and now bearing the title, was killed by an arrow whilst hunting at the age of thirty-two, there were no thoughts save those of grief at his demise. But when, years afterwards, the next young Count, Robert by name, was found dead in a nearby field of no apparent cause, the peasants told in whispers that their sonnier had but lately passed his thirty-second birthday when surprised by early death. Louis, son to Robert, was found drowned in the moat at the same fateful age, and thus down through the centuries ran the ominous chronicle, Henris, Robert, Antonius, and Armand snatched from happy and virtuous lives when little below the age of their unfortunate ancestor at his murder. That I had left at most but eleven years of further existence was made certain to me by the words which I had read. My life previously held at small value now became dearer to me each day. As I delved deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the hidden world of black magic, isolated as I was, modern science had produced no impression upon me, and I labored as in the Middle Ages, as rapt as had been old Michael and young Charles themselves in the acquisition of demonological and alchemical learning. Yet read as I might, in no manner could I account for the strange curse upon my line. In unusually rational moments, I would even go so far as to seek a natural explanation, attributing the early deaths of my ancestors to the sinister Charles Le Saucer and his heirs. Yet, having found upon careful inquiry that there were no known descendants of the alchemist, I would fall back to occult studies, and once more endeavor to find a spell that would release my house from its terrible burden. Upon one thing I was absolutely resolved. I should never wed, for, since no other branch of my family was in existence, I might thus end the curse with myself. As I drew near the age of thirty, old Pierre was called to the land beyond. Alone, I buried him beneath the stones of the courtyard about which he had loved to wander in life. Thus was I left to ponder on myself as the only human creature within the great fortress, and in my utter solitude my mind began to cease a vain protest against the impending doom, to become almost reconciled to the fate which so many of my ancestors had met. Much of my time now was occupied with the exploration of the ruined and abandoned halls of the towers of the old chateau, which in my youth here had caused me to shun, and some of which old Pierre had once told me had not been trodden by human foot for over four centuries. Strange and awesome were many of the objects I encountered. Furniture, covered by the dust of ages and crumbling with a rot of long dampness, met my eyes. Cobwebs in a profusion never before seen by me were spun everywhere, and huge bats flapped their bony and uncanny wings on all sides of the otherwise untenanated gloom. Of my exact age, even down to days and hours, I kept a most careful record, for each movement of the pendulum of the mass block in the library pulled off so much of my doomed existence. At length, I approached that time which I had so long viewed with apprehension, since most of my ancestors had been seized some little while before they reached the exact age. 
of Count Henry at his end. I was every moment on the watch for the coming of the unknown death. In what strange form the curse should overtake me, I knew not, but I was resolved at least that it should not find me a cowardly or passive victim. With new vigor, I applied myself to my examination of the old chateau and its contents. It was upon one of the longest of all my excursions of discovery in the deserted portion of the castle, less than a week before that fatal hour which I felt must mark the utmost limit of my stay on earth, beyond which I could not even the slightest hope of continuing to draw breath, that I came upon the culminating event of my whole life. I had spent the better part of the morning in climbing up and down half-ruined staircases in one of the most dilapidated and ancient turrets. As the afternoon progressed, I saw the lower levels descending into what appeared to be either a medieval place of confinement or a more recently excavated storehouse for gunpowder. As I slowly traversed the nitrine-crusted passageway at the foot of the last staircase, the paving became very damp, and soon I saw by the light of my flickering torch that a blank, water-stained wall impeded my journey. Turning to retrace my steps, my eye fell upon a small trap door with a ring which lay directly beneath my foot. Pausing, I succeeded with difficulty in raising it, whereupon there was revealed a black aperture, exhaling nauseous fumes which caused my torch to sputter, and disclosing in the unsteady glare the top of a flight of stone steps. As soon as the torch which I lowered into the repellent depth burned freely and steadily, I commenced my descent. The steps were many, and led to a narrow, stone lagged passage, which I knew must be far underground. This passage proved of great length and terminated in the massive oaken door, dripping with the moisture of the place and stoutly resisting all my attempts to open it. Ceasing after a time my efforts in this direction, I had proceeded back some distance towards the steps where there suddenly fell to my experience one of the most profound and maddening shocks capable of reception by the human mind. Without warning, I heard the heavy door behind me creak slowly open upon its rusty hinges. My immediate sensations were incapable of analysis. To be confronted in a place as thoroughly deserted as I had deemed the old castle with evidence of the presence of man or spirit produced in my brain a horror of the most acute description. When at last I turned and faced the seat of the sound, my eyes must have started from their orbits at the sight that they beheld. There, in the ancient Gothic doorway, stood a human figure. It was that of a man, clad in a skull cap and long medieval tunic of a dark color. His long hair and flowing beard were of a terrible and intense black hue and incredible profusion. His forehead high beyond the usual dimensions, his cheeks deep sunken and heavily lined with wrinkles, and his hands long, claw-like, and gnarled, were such a deadly, marble-like whiteness as I had never elsewhere seen in man. His figure, lean to proportions of a skeleton, was strangely bent and almost lost within the volumes of folds of his particular garment. But strangest of all were his eyes, twin caves of abysmal blackness, profound in expression of understanding, yet inhuman in degree of wickedness. These were now fixed upon me, piercing my soul with their hatred, and rooting me to the spot whereon I stood. At last the figure spoke in a rumbling voice that chilled me through with its dull hollowness and latent malevolence. The language in which the discourse was clothed was that debased form of Latin in use amongst the more learned men of the Middle Ages, and made familiar to me by my prolonged researches into the works of the old alchemists and demonologists. The apparition spoke of the curse which had hovered over my house, told me of the coming end, dwelt on the wrong perpetuated by my ancestor against old Michael Malveus, and gloated over the revenge of Charles Le Saucier. He told me how young Charles had escaped into the night, returning in after years to kill Godfrey, the heir, with an arrow just as he approached the age which had been his father's at his assassination. How he had secretly returned to the estate and established himself unknown in the even then deserted subterranean chamber whose doorway now framed the hideous narrator. How he had seized Robert, son of Godfrey, in a field, forced poison down his throat, and then left him to die at the age of thirty-two thus maintaining the foul provisions of his vengeful curse. At this point, I was left to imagine the solution of the greatest mystery of all, how the curse had been fulfilled since that time when Charles Le Saucier must in the course of nature have died, for the man digressed into an account of a deep alchemical studies of two wizards, father and son, speaking most particularly of the researches of Charles Le Saucier concerning the elixir which should grant him who partook of it in eternal life and youth. His enthusiasm had seemed for the moment to remove from his terrible eyes the black malevolence that had first so haunted me. 
but suddenly the fiendish glare returned, and with a shocking sound like the hissing of a serpent, the stranger raised a glass vial with the evident intent of ending my life as had Charles de Saussure six hundred years before ended that of my ancestor. Prompted by some preserving instinct of self-defense, I broke through the spell that had hitherto held me immovable, and flung my now-dying torch at the creature who menaced my existence. I heard the file break harmlessly against the stones of the passage as the tunic of the strange man caught fire and lit the horrid scene with a ghastly radiance. The shriek of fright and impotent malice emanated by the would-be assassin proved too much for my already shaken nerves, and I fell prone upon the slimy floor in a total faint. When at last my senses returned, all was frightfully dark, and my mind, remembering what had occurred, shrank from the idea of beholding any more, yet curiosity overmastered all. Who, I asked myself, was the man of evil, and how come he within the castle walls? Why should he seek to avenge the death of Michael Malveus, and how had the curse been carried on through all these long centuries since the time of Charles Le Saussure? The dread of years was lifted from my shoulders, for I knew that he whom I had felled was the source of all my danger from the curse, and now I was free. I burned with the desire to learn more of the sinister thing which had haunted my line for centuries, and made of my own youth one long continued nightmare. Determined upon further exploration, I felt my pockets for lint and steel, and lit the unused torch which I had with me. First of all, new light revealed the distorted and blackened form of the mysterious stranger. The hideous eyes were now closed. Disliking the sight, I turned away and entered the chamber beyond the gothic door. Here I found what seemed much like an alchemist's laboratory. In one corner was an immense pile of shining yellow metal that sparkled gorgeously in the light of the torch. It may have been gold, but I did not pause to examine it, for I was strangely affected by that which I had undergone. At the farthest end of the apartment was an opening leading out into one of the many wild ravines of the dark hillside forest. Filled with wonder, yet now realizing how the man had obtained access to the chateau, I proceeded to return. I had intended to pass by the remains of the stranger with averted face, but as I approached the body, I seemed to hear, emanating from it, a faint sound, as though life were not yet wholly extinct. Aghast, I turned to examine the charred and shriveled figure on the floor. Then, all at once, the horrible eyes, blacker even than the seared face in which they were set, opened wide with an expression which I was unable to interpret. The cracked lips tried to frame words I could not well understand. Once I caught the name of Charles Le Saussure, and again I fancied the words years and curse issued from the twisted mouth. Still I was at a loss to gather the purport of his disconnected speech. At my evident ignorance of his meaning, pitchy eyes once more flashed malevolently at me, until, helpless as I saw my opponent to be, I trembled as I watched him. Suddenly the wretch, animated with his last burst of strength, raised his pitchous head from the damp and sunken pavement. Then, as I remained paralyzed with fear, he found his voice and his dying breath scream forth those words which have ever afterwards haunted my days and nights. Fool, he shrieked, can you not guess my secret? Have you no brain whereby you may recognize the will which has through six long centuries fulfilled the dreadful curse upon the house? Have I not told you the great elixir of eternal life? Know you not how the secret of alchemy was solved? I tell you, it is I, I, I have lived for six hundred years to maintain my revenge, for I am Charles Le Saussure. End of The Alchemist. Recording by Keith Worrell. Please visit my webpage at www.nakedpenguins.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter The Beast in the Cave by H.P. Lovecraft The horrible conclusion which had been gradually intruding itself upon my confused and reluctant mind was now an awful certainty. I was lost, completely hopelessly lost, in the vast and labyrinthine recess of the Mammoth Cave. Turn as I might, in no direction could my straining vision seize on any object capable of serving as a guidepost to set me on the outward path. That never more should I behold the blessed light of day, or scan the pleasant hills and dales of the beautiful world outside, my reason could no longer entertain the slightest unbelief. Hope had departed. Yet indoctrinated as I was by a life of philosophical study, I derived no small measure of satisfaction from my unimpassioned demeanor, 
for although I had frequently read of the wild frenzies into which were thrown the victims of similar situations, I experienced none of these, but stood quiet as soon as I clearly realized the loss of my bearings. Nor did the thought that I had probably wandered beyond the utmost limits of an ordinary search cause me to abandon my composure even for a moment. If I must die, I reflected, then was this terrible yet majestic cavern as welcome a sepulchre as that which any churchyard might afford, a conception which carried with it more of tranquility than of despair. Starving would prove my ultimate fate, of this I was certain. Some I knew had gone mad under circumstances such as these, but I felt that this end would not be mine. My disaster was the result of no fault save my own, since unknown to the guide I had separated myself from the regular party of sightseers, and wandering for over an hour in forbidden avenues of the cave, had found myself unable to retrace the devious windings which I had pursued since forsaking my companions. Already my torch had begun to expire. Soon I would be enveloped by the total and almost palpable blackness of the bowels of the earth. As I stood in the waning, unsteady light, I idly wondered over the exact circumstances of my coming end. I remembered the accounts which I had heard of the colony of consumptives who, taking their residence in this gigantic grotto to find health from the apparently salubrious air of the underground world, with its steady, uniform temperature, pure air, and peaceful quiet, had found instead death in strange and ghastly form. I had seen the sad remains of their ill-made cottages as I passed them by with the party, and had wondered what unnatural influence a long sojourn in this immense and silent cavern would exert upon one as healthy and vigorous as I. Now I grimly told myself my opportunity for settling this point had arrived, provided that want of food should not bring me too speedy a departure from this life. As the last fitful rays of my torch faded into obscurity, I resolved to leave no stone unturned, no possible means of escape neglected. So summoning all the powers possessed by my lungs, I set up a series of loud shoutings, in the vain hope of attracting the attention of the guide by my clamor. Yet as I called, I believed in my heart that my cries were to no purpose, and that my voice, magnified and reflected by the numberless ramparts of the black maze about me, fell upon no ears save my own. All at once, however, my attention was fixed with a start as I fancied that I heard the sound of soft approaching steps on the rocky floor of the cavern. Was my deliverance about to be accomplished so soon? Had then all my horrible apprehensions been for naught? And was the guide, having marked my unwarranted absence from the party, following my course and seeking me out in this limestone labyrinth? Whilst these joyful queries arose in my brain, I was on the point of renewing my cries, in order that my discovery might come the sooner, when in an instant my delight was turned to horror as I listened, for my ever-acute ear now sharpened in even greater degree by the complete silence of the cave, bore to my benumbed understanding the unexpected and dreadful knowledge that these footfalls were not like those of any mortal man. In the unearthly stillness of this subterranean region, the tread of the booted guide would have sounded like a series of sharp and incisive blows. These impacts were soft and stealthy, as of the paws of some feline. Besides, when I listened carefully, I seemed to trace the falls of four instead of two feet. I was now convinced that I had, by my own cries, aroused and attracted some wild beast, perhaps a mountain lion, which had accidentally strayed within the cave. Perhaps, I considered, the Almighty had chosen for me a swifter and more merciful death than that of hunger. Yet the instinct of self-preservation, never wholly dormant, was stirred in my breast, and though escape from the oncoming peril might but spare me for a sterner and more lingering end, I determined nevertheless to part with my life at as high a price as I could command. Strange as it may seem, my mind conceived of no intent on the part of the visitor save that of hostility. Accordingly, I became very quiet, in the hope that the unknown beast would, in the absence of a guiding sound, lose its direction as had I, and thus pass me by. But this hope was not destined for realization, for the strange footfalls steadily advanced, the animal evidently having obtained my scent, which in an atmosphere so absolutely free from all distracting influences as is that of the cave, could doubtless be followed at great distance. Seeing, therefore, that I must be armed for defense against an uncanny and unseen attack in the dark, I grouped about me the largest of the fragments of rock which were strewn upon all parts of the floor of the cavern in the vicinity, and grasping one in each hand for immediate use, awaited with resignation the inevitable result. Meanwhile, the hideous pattering of the paws drew near. 
but certainly the conduct of the creature was exceedingly strange. Most of the time, the tread seemed to be that of a quadruped, walking with a singular lack of unison betwixt hind and four feet. Yet at brief and infrequent intervals I fancied that but two feet were engaged in the process of locomotion. I wondered what species of animal was to confront me. It must, I thought, be some unfortunate beast who had paid for its curiosity to investigate one of the entrances of the fearful grotto with a lifelong confinement in its interminable recesses. It doubtless obtained as food the eyeless fish, bats and rats of the cave, as well as some of the ordinary fish that are wafted in at every freshet of Green River, which communicates in some occult manner with the waters of the cave. I occupied my terrible vigil with grotesque conjectures of what alteration cave life might have wrought in the physical structure of the beast, remembering the awful appearances ascribed by local tradition to the consumptives who had died after long residence in the cave. Then I remembered with a start that, even should I succeed in felling my antagonist, I should never behold its form, as my torch had long since been extinct, and I was entirely unprovided with matches. The tension on my brain now became frightful. My disordered fancy conjured up hideous and fearsome shapes from the sinister darkness that surrounded me, and that actually seemed to press upon my body. Nearer, nearer the dreadful footfalls approached. It seemed that I must give vent to a piercing scream, yet had I been sufficiently irresolute to attempt such a thing, my voice could scarce have responded. I was petrified, rooted to the spot. I doubted if my right arm would allow me to hurl its missile at the oncoming thing, when the crucial moment should arrive. Now the steady pat-pat of the steps was close at hand, now very close. I could hear the labored breathing of the animal, and terror-struck as I was, I realized that it must have come from a considerable distance, and was correspondingly fatigued. Suddenly the spell broke. My right hand, guided by my ever-trustworthy sense of hearing, threw with full force the sharp-angled bit of limestone which it contained, toward that point in the darkness from which emanated the breathing and pattering and... Wonderful to relate, it nearly reached its goal, for I heard the thing jump, landing at a distance away, where it seemed to pause. Having readjusted my aim, I discharged my second missile, this time most effectively, for with a flood of joy I listened as the creature fell in what sounded like a complete collapse, and evidently remained prone and unmoving. Almost overpowered by the great relief which rushed over me, I reeled back against the wall. The breathing continued in heavy gasping inhalations and expirations, whence I realized that I had no more than wounded the creature. And now all desire to examine the thing ceased. At last something allied to groundless superstitious fear had entered my brain, and I did not approach the body, nor did I continue to cast stones at it in order to complete the extinction of its life. Instead I ran at full speed in what was, as nearly as I could estimate in my frenzied condition, the direction from which I had come. Suddenly I heard a sound, or rather a regular succession of sounds. In another instant they had resolved themselves into a series of sharp metallic clicks. This time there was no doubt. It was the guide. And then I shouted, yelled, screamed, even shrieked with joy, as I beheld in the vaulted arches above the faint and glimmering effulgence which I knew to be the reflected light of an approaching torch. I ran to meet the flare, and before I could completely understand what had occurred, was lying upon the ground at the feet of the guide, embracing his boots and gibbering despite my boasted reserve in a most meaningless and idiotic manner, pouring out my terrible story and at the same time overwhelming my auditor with protestations of gratitude. At length I awoke to something like my normal consciousness. The guide had noted my absence upon the arrival of the party at the entrance of the cave, and had, from his own intuitive sense of direction, proceeded to make a thorough canvas of by-passages just ahead of where he had last spoken to me, locating my whereabouts after a quest of about four hours. By the time he had related this to me, I, emboldened by his torch and his company, began to reflect upon the strange beast which I had wounded but a short distance back in the darkness, and suggested that we ascertain by the flashlight's aid what manner of creature was my victim. Accordingly, I retraced my steps, this time with a courage born of companionship, to the scene of my terrible experience. Soon we descried a white object upon the floor, an object whiter even than the gleaming limestone itself. Cautiously advancing, we gave vent to a simultaneous ejaculation of wonderment, for of all the unnatural monsters either of us had in our lifetimes beheld, this was in surpassing degree the strangest. It appeared to be an anthropoid ape of large proportions, escaped, perhaps, from some itinerant menagerie. Its hair was snow-white, a thing due, no doubt, to the bleaching action of a long existence within the inky confines of the cave. 
but it was also surprisingly thin, being indeed largely absent save on the head, where it was of such length and abundance that it fell over the shoulders in considerable profusion. The face was turned away from us, as the creature lay almost directly upon it. The inclination of the limbs was very singular, explaining, however, the alternation in their use which I had before noted, whereby the beast used sometimes all four, and on other occasions but two, for its progress. From the tips of the fingers or toes, long rat-like claws extended. The hands or feet were not prehensile, a fact that I ascribed to that long residence in the cave, which, as I before mentioned, seemed evident from the all-pervading and almost unearthly whiteness so characteristic of the whole anatomy. No tail seemed to be present. The respiration had now grown very feeble, and the guide had drawn his pistol with the evident intent of dispatching the creature, when a sudden sound emitted by the latter caused the weapon to fall unused. The sound was of a nature difficult to describe. It was not like the normal note of any known species of simian, and I wonder if this unnatural quality were not the result of a long-continued and complete silence, broken by the sensations produced by the advent of the light, a thing which the beast could not have seen since its first entrance into the cave. The sound, which I might feebly attempt to classify as a kind of deep tone chattering, was faintly continued. All at once a fleeting spasm of energy seemed to pass through the frame of the beast. The paws went through a convulsive motion, and the limbs contracted. With a jerk the white body rolled over so that its face was turned in our direction. For a moment I was so struck with horror at the eyes thus revealed that I noted nothing else. They were black, those eyes, deep, jetty black, in hideous contrast to the snow-white hair and flesh. Like those of other cave denizens, they were deeply sunken in their orbits, and were entirely destitute of iris. As I looked more closely, I saw that they were set in a face less prognathous than that of the average ape, and infinitely less hairy. The nose was quite distinct. As we gazed upon the uncanny sight presented to our vision, the thick lips opened and several sounds issued from them, after which the thing relaxed in death. The guide clutched my coat sleeve and trembled so violently that the light shook fitfully, casting weird moving shadows on the walls. I made no motion, but stood rigidly still, my horrified eyes fixed upon the floor ahead. The fear left, and wonder, awe, compassion, and reverence succeeded in its place. For the sounds uttered by the stricken figure that lay stretched out on the limestone had told us the awesome truth. The creature I had killed, the strange beast of the unfathomed cave, was, or had at one time been, a man. End of The Beast in the Cave by H. P. Lovecraft Beyond the Wall of Sleep I have often wondered if the majority of mankind ever pause to reflect upon the occasionally titanic significance of dreams, and of the obscure world to which they belong. Whilst the greater number of our nocturnal visions are perhaps no more than faint and fantastic reflections of our waking experiences, Freud, to the contrary, with his puerile symbolism, there are still a certain remainder whose immundane and ethereal character permit of no ordinary interpretation, and whose vaguely exciting and disquieting effect suggests possible minute glimpses into a sphere of mental existence no less important than physical life, yet separated from that life by an all but impassable barrier. From my experience I cannot doubt but that man, when lost to terrestrial consciousness, is indeed sojourning in another and uncorporeal life of far different nature from the life we know, and of which only the slightest and most indistinct memories linger after waking. From those blurred and fragmentary memories we may infer much, yet prove little. We may guess that in dreams, life, matter, and vitality, as the earth knows such things, are not necessarily constant, and that time and space do not exist as our waking selves comprehend them. Sometimes I believe that this less material life is our truer life, 
and that our vain presence on the terraqueous globe is itself a secondary or merely virtual phenomenon. It was from a youthful reverie filled with speculations of this sort that I arose one afternoon in the winter of 1900 and 1901 when to the state psychopathic institution in which I served as an intern was brought the man whose case has ever since haunted me so unceasingly. His name, as given on the records, was Joe Slater, or Slater, and his appearance was that of the typical denizen of the Catskill Mountain region, one of those strange repellent scions of a primitive colonial peasant stock whose isolation for nearly three centuries in the hilly fastnesses of a little traveled countryside has caused them to sink to a kind of barbaric degeneracy, rather than advance with their more fortunately placed brethren of the thickly settled districts. Among these odd folk, who correspond exactly to the decadent element of white trash in the South, law and morals are non-existent and their general mental status is probably below that of any other section of Native American people. Joe Slater, who came to the institution in the vigilant custody of four state policemen, and who was described as a highly dangerous character, certainly presented no evidence of his perilous disposition when I first beheld him. Though well above the middle stature, and of somewhat brawny frame, he was given an absurd appearance of harmless stupidity by the pale, sleepy blueness of his small, watery eyes, the scantness of his neglected and never-shaven growth of yellow beard, and the listless drooping of his heavy nether lip. His age was unknown, since among his kind neither family records nor permanent family ties exist, but from the baldness of his head and front, and from the decayed condition of his teeth, the head surgeon wrote him down as a man of about forty. From the medical and court documents we learned all that could be gathered of his case. This man, a vagabond, hunter, and trapper, had always been strange in the eyes of his primitive associates. He had habitually slept at night beyond the ordinary time, and upon waking would often talk of unknown things in a manner so bizarre as to inspire fear even in the hearts of an unimaginative populace. Not that his form of language was at all unusual, for he never spoke save in the debased patois of his environment, but the tone and tenor of his utterances were of such mysterious wildness that none might listen without apprehension. He himself was generally as terrified and baffled as his auditors, and within an hour after awakening would forget all that he had said, or at least all that had caused him to say what he did, relapsing into a bovine, half-amiable normality like that of the other hill-dwellers. As Slater grew older, it appeared, his matutinal aberrations had gradually increased in frequency and violence, till about a month before his arrival at the institution had occurred the shocking tragedy which caused his arrest by the authorities. One day, near noon, after a profound sleep begun in a whiskey debauch at about five of the previous afternoon, the man had roused himself most suddenly, with ululations so horrible and unearthly that they brought several neighbors to his cabin, a filthy sty where he dwelt with a family as indescribable as himself. Rushing out into the snow, he had flung his arms aloft, and commenced a series of leaps directly upward in the air, the while shouting his determination to reach some, quote, big, big cabin with brightness in the roof and walls and floor and the loud, queer music far away, unquote. As two men of moderate size sought to restrain him, he had struggled with maniacal force and fury, screaming of his desire and need to find and kill a certain... Quote, thing that shines and shakes and laughs, unquote. At length, after temporarily felling one of his detainers with a sudden blow, he had flung himself upon the other in a demoniac ecstasy of bloodthirstiness, shrieking fiendishly that he would, quote, jump high in the air and burn his way through anything that stopped him, unquote. 
Family and neighbors had now fled in a panic, and when the more courageous of them returned, Slater was gone, leaving behind an unrecognizable pulp-like thing that had been a living man but an hour before. None of the mountaineers had dared to pursue him, and it is likely that they would have welcomed his death from the cold, but when several mornings later they heard his screams from a distant ravine, they realized that he had somehow managed to survive, and that his removal in one way or another would be necessary. Then had followed an armed searching party, whose purpose, whatever it may have been originally, became that of a sheriff's posse, after one of the seldom popular state troopers had by accident observed, then questioned, and finally joined the seekers. On the third day, Slater was found unconscious in the hollow of a tree, and taken to the nearest jail, where alienists from Albany examined him as soon as his senses returned. To them he told a simple story. He had, he said, gone to sleep one afternoon about sundown after drinking much liquor. He had awakened to find himself standing bloody-handed in the snow before his cabin, the mangled corpse of his neighbor, Peter Slater, at his feet. Horrified, he had taken to the woods in a vague effort to escape from the scene of what must have been his crime. Beyond these things he seemed to know nothing, nor could the expert questioning of his interrogators bring out a single additional fact. That night, Slater slept quietly and the next morning he awakened with no singular feature save a certain alteration of expression. Dr. Barnard, who had been watching the patient, thought he noticed in the pale blue eyes a certain gleam of peculiar quality, and in the flaccid lips an all but imperceptible tightening, as if of intelligent determination. But when questioned, Slater relapsed into the habitual vacancy of the mountaineer, and only reiterated what he had said on the preceding day. On the third morning occurred the first of the man's mental attacks. After some show of uneasiness in sleep, he burst forth into a frenzy so powerful that the combined efforts of four men were needed to bind him in a straitjacket. The alienists listened with keen attention to his words, since their curiosity had been aroused to a high pitch by the suggestive yet mostly conflicting and incoherent stories of his family and neighbors. Slater raved for upward of fifteen minutes, babbling in his backwoods dialect of green edifices of light, oceans of space, strange music, and shadowy mountains and valleys. But most of all did he dwell upon some mysterious blazing entity that shook and laughed and mocked at him. This vast, vague personality seemed to have done him a terrible wrong, and to kill it in triumphant revenge was his paramount desire. In order to reach it, he said, he would soar through abysses of emptiness, burning every obstacle that stood in his way. Thus ran his discourse, until with the greatest suddenness he ceased. The fire of madness died from his eyes and in dull wonder he looked at his questioners and asked why he was bound. Dr. Barnard unbuckled the leather harness and did not restore it till night, when he succeeded in persuading Slater to don it of his own volition, for his own good. The man had now admitted that he sometimes talked queerly, though he knew not why. Within a week, two more attacks appeared, but from them the doctors learned little. On the source of Slater's visions they speculated at length, for since he could neither read nor write, and had apparently never heard a legend or a fairy tale, his gorgeous imagery was quite inexplicable. That it could not come from any known myth or romance was made especially clear by the fact that the unfortunate lunatic expressed himself only in his own simple manner. He raved of things he did not understand and could not interpret things which he claimed to have experienced, but which he could not have learned through any normal or connected narration. The alienists soon agreed that abnormal dreams were the foundation of the trouble, dreams whose vividness could for a time completely dominate the waking mind of this basically inferior man. With due formality, Slater was tried for murder, acquitted on the ground of insanity, 
and committed to the institution wherein I held so humble a post. I have said that I am a constant speculator concerning dream life, and from this you may judge of the eagerness with which I applied myself to the study of the new patient, as soon as I had fully ascertained the facts of his case. He seemed to sense a certain friendliness in me, for no doubt of the interest I could not conceal, and the gentle manner in which I questioned him. Not that he ever recognized me during his attacks, when I hung breathlessly upon his chaotic but cosmic word pictures. But he knew me in his quiet hours, when he would sit by his barred window, weaving baskets of straw and willow, and perhaps pining for the mountain freedom he could never again enjoy. His family never called to see him. Probably it had found another temporary head, after the manner of decadent mountain folk. By degrees I commenced to feel an overwhelming wonder at the mad and fantastic conceptions of Joe Slater. The man himself was pitiably inferior in mentality and language alike, but his glowing titanic visions, though described in a barbarous disjointed jargon, were assuredly things which only a superior or even exceptional brain could conceive. How, I often asked myself, could the stolid imagination of a Catskill degenerate conjure up sights whose very possession argued a lurking spark of genius? How could any backwoods dullard have gained so much as an idea of those glittering realms of supernal radiance and space about which Slater ranted in his furious delirium? More and more, I inclined to the belief that in the pitiful personality who cringed before me lay the disordered nucleus of something beyond my comprehension, something infinitely beyond the comprehension of my more experienced, but less imaginative, medical and scientific colleagues. And yet, I could extract nothing definite from the man. The sum of all my investigation was that, in a kind of semi-corporeal dream life, Slater wandered or floated through resplendent and prodigious valleys, mountains, gardens, cities, and palaces of light, in a region unbounded and unknown to man. That there he was no peasant or degenerate, but a creature of importance and vivid life, moving proudly and dominantly, and checked only by a certain deadly enemy, who seemed to be a being of visible, yet ethereal structure and who did not appear to be of human shape, since Slater never referred to it as a man, or as aught, save a thing. This thing had done Slater some hideous but unnamed wrong, which the maniac, if maniac he were, yearned to avenge. From the manner in which Slater alluded to their dealings, I judged that he and the luminous thing had met on equal terms, that in his dream existence the man was himself a luminous thing of the same race as his enemy. This impression was sustained by his frequent references to flying through space and burning all that impeded his progress. Yet these conceptions were formulated in rustic words wholly inadequate to convey them, a circumstance which drove me to the conclusion that, if a dream world indeed existed, Oral language was not its medium for the transmission of thought. Could it be that the dream soul inhabiting this inferior body was desperately struggling to speak things which the simple and halting tongue of dullness could not utter? Could it be that I was face to face with intellectual emanations which would explain the mystery if I could but learn to discover and read them? I did not tell the older physicians of these things, for middle age is skeptical, cynical, and disinclined to accept new ideas. Besides, the head of the institution had but lately warned me in his paternal way that I was overworking, that my mind needed a rest. It had long been my belief that human thought consists basically of atomic or molecular motion, convertible into ether waves or radiant energy like heat, light, and electricity. This belief had early led me to contemplate the possibility of telepathy, or mental communication by means of suitable apparatus, and I had in my college days prepared a set of transmitting and receiving instruments, somewhat similar to the cumbrous devices employed in wireless telegraphy at that crude, 
pre-radio period. These I had tested with a fellow student, but, achieving no result, had soon packed them away with other scientific odds and ends for possible future use. Now, in my intense desire to probe into the dream life of Joe Slater, I sought these instruments again, and spent several days in repairing them for action. When they were complete once more, I missed no opportunity for their trial. At each outbreak of Slater's violence, I would fit the transmitter to his forehead and the receiver to my own, constantly making delicate adjustments for various hypothetical wavelengths of intellectual energy. I had but little notion of how the thought impressions would, if successfully conveyed, arouse an intelligent response in my brain, but I felt certain that I could detect and interpret them. Accordingly, I continued my experiments, though informing no one of their nature. It was on the 21st of February, 1901, that the thing occurred. As I look back across the years, I realize how unreal it seems, and sometimes wonder if old Dr. Fenton was not right when he charged it all to my excited imagination. I recall that he listened with great kindness and patience when I told him, but afterward gave me a nerve powder and arranged for the half-year's vacation on which I departed the next week. That fateful night, I was wildly agitated and perturbed, for despite the excellent care he had received, Joe Slater was unmistakably dying. Perhaps it was his mountain freedom that he missed, or perhaps the turmoil in his brain had grown too acute for his rather sluggish physique. But, at all events, the flame of vitality flickered low in the decadent body. He was drowsy near the end, and as darkness fell, he dropped off into a troubled sleep. I did not strap on the straitjacket as was customary when he slept, since I saw that he was too feeble to be dangerous, even if he woke in mental disorder once more before passing away. But I did place upon his head and mine the two ends of my cosmic radio, hoping against hope for a first and last message from the dream world in the brief time remaining. In the cell with us was one nurse, a mediocre fellow who did not understand the purpose of the apparatus, or think to inquire into my course. As the hours wore on, I saw his head droop awkwardly in sleep, but I did not disturb him. I myself, lulled by the rhythmical breathing of the healthy and the dying man, must have nodded a little later. The sound of weird lyric melody was what aroused me. Chords, vibrations, and harmonic ecstasies echoed passionately on every hand, while, on my ravished sight, burst the stupendous spectacle of ultimate beauty. Walls, columns, and architraves of living fire blazed effulgently around the spot where I seemed to float in air, extending upward to an infinitely high vaulted dome of indescribable splendor. Blending with this display of palatial magnificence, or, rather, supplanting it at times in kaleidoscopic rotation, were glimpses of wide plains and graceful valleys, high mountains, and inviting grottos, covered with every lovely attribute of scenery which my delighted eyes could conceive of, yet formed wholly of some glowing ethereal plastic entity, which in consistency partook as much of spirit as of matter. As I gazed, I perceived that my own brain held the key to these enchanting metamorphoses, for each vista which appeared to me was the one my changing mind most wished to behold. Amidst this Elysian realm I dwelt not as a stranger, for each sight and sound was familiar to me, just as it had been for uncounted eons of eternity before, and would be for like eternities to come. Then the resplendent aura of my brother of light drew near and held colloquy with me, soul to soul, with silent and perfect interchange of thought. The hour was one of approaching triumph, for was not my fellow being escaping at last from a degrading periodic bondage, escaping forever, and preparing to follow the accursed oppressor, even unto the uttermost fields of ether, 
that upon it might be wrought a flaming cosmic vengeance which would shake the spheres. We floated thus for a little time, when I perceived a slight blurring and fading of the objects around us, as though some force were recalling me to earth, where I least wished to go. The form near me seemed to feel a change also, for it gradually brought its discourse toward a conclusion, and itself prepared to quit the scene, fading from my sight at a rate somewhat less rapid than that of the other objects. A few more thoughts were exchanged, and I knew that the Luminous One and I were being recalled to bondage, though for my brother of light it would be the last time. The sorry planet shell being well nigh spent, in less than an hour my fellow would be free to pursue the oppressor along the Milky Way, and past the hither stars to the very confines of infinity. A well-defined shock separates my final impression of the fading scene of light from my sudden and somewhat shamefaced awakening, and straightening up in my chair, as I saw the dying figure on the couch move hesitantly. Joe Slater was indeed awakening, though probably for the last time. As I looked more closely, I saw that in the sallow cheeks shone spots of color which had never before been present. The lips, too, seemed unusual, being tightly compressed, as if by the force of a stronger character than had been Slater's. The whole face finally began to grow tense, and the head turned restlessly with closed eyes. I did not rouse the sleeping nurse, but readjusted the slightly disarranged headband of my telepathic radio, intent to catch any parting message the dreamer might have to deliver. All at once, the head turned sharply in my direction, and the eyes fell open, causing me to stare in blank amazement at what I beheld. The man who had been Joe Slater, the Catskill decadent, was gazing at me with a pair of luminous, expanding eyes whose blue seemed subtly to have deepened. Neither mania nor degeneracy was visible in that gaze, and I felt beyond a doubt that I was viewing a face behind which lay an active mind of high order. At this juncture my brain became aware of a steady external influence operating upon it. I closed my eyes to concentrate my thoughts more profoundly, and was rewarded by the positive knowledge that my long-sought mental message had come at last. Each transmitted idea formed rapidly in my mind, and though no actual language was employed, my habitual association of conception and expression was so great that I seemed to be receiving the message in ordinary English. Joe Slater is dead, came the sole petrifying voice of an agency from beyond the wall of sleep. My opened eyes sought the couch of pain and curious horror, but the blue eyes were still calmly gazing, and the countenance was still intelligently animated. He is better dead, for he was unfit to bear the active intellect of cosmic entity. His gross body could not undergo the needed adjustments between ethereal life and planet life. He was too much an animal, too little a man. Yet it is through his deficiency that you have come to discover me, for the cosmic and planet souls rightly should never meet. He has been in my torment and diurnal prison for forty-two of your terrestrial years. I am an entity like that which you yourself become in the freedom of dreamless sleep. I am your brother of light and have floated with you in the effulgent valleys. It is not permitted me to tell your waking earth self of your real self, but we are all roamers of vast spaces and travelers in many ages. Next year I may be dwelling in the Egypt which you call ancient, or in the cruel empire of San Shan, which is to come three thousand years hence. You and I have drifted to the worlds that reel about the red Arcturus, and dwelt in the bodies of the insect philosophers that crawl proudly over the fourth moon of Jupiter. How little does the earth self know life and its extent! How little indeed ought it to know for its own tranquility! Of the oppressor I cannot speak. You on earth have unwittingly felt its distant presence. You, without knowing, idly gave the blinking beacon the name of Algol, the demon star. 
It is to meet and conquer the oppressor that I have vainly striven for eons, held back by bodily encumbrances. Tonight I go as a nemesis, bearing just and blazingly cataclysmic vengeance. Watch me in the sky, close to the demon star. I cannot speak longer, for the body of Joe Slater grows cold and rigid, and the coarse brains are ceasing to vibrate as I wish. You have been my only friend on this planet, the only soul to sense and seek for me within the repellent form which lies on this couch. We shall meet again, perhaps in the shining mists of Orion's sword, perhaps on a bleak plateau in prehistoric Asia, perhaps in unremembered dreams tonight, perhaps in some other form an eon hence, when the solar system shall have been swept away. At this point, the thought waves abruptly ceased. The pale eyes of the dreamer, or, can I say dead man, commenced to glaze fishily. In a half stupor, I crossed over to the couch and felt of his wrist, but found it cold, stiff, and pulseless. The sallow cheeks paled again, and the thick lips fell open, disclosing the repulsively rotten fangs of the degenerate Joe Slater. I shivered, pulled a blanket over the hideous face, and awakened the nurse. Then I left the cell, and went silently to my room. I had an instant and unaccountable craving for a sleep whose dreams I should not remember. The climax? What plain tale of science can boast of such a rhetorical effect? I have merely set down certain things appealing to me as facts, allowing you to construe them as you will. As I've already admitted, my superior, old Dr. Fenton, denies the reality of everything I have related. He vows that I was broken down with nervous strain and badly in need of a long vacation on full pay which he so generously gave me. He assures me, on his professional honor, that Joe Slater was but a low-grade paranoia, whose fantastic notions must have come from the crude hereditary folktales which circulated even in the most decadent of communities. All this he tells me, yet I cannot forget what I saw in the sky on the night after Slater died. Lest you think me a biased witness, another pen must add this final testimony, which may perhaps supply the climax you expect. I will quote the following account of the star Nova Persei verbatim, from the pages of that eminent astronomical authority, Professor Garrett P. Service. Quote, On February 22nd, 1901, a marvelous new star was discovered by Dr. Anderson of Edinburgh, not very far from Algol. No star had been visible at that point before. Within 24 hours, the stranger had become so bright that it outshone Capella. In a week or two, it had visibly faded, and in the course of a few months, it was hardly discernible with the naked eye. Unquote. End Beyond the Wall of Sleep by H.P. Lovecraft This recording is in the public domain. Recording by James Pontolillo. The Cats of Ulthar by H. P. Lovecraft. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat, and this I can verily believe as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic, and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Meroe and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords, and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbors. 
Why they did this I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their hovel, and from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more, and instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed, and sounds heard after dark, the loser would lament impotently, or console himself by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple, and knew not whence it is all cats first came. One day a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year. In the marketplace they told fortunes for silver and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers none could tell, but it was seen that they were given to strange prayers and that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow, and when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy whom the dark people called Menes smiled more often than he wept as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menes could not find his kitten, and as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand, though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned with horn-flanked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again and the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth the familiar cat had vanished. Cats large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow, and white. Old Cranon, the burgomaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menace's kitten, and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple. Even when little Atal, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard of right of beasts. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awakened at dawn, behold, every cat was back at his accustomed hearth, large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair, and marveled not a little. Old Cranon again insisted 
that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their saucers of milk was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days, the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the burgomaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty, though in so doing he was careful to take with him Shang, the blacksmith, and Thal, the cutter of stone, as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this, two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the Burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner, disputed at length with Nith, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thul were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweetmeat as a reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small Menace and his black kitten, of the prayer of Menace, and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told of by traders in Hathek and discussed by travelers in Nier, namely, that in Ulthar no man may kill a cat. This is the end of The Cats of Ulthar by H. P. Lovecraft. Recording by Garrett Fitzgerald. Celeface by H. P. Lovecraft. In a dream, Karanis saw the city in the valley, and the seacoast beyond, and the snowy peak overlooking the sea, and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward distant regions where the sea meets the sky. In a dream it was also that he came by his name of Karanis. For when awake he was called by another name. Perhaps it was natural for him to dream a new name, for he was the last of his family, and alone among the indifferent millions of London, so there were not many to speak to him and remind him who he had been. His money and lands were gone, and he did not care for the ways of the people about him, but preferred to dream and write of his dreams. What he wrote was laughed at by those to whom he showed it, so that after a time he kept his writings to himself, and finally ceased to write. The more he withdrew from the world about him, the more wonderful became his dreams, and it would have been quite futile to try to describe them on paper. Karanis was not modern, and did not think like others who wrote. Whilst they strove to strip from life its embroidered robes of myth and to show in naked ugliness the foul thing that is reality, Karanis sought for beauty alone. When truth and experience failed to reveal it, he sought it in fancy and illusion and found it on his very doorstep amid the nebulous memories of childhood tales and dreams. There are not many persons who know what wonders are open to them in the stories and visions of their youth, for when as children we listen and dream, we think but half-formed thoughts, and when as men we try to remember, we are dulled and prosaic with the poison of life. But some of us awaken the night with strange phantasms of enchanted hills and gardens, 
of fountains that sing in the sun, of golden cliffs overhanging murmuring seas, of plains that stretch down to sleeping cities of bronze and stone, and of shadowy companies of heroes that ride caparisoned white horses along the edges of thick forests. And then we know that we have looked back through the ivory gates into that world of wonder which was ours before we were wise and unhappy. Karanus came very suddenly upon his old world of childhood. He had been dreaming of the house where he had been born, the great stone house covered with ivy, where thirteen generations of his ancestors had lived, and where he had hoped to die. It was moonlight, and he had stolen out into the fragrant summer night, through the gardens, down the terraces, past the great oaks of the park, and along the long white road to the village. The village seemed very old, eaten away at the edge like the moon which had commenced to wane, and Karanus wondered whether the peaked roofs of the small houses hid sleep or death. In the streets were spears of long grass, and the window panes on either side broken or filmily staring. Karanus had not lingered, but had plodded on, as though summoned toward some goal. He dared not disobey the summons, for fear it might prove an illusion like the urges and aspirations of waking life, which do not lead to any goal. Then he had been drawn down a lane that led off the, from the village street towards the channel cliffs, and had come to the end of things, to the precipice in the abyss where all the village and all the world fell abruptly into the unechoing emptiness of infinity, and where even the sky ahead was empty and unlit by the crumbling moon and the peering stars. Faith had urged him on, over the precipice and into the gulf. Faith had urged him on, over the precipice and into the gulf, where he had floated down, 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 past dark, shapeless, undreamed dreams, faintly glowing spheres that may have been partly dreamed dreams, and laughing, winged things that seemed to mock the dreamers of all the worlds. Then a rift seemed to open in the darkness before him, and he saw the city of the valley, glisteningly, radiantly, far, far below, with a background of sea and sky, and a snow-capped mountain near the shore. Karanus had awakened the very moment he beheld the city, yet he knew from his brief glance that it was none other than Selephes in the valley of Uthnargai beyond the Tenarian hills where his spirit had dwelt all the eternity of an hour one summer afternoon very long ago, when he had slipped away from his nurse and let the warm sea breeze lull him to sleep as he watched the clouds from the cliff near the village. He had protested then when they had found him, waked him, and carried him home, for just as he was aroused he had been about to sail in a golden galley for those alluring regions where the sea meets the sky. And now he was equally resentful of awaking, for he had found his fabulous city after forty weary years. But three nights afterward, Karanus came again to Selephes. As before, he dreamed first of the village that was asleep or dead, and of the abyss down which one must float silently. Then the rift appeared again, and he beheld the glittering minarets of the city, and saw the graceful galleys riding at anchor in the blue harbor, and watched the ginkgo trees of Mount Aaron swaying in the sea breeze. But this time he was not snatched away, and like a winged being settled gradually over a grassy hillside, till finally his feet rested gently on the turf. He had indeed come back to the valley of Uthnargai and the splendid city of Selephes.
Down the hill, amid scented grasses and brilliant flowers, walked Karanas. Over the bubbling Naraxa on the small wooden bridge where he had carved his name so many years ago, and through the whispering grove to the great stone bridge by the city gate. All was as of old, nor were the marble walls discolored, nor the polished bronze statues upon them tarnished. And Karanis saw that he need not tremble lest the things he knew be vanished. For even the sentries on the ramparts were the same, and still as young as he remembered them. When he entered the city, past the bronze gates and over the onyx pavements, the merchants and camel drivers greeted him as if he had never been away. And it was the same at the turquoise temple of Hathnorthath, where the orchid wreathed priests told him that there is no time in Uthnarga but only perpetual youth. Then Karanis walked through the street of pillars to the seaward wall, where gathered the traders and sailors and strange men from the regions where the sea meets the sky. There he stayed long, gazing out over the bright harbor where the ripples sparkled beneath an unknown sun, and where rode lightly the galleys from far places over the water. And he gazed also upon Mount Aaron, rising regally from the shore, its lower slopes green with swaying trees, and its white summit touching the sky. More than ever, Karanis wished to sail in a galley to the far places of which he had heard so many strange tales, and he sought again the captain who had agreed to carry him so long ago. He found the man, a Thebe, sitting on the same chest of spice he had sat on before, and the Thebe seemed not to realize that any time had passed. Then the two rode to a galley in the harbor, and giving orders to the oarmen, commenced to sail out into the billowy Serenarian Sea that leads to the sky. For several days they glided undulatingly over the water till finally they came to the horizon where the sea meets the sky. Here the galley paused not at all, but floated easily in the blue of the sky among fleecy clouds tinted with rose. And far beneath the keel, Karanis could see strange lands and rivers and cities of surpassing beauty spread indolently in the sunshine, which seemed never to lessen or disappear. At length, the thief told him that their journey was near its end, and that they would soon enter the harbor of Serania, the pink marble sea of the clouds, which is built on that ethereal coast where the west wind flows into the sky. But as the highest of the city's carbon towers came into sight, there was a sound somewhere in space, and Karanis awaked in his London garret. For many months after that, Karanis sought the marvelous city of Selephase and its sky-bound galleys in vain, and though his dreams carried him to many gorgeous and unheard of places, no one whom he met could tell him how to find Uthnarga beyond the Tenarian Kingdom. One night, he went flying over dark mountains where there were faint, lone campfires at great distances apart and strange, shaggy birds with tinkling bells on the leaders. And in the wildest part of this hilly country, so remote that few men could ever have seen it, he found a hideously ancient wall or causeway of stone zigzagging along the ridges and valleys, too gigantic ever to have risen by human hands, and of such a length that neither end of it could be seen. Beyond that wall in the gray dawn, he came to a land of quaint gardens and cherry trees. And when the sun rose, he beheld such beauty of red and white flowers, green foliage and lawns, white paths, diamond brooks, blue lakelets, carven bridges, and red-roofed pagodas, that he for a moment forgot Celeface in sheer delight. 
But he remembered it again when he walked down a white path toward a red-roofed pagoda, and would have questioned the people of this land about it had he not found that there were no people there, but only birds and bees and butterflies. On another night, Tyrannus walked up a damp stone spiral stairway endlessly, and came to a tower window overlooking a mighty plain and river lit by the full moon. And in the silent city that spread away from the river bank, he thought he beheld some feature or arrangement which he had known before. He would have descended and asked the way to Uthnargai, had not a fearsome aurora sputtered up from some remote place beyond the horizon, showing the ruin and antiquity of the city, and the stagnation of the reedy river, and the death lying upon that land, as it had lain since King Kynarotholus came home from his conquests to find the vengeance of the gods. So Karana sought fruitlessly for the marvelous city of Selephes and its galleys that sailed to Saranian in the sky, meanwhile seeing many wonders, and once barely escaping from the high priest not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face, and dwells all alone in a prehistoric stone monastery in the cold desert plateau of Lang. In time, he grew so impatient of the bleak intervals of the day that he began buying drugs in order to increase his periods of sleep. Hashish helped a great deal, and once set him to a part of space where form does not exist, but where glowing gases study the secrets of existence. And a violet-colored gas told him that this part of space was outside what he had called infinity. The gas had not heard of planets and organisms before, but identified Karanus merely as one from the infinity where matter, energy, and gravitation exist. Karanus was now very anxious to return to minaret-studded Selephase, and increased his doses of drugs, but eventually he had no more money left, and could buy no drugs. Then one summer day he was turned out of his garret and wandered aimlessly through the streets, drifting over a bridge to a place where the houses grew thinner and thinner. And it was there that fulfillment came, and he met the cortege of knights come from Selephes to bear him thither forever. Handsome knights they were, astride roan horses and clad in shining armor with tabards of cloth of gold curiously emblazoned. So numerous were they that Karanus almost mistook them for an army, but they were sent in his honor, since it was he who had created Uthnargai in his dreams, on which account he was now to be appointed its chief god for evermore. Then they gave Karanus a horse and placed him at the head of the cavalcade, and all rode majestically through the downs of Surrey and onward toward the region where Karanus and his ancestors were born. It was very strange, but as the riders went on they seemed to gallop back through time. For wherever they passed through a village in the twilight, they saw only such houses and villages as Chaucer or men before him might have seen, and sometimes they saw knights on horseback with small companies of retainers. When it grew dark they traveled more swiftly, till soon they were flying uncannily as if in the air. In this dim dawn they came upon the village which Karanus had seen alive in his childhood, and asleep or dead in his dreams. It was alive now, and early villagers curtsied as the horsemen clattered down the street and turned off into the lane that ends in the abyss of dreams. Karanus had previously entered that abyss only at night and wondered what it would look like by day, so he watched anxiously as the column approached its brink. Just as they galloped up the rising ground to the precipice, a golden glare came somewhere out of the west and hid all the landscape in effulgent draperies. 
the abyss was a seething chaos of roseate and cerulean splendor, and invisible voices sang exultantly as the nightly entourage plunged over the edge and floated gracefully down past glittering clouds and silvery coruscations. Endlessly down the horsemen floated, their chargers pawing the ether as if galloping over golden sands, and then the luminous vapors spread apart to reveal a greater brightness, the brightness of the city Celephase, and the sea coast beyond, and the snowy peak overlooking the sea, and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward distant regions where the sea meets the sky. And Karanis reigned thereafter over Uthnargai and all the neighboring regions of green, and held his court alternately in Celephase and in the cloud-fashioned Ceramium. He reigns there still, and will reign happily forever, though below the cliffs at Innsmouth the channel tides played mockingly with the body of a tramp who had stumbled through the half-deserted village of Dawn, played mockingly, and cast it upon the rocks by ivy-covered Trevor Towers, where a notably fat and especially offensive millionaire brewer enjoys the purchased atmosphere of extinct nobility. End of Celephase Recording by Garrett Fitzgerald, Brewer, Maine Recording by Joseph Canna The Crawling Chaos by H. P. Lovecraft Of the pleasures and pains of opium much has been written. The ecstasies and horrors of De Quincey and the Paradise Artificialis of Baudelaire are preserved and interpreted with an art which makes them immortal, and the world knows well the beauty, the terror, and the mystery of those obscure realms into which the inspired dreamer is transported. But much, as has been told, no man has yet dared intimate the nature of the phantasms thus unfolded to the mind, or hint at the direction of the unheard of roads along whose ornate and exotic course the partaker of the drug is so irresistibly borne. De Quincey was drawn back into Asia, the teeming land of nebulous shadows whose hideous antiquity is so impressive that the vast age of the race and name overpowers the sense of youth in the individual. But farther than that, he dared not go. Those who have gone farther seldom return, and even when they have, they have been either silent or quite mad. I took opium once. In the year of the plague, when the doctors sought to deaden the agonies they could not cure, there was an overdose. My physician was worn out with foreign exertion, and I traveled very far indeed. In the end, I returned and lived, but my nights are filled with strange memories, nor have I permitted a doctor to give me opium again. The pain and pounding in my head had been quite unendurable when the drug was administered. Of the future, I had no heed. To escape, whether by cure, unconsciousness, or death, was all that concerned me. I was partly delirious, so that it is hard to place the exact moment of transition but I think the effect must have begun shortly before the pounding ceased to be painful. As I have said, there was an overdose, so my reactions were probably far from normal. The sensation of falling, curiously disassociated from the idea of gravity or direction, was paramount. Though there were subsidiary impressions of unseen throngs in incalculable profusion, throngs of infinitely diverse nature, but all more or less related to me. Sometimes it seemed less as though I were falling then as though the universe or the ages were falling past me. Suddenly my pain ceased, and I began to associate the pounding with an external rather than internal force. The falling had ceased also, giving place to a sensation of uneasy temporary rest. And when I listened closely, I fancied the pounding was that of the vast, inscrutable sea as its sinister, colossal breakers lacerated some desolate shore after a storm of titanic magnitude. Then I opened my eyes. For a moment my surroundings seemed confused, like a projected image hopelessly out of focus, but gradually I realized my solitary presence in a strange and beautiful room lighted by many windows. Of the exact nature of the apartment I could form no idea, for my thoughts were still from settled, but I noticed van-colored rugs and draperies, elaborately fashioned tables, chairs, ottomans and divans, and delicate vases and ornaments which conveyed a suggestion of the exotic without actually being alien. These things I noticed, yet they were not long uppermost in my mind. 
slowly but inabsorbably, crawling upon my consciousness and rising above every other impression, came a dizzying fear of the unknown, a fear of the greater because I could not analyze it, and seeming to concern a stealthily approaching menace, not death, but some nameless, unheard of thing inexpressibly more ghastly and abhorrent, and shrank from glancing through the arched lattice windows that opened so bewilderingly on every hand. Perceiving shutters attached to these windows, I closed them all, averting my eyes from the exterior as I did so. Then, employing a flint and steel which I found on one of the small tables, I lit many candles reposing the walls in arabesque sconces. The added sense of security brought by closed shutters and artificial light calmed my nerves to some degree, but I could not shut out the monotonous pounding. Now that I was calmer, the sound became as fascinated as it was fearful, and I felt a contradictory desire to seek out its source despite my still powerful shrinking. Opening a portiere on the side of the room nearing the pounding, I beheld a small and richly draped corridor, ending in a cavern door and large oriel windows. To this window, I was irresistibly drawn, though my ill-defined apprehension seemed almost equally bent on holding me back. As I approached it, I could see a chaotic whirl of waters in the distance. Then, as I attained it and glanced out on all sides, the stupendous picture of my surroundings burst upon me with full and devastating force. I beheld such a sight as I had never beheld before, and which no living person can have seen save in the delirium of fever or the inferno of opium. The building stood on a narrow point of land, or what was now a narrow point of land, fully three hundred feet above what must lately have been a seething vortex of mad water. On either side of the house there was a newly washed out precipice of red earth. Whilst ahead of me the hideous waves were still rolling and frightfully eating away the land with ghastly monotony and deliberation. Out a mile or more there rose and fell menacing breakers at least fifty feet in height, and on the far horizon ghoulish black clouds of grotesque conture were resting and brooding like unwholesome vultures. The waves were dark and purplish, almost black, and clutched at the yielding red mud of the bank as if it with uncouth greedy hands and could not but feel that some noxious marine mind had declared a war of extermination upon all the solid ground, perhaps abetted by the angry sky. Recovering at length from the stupor into which this unnatural spectacle had thrown me, I realized that my physical danger was acute. Even whilst I gazed, the bank had lost many feet, and it could not be long before the house would fall undermined into this awful pit of lashing waves. Accordingly, I hastened to the opposite side of the edifice, and finding a door emerged at once, unlocking it after me with a curious key which had hung inside. I now beheld more of the strange region about me, and marked a singular division which seemed to exist in the hostile ocean and firmament. On each side of the jutting promontory different conditions held sway. At my left, as I faced inland, was a gently heaving sea with great green waves rolling peacefully in under a brightly shining sun. Something about that sun's nature and position made me shudder but I could not tell then, and could not tell now what it was. At my right also was the sea, but it was blue, calm, and only gently undulating, while the sky above it was darker and the washed-out bank more nearly white than reddish. I now turned my attention to the land, and found occasion for fresh surprise, for the vegetation resembled nothing I had seen or read about. It was apparently tropical, or at least subtropical, a conclusion born out of the intense heat of the air. Sometimes, I thought, I could trace strange analogies with the flora of my native land, fancying the well-known plants and shrubs might assume such forms under the radical change of climate, but that gigantic and omnipresent palm trees were plainly born. The house I had just left was very small, hardly more than a cottage, but its material was evidently marble, and its architecture was weird and composite, involving a quaint fusion of western and eastern forms. At the corners were Corinthian columns, where the red tile roof was like that of a Chinese pagoda. From the door inland there stretched a path of singularly white sand, about four feet wide, and lined either side with strange palms, unidentifiable flowering shrubs and plants. It lay toward the side of the promontory where the sea was blue and the bank rather whitish. Down this path I felt impelled to flee, as if pursued by some malignant spirit from the pounding ocean. At first it was slightly uphill, then I reached a gentle crest. Behind me I saw the scene I had left. The entire point with the cottage and black water, with the green sea on one side and the blue sea on the other, and a curse unnamed and unnameable lowering over all. I never saw it again, and often wonder.
After this last look, I strode ahead and surveyed the inland panorama before me. The path, as I have intimated, ran along the right-hand shore as one went inland. Ahead and to the left, I now viewed a magnificent valley comprising thousands of acres and covered with a swaying growth of tropical grass higher than my head. Almost at the limit of vision was a colossal palm tree, which seemed to fascinate and beckon me. By this time, wonder and escape from the imperiled peninsula had largely dissipated my fear. But as I paused and sank tea to the path, idly digging with my hands into the warm, whitish golden sand, a new and acute sense of danger seized me. Some terror in the swishing tall grass seemed to add to that of the diabolically pounding sea, and I started up crying and disjointly, Tiger? Tiger? Is it tiger? Beast? Beast? Is it beast that I am afraid of? My mind wandered back to the ancient and classical story of tigers, which I had read. I strove to recall the author, but had difficulty. Then, in the midst of my fear, I remembered that the tale was by Rudyard Kipling, nor did the grotesqueness of deeming him an ancient author occur to me. I wished for the volume containing this story, and had almost started back toward the doomed cottage to procure it, but my better sense and the lure of the palm prevented me. Whether or not I could have resisted the backward beckoning without the counter-fascination of this vast palm tree, I do not know. This attraction was now dominant. I left the path and crawled on hands and knees down the valley's slope despite my fear of the grass and of the serpents it might contain. I resolved to fight for life and reason as long as possible against all menaces of land or sea, though I sometimes feared defeat as the maddening swish of the uncanny grasses joined the still audible and irritating pounding of the distant breakers. I would frequently pause and put my hands to my ears for relief but could never quite shut out the detestable sound. It was, as it seemed to me, only after ages that I finally dragged myself to the beckoning palm tree and lay quiet beneath its protecting shade. There now ensued a series of incidents which transported me to the opposite extremes of ecstasy and horror, incidents which I trembled to recall and dare not seek to interpret. No sooner had I crawled beneath the overhanging foliage of the palm then there dropped from its branches a young child of such beauty as I had never beheld before. Though ragged and dusty, this being bore the features of a fawn or demigod and seemed almost to diffuse a radiance in the dense shadow of the tree. It smiled and extended its hand, but before I could arise and speak I heard in the upper air the exquisite melody of singing, notes high and low blend with the sublime and ethereal harmoniousness. The sun had by this time sunk below the horizon, and in the twilight I saw an aureole of lambent light encircled the child's head. Then in a tone of silver it addressed me. It is the end. They have come down through the gloaming from the stars. Now all is over, and beyond the Arenurian streams we shall dwell blissfully in Tello. As the child spoke, I beheld a soft radiance through the leaves of the palm tree, and rising greeted a pair whom I knew to be the chief singers among those I had heard. A god and goddess they must have been, for such beauty is not mortal. And they took my hand, saying, Come, child, you have heard the voices, and all is well. In Tello beyond the Milky Way, and in the Arenurian streams, are cities all of amber and calcity, and upon their domes of many facets glisten the images of strange and beautiful stars. Under the ivory bridges of Tello flow rivers of liquid gold, bearing pleasure barges bound for blossomy Cytherian of the Seven Suns. And in Tello and in Cytherian abide only you, beauty and pleasure, nor are any sounds heard save of laughter, song, and the lute. Only the gods dwell in Tello of the golden rivers, but among them shalt thou dwell. As I listened, enchanted, I suddenly became aware of the change in my surroundings. The palm tree, so lately overshadowed my exhausting form, was now some distance to my left, and considerably below me. I was obviously floating in the atmosphere, companioned not only by the strange child and the radiant pair, but by a constantly increasing throng of half-luminous, fine-crowned youths and maidens with wind-blown hair and joyful countenance. We slowly ascended together, as if borne on a fragrant breeze, which blew not from the earth, but from the golden nebula, and the child whispered in my ear that I must look always upward to the pathways of light, and never backward to the sphere I had just left. The youths and maidens now chanted mellifluous choriambics to the accompaniment of lutes, and I felt enveloped in a peace and happiness more profound than any I had in life imagined, when the intrusion of a single sound altered my destiny and shattered my soul. Through the ravishing strains of the singers and the lutenists, as if in mocking demonic concord, 
throbbed from gulfs below the damnable and detestable pounding of that hideous ocean. As those black breakers beat their message into my ears, I forgot the words of the child and looked back down upon the doomed scene from which I thought I had escaped. Down through the ether I saw the accursed earth, slowly turning, ever turning with angry and tempestuous seas, gnawing at the wild, desolate shores and dashing foam against the tottering towers of a deserted cities. And under a ghastly moon there gleamed sights I can never describe, sights I can never forget, deserts of corpse-like clay and jungles of ruin and decadence where once stretched the populous plains and villages of my native land, and maelstroms of frothing ocean where once rose the mighty temples of my forefathers. Round the northern pole streamed a morass of noisome growths and miasmal vapors, hissing before the onslaught of the ever-mounting waves that curled and fretted from the shuddering deep. Then, a rending report claved the night, and athwart the desert of deserts appeared a smoking rift. Still the black ocean foamed and gnawed, eating away the desert on either side as the rift in the center widened and widened. There was now no land left but the desert, and still the fuming ocean ate and ate. All at once, I thought, even the pounding sea seemed afraid of something, afraid of dark gods of the inner earth that are greater than the evil gods of water. But even if it was, it could not turn back, and the desert had suffered too much from those nightmare waves to help them now. So the ocean ate the last of the land and poured into the smoking gulf, thereby giving up all it had ever conquered from the newly flooded lands it flowed again, uncovering death and decay. And from its ancient and immemorial bed it trickled loathsomely, uncovering nighted secrets of the years when time was young and the gods unborn. Above the waves rose weedy remembered spires, the moon laid pale lilies of light on dead London, and Paris stood from its damp grave to be sacrificed with stardust. Then rose spires and monoliths that were weedy but not remembered. Terrible spires and monoliths of land that men never knew were lands. There was not any pounding now, but only the unearthly roaring and hissing of waters tumbling into the rift. The smoke of that rift had changed to steam and almost hid the world as it grew denser and denser. It seared my face and hands, and when I looked to see how it affected my companions, I found they had all disappeared. Then very suddenly it ended. I knew no more till I awakened upon a bed of convalescence. As the cloud of steam from the plutonic gulf finally concealed the entire surface from my sight, all the firmament shrieked at a sudden agony of mad reverberations which shook the trembling ether. And one delirious flash and burst it happened. One blinding, deafening holocaust fire, smoke and thunder that dissolved the wan moon and it sped outward to the void. And when the smoke cleared and I sought to look upon the earth, I beheld against a background of cold, humorous stars, only the dying sun and the pale, mournful planets searching for their sister. End of The Crawling Chaos by H.P. Lovecraft Recording by Joseph Canna, Chicago, Illinois Recording by Michael Sample, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, 2008. Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Penniless and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think, from my slavery to morphine, that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was to supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation, so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. 
So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awakened, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing, and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might, nor were there any sea-fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon that had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. 
but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illuminate. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with some difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object which gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distant impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like, several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size was an array of bas-reliefs whose subject would have excited the envy of a door. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer, they were damnably human in the general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seemed to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but a little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. 
Then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemous-like, and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I knew that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist, and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease, and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information of the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of a puny war exhausted mankind, of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window! End of Dagon. This has been a recording by Michael Sample, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, 2008. Recording by Matt Bonehoff The Doom That Came to Sarnath by H.P. Lovecraft There is, in the land of Minar, a vast, still lake that is fed by no stream, and out of which no stream flows. Ten thousand years ago, there stood by its shore the mighty city of Sarnath, but Sarnath stands there no more. It is told that in the immemorial years when the world was young, before ever the men of Sarnath came to the land of Minar, another city stood beside the lake, the grey stone city of Ib, which was as old as the lake itself, and peopled by beings not pleasing to behold. Very odd and ugly were these beings, as indeed are most beings of a world yet inchoate and rudely fashioned. It is written on the brick cylinders of Cadatheron, that the beings of Ib were in hue as green as the lake and the mists that rise above it, that they had bulging eyes, pouting, flabby lips, and curious ears, and were without voice. It is also written that they descended one night from the moon in a mist, they and the vast, still lake and the grey stone city Ib. However this may be, it is certain that they worship a sea-green stone idol 
chiseled in the likeness of Bakrug, the great water lizard, before which they danced horribly when the moon was given. And it is written in the papyrus of Ilarnet that one day they discovered fire, and thereafter kindled flames on many ceremonial occasions. But not much is written of these beings, because they lived in very ancient times, and man is young and knows but little of the very ancient living things. After many eons, men came to the land of Menar, dark shepherd folk with their fleecy flocks, who built Pra, Ilarnek, and Kadatharon on the winding river Ai. And certain tribes, more hardy than the rest, pushed on to the border of the lake and built Sarnath at a spot where precious metals were found in the earth. Not far from the grey city of Ib did the wandering tribes lay the first stones of Sarnath, and at the beings of Ib they marveled greatly. But with their marveling was mixed hate, for they thought it not meet that beings of such aspect should walk about the world of men at dusk nor did they like the strange sculptures upon the grey monoliths of Id, for why those sculptures lingered so late in the world, even until the coming of men, none can tell, unless it is because the land of Menar is very still and remote from most other lands, both of waking and of dream. As the men of Sarnath beheld more of the beings of Id, their hate grew, and it was not less because they found the beings weak and soft as jelly to the touch of stones and arrows. So one day, the young warriors, the slingers and the spearmen and the bowmen, marched against Ib, and slew all the inhabitants thereof, pushing the queer bodies into the lake with long spears, because they did not wish to touch them. And because they did not like the grey sculpted monoliths of Ib, they cast these also into the lake, wondering from the greatness of the labor however the stones were brought from afar, as they must have been, since there is not like them in the land of Menar or the lands adjacent. Thus, of the very ancient city of Ib, nothing was spared, save the sea-green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of Bakrug, the water lizard. This the young warriors took back with them as a symbol of conquest over the old gods and beings of Th, and as a sign of leadership in Menar. But on the night after it was set up in the temple, a terrible thing must have happened, for weird lights were seen over the lake, and in the morning the people found the idol gone, and the high priest, Taran Ish, lying dead, as from some fear unspeakable. And before he died, Taran Ish had scrawled upon the altar of chrysolite, in coarse, shaky strokes, the sign of doom. After Taran Ish, there were many high priests in Sarnath, but never was the sea green stone idol found, and many centuries came and went, wherein Sarnath prospered exceedingly, so that only priests and old women remembered what Taran Ish had scrawled upon the altar of chrysolite. Betwixt Sarnath and the city of Ilarnek arose a caravan route, and the precious metals from the earth were exchanged for other metals and rare cloths and jewels and books and tools for artificers, and all things of luxury that are known to the people who dwell along the winding river Ai and beyond. So Sarnath waxed mighty, and learned, and beautiful, and sent forth conquering armies to subdue the neighboring cities. And in time there sat upon a throne in Sarnath the kings of all the land of Manar, and of many lands adjacent. The wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind was Sarnath the Magnificent. A polished desert quarried marble were its walls, in height three hundred cubits and in breadth seventy-five, so that chariots might pass each other as men drove them along the top. For full five hundred stadia did they run, being open only on the side toward the lake, where a green stone seawall kept back the waves that rose oddly once a year at the festival of the destroying of Ib. In Sarnath were fifty streets, from the lake to the gates of the caravans, and fifty more intersecting them, with onyx where they paved, save those whereupon the horses and camels and elephants trod, which were paved with granite. And the gates of Sarnath were as many as the landward ends of the streets, each of bronze, and flanked by the figures of lions and elephants, carven from some stone no longer known among men. 
The houses of Sarnath were of glazed brick and chalcedony, each having its walled garden and crystal lakelet. With strange art were they builded, for no other city had houses like them, and travelers from Thra and Alarnak and Kadatharon marveled at the shining domes wherewith they were surmounted. But more marvelous still were the palaces and the temples and the gardens made by Zokar the Olden King. There were many palaces, the last of which were mightier than any in Thra or Alarnak or Kadatharon. So high were they that one within might sometimes fancy himself beneath only the sky. Yet, when lighted with torches dipped in the oil of Dothar, their walls showed vast paintings of kings and armies of a splendor at once inspiring and stupefying to the beholder. Many were the pillars of the palaces, all of tinted marble, and carven into designs of surpassing beauty. And in most of the palaces the floors were mosaics of beryl and lapis lazuli, and sardonyx and carbuncle and other choice materials, so disposed that the beholder might fancy himself walking over beds of the rarest flowers. And there were likewise fountains, which cast scented waters about in pleasing jets arranged with cunning art. Outshining all others was the palace of the kings of Menar and of the lands adjacent. On a pair of golden crouching lions rested the throne, many steps above the gleaming floor. And it was wrought of one piece of ivory, though no man lives who knows whence so vast a piece could have come. In that palace there were also many galleries and many amphitheaters where lions and men and elephants battled at the pleasure of the kings. Sometimes the amphitheaters were flooded with water conveyed from the lake in mighty aqueducts, and then were enacted stirring sea fights or combats betwixt swimmers and deadly marine things. Lofty and amazing were the seventeen tower-like temples of Sarnath, fashioned of a bright multicolored stone not known elsewhere. A full thousand cubits high stood the greatest among them, wherein the high priests dwelt with a magnificence scarce less than that of the kings. On the ground were halls as vast and splendid as those of the palaces, where gathered throngs in worship of Zokalar and Tamash and Loban, the chief gods of Sarnath, whose incense enveloped shrines were as the thrones of monarchs. Not like the icons of other gods were those of Zokalar and Tamash and Loban, for so close to life were they that one might swear the graceful bearded gods themselves sat on the ivory thrones. And up unending steps of Zircon was the tower chamber, wherefrom the high priests looked out over the city and the plains and the lake by day, and at the cryptic moon and significant stars and planets and their reflections in the lake at night. Here was done the very secret and ancient rite in detestation of Bakrug, the water lizard, and here rested the altar of Chrysolite, which bore the doom scrawl of Turan Ish. Wonderful likewise were the gardens made by Zokar the Olden King, in the center of Sarnath they lay, covering a great space and encircled by a high wall, and they were surmounted by a mighty dome of glass, through which shone the sun and moon and planets when it was clear, and from which were hung fulgent images of the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was not clear. In summer the gardens were cooled with fresh odorous breezes wafted by fans, and in winter they were heated with concealed fires, so that in those gardens it was always spring. There ran little streams over bright pebbles, dividing meads of green in gardens of many hues, and spanned by a multitude of bridges. Many were the waterfalls in their courses, and many were the huge lakelets into which they expanded. Over the streams and lakelets rode white swans, whilst the music of rare birds chimed in with the melody of the waters. In order to terraces rose the green banks, adorned here and there with bowers of vines and sweet blossoms, and seats and benches of marble and porphyry. And there were many small shrines and temples where one might rest or pray to small gods. Each year there was celebrated in Sarnath the feast of the destroying of Ib, at which time wine, song, dancing, and merriment of every kind abounded. Great honors were laid to the shades of those who had annihilated the odd ancient beings, 
and the memory of those beings and of their elder gods was derided by dancers and lutenists crowned with roses from the gardens of Zokar. And the kings would look out over the lake and curse the bones of the dead that lay beneath it. At first, the high priests liked not these festivals, for there had descended among them queer tales of how the sea green icon had vanished, and how Taran Ish had died from fear and left a warning. And they said that from their high tower they sometimes saw lights beneath the waters of the lake. But as many years passed without calamity, even the priests laughed and cursed and joined in the orgies of the feasters. Indeed, had they not themselves in their high tower often performed the very ancient and secret rite and detestation of Bokrog the water lizard? And a thousand years of riches and delight passed over Sarnath, wonder of the world. Gorgeous beyond thought was the feast of the thousandth year of the destroying of Ib. For a decade had it been talked of in the land of Minar, and as it drew nigh, there came to Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, men from Thra, Elarnek, and Kadatharon, and all the cities of Minar and the lands beyond. Before the marble walls on the appointed night were pitched the pavilions of princes and the tents of travelers. Within his banquet hall, reclined Nargis High, the king, drunken with ancient wine from the vaults of conquered Panath, and surrounded by feasting nobles and hurrying slaves. There were eaten many strange delicacies of that feast, peacocks from the distant hills of Limplan, heels of camels from the Benazic Desert, nuts and spices from Sindathrian groves, and pearls from wave-washed metal dissolved in the vinegar of Thra. Of sauces, there were an untold number, prepared by the subtlest cooks in all Manar, and suited to the palate of every feaster. But most prized of all the viands were the great fishes from the lake, each of vast size, and served upon golden platters set with rubies and diamonds. Whilst the king and his nobles feasted within the palace, and viewed the crowning dish as it awaited them on golden platters, others feasted elsewhere. In the tower of the great temple, the priests held revels, and in pavilions without the walls, the princes of neighboring lands made merry. And it was the high priest, Ganai Ka, who first saw the shadows that descended from the gibbous moon into the lake, and the damnable green mists that arose from the lake to meet the moon and to shroud in a sinister haze the towers and the domes of fated Sarnath. Thereafter, those in the towers and without the walls beheld strange lights on the water, and saw that the gray rock Akurion, which was wont to rear high above it near the shore, was almost submerged. And fear grew vaguely yet swiftly, so that the princes of Ilarnek and of far Rakol took down and folded their tents and pavilions and departed, though they scarce knew the reason for their departing. Then, close to the hour of midnight, all the bronze gates of Sarnath burst open and emptied forth a frenzied throng that blackened the plain, so that all the visiting princes and travelers fled away in fright. For on the faces of this throng was writ a madness born of horror unendurable, and on their tongues were words so terrible that no hearer paused for proof. Men whose eyes were wild with fear shrieked aloud of the sight within the king's banquet hall, where through the windows were seen no longer the forms of Nargis High and his nobles and slaves, but a horde of indescribable green voiceless things with bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips and curious ears, things which danced horribly, bearing in their paws golden plates set with rubies and diamonds and containing uncouth flames. And the princes and travelers, as they fled from the doomed city of Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, looked back again upon the mist-beginning lake and saw the gray rock Kurion was quite submerged. Through all the land of Minar and the land adjacent spread the tales of those who had fled from Sarnath and caravans sought that accursed city and its precious metals no more. It was long ere any travel went thither, and even then 
only the brave and adventurous young men of yellow hair and blue eyes who were no kin to the men of Manar. These men indeed went to the lake to view Sarnath, but though they found the vast still lake itself and the great rock of Kurion which rears high above it near the shore, they beheld not the wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind. Where once had risen walls of three hundred cubits and towers yet higher, now stretched only the marshy shore. Where once had dwelt fifty million men, now crawled the detestable water lizard. Not even the mines of precious metal remained. Doom had come to Sarnath. But half buried in the rushes was spied a curious green idol, an exceedingly ancient idol, chiseled in the likeness of Bakrug, the great water lizard. That idol, enshrined in the high temple at Alarnet, was subsequently worshipped beneath the gibbous moon throughout the land of Manar. End of The Doom That Came to Sarnath Recording by Matt Bonha. Recording by James Pontolillo. Ex Oblivione by H. P. Lovecraft. When the last days were upon me, and the ugly trifles of existence began to drive me to madness like the small drops of water that torturers let fall ceaselessly upon one spot of their victim's body, I loved the irradiate refuge of sleep. In my dreams I found a little of the beauty I had vainly sought in life, and wandered through old gardens and enchanted woods. Once, when the wind was soft and scented, I heard the south calling, and sailed endlessly and languorously under strange stars. Once, when the gentle rain fell, I glided in a barge down a sunless stream under the earth till I reached another world of purple twilight, iridescent arbors, and undying roses. And once I walked through a golden valley that led to shadowy groves and ruins, and ended in a mighty wall green with antique vines, and pierced by a little gate of bronze. Many times I walked through that valley, and longer and longer would I pause in the spectral half-light where the giant trees squirmed and twisted grotesquely, and the gray ground stretched damply from trunk to trunk, sometimes disclosing the mold-stained stones of buried temples. And always the goal of my fancies was the mighty vine-grown wall with the little gate of bronze therein. After a while, as the days of waking became less and less bearable from their grayness and sameness, I would often drift in opiate peace through the valley and the shadowy groves, and wonder how I might seize them for my eternal dwelling place, so that I need no more crawl back to a dull world stripped of interest and new colors. And as I looked upon the little gate in the mighty wall, I felt that beyond it lay a dream country from which, once it was entered, there would be no return. So each night in sleep I strove to find the hidden latch of the gate in the ivied antique wall, though it was exceedingly well hidden, and I would tell myself that the realm beyond the wall was not more lasting merely, but more lovely and radiant as well. Then one night in the dream city of Zakarian I found a yellowed papyrus filled with the thoughts of dream sages who dwelt of old in that city, and who were too wise ever to be born in the waking world. Therein were written many things concerning the world of dream, and among them was lore of a golden valley, and a sacred grove with temples, and a high wall pierced by a little bronze gate. When I saw this lore, I knew that it touched on the scenes I had haunted, and I therefore read long in the yellowed papyrus. Some of the dream sages wrote gorgeously of the wonders beyond the irrepassable gate, but others told of horror and disappointment. I knew not which to believe, yet longed more and more to cross forever into the unknown land. For doubt and secrecy are the lure of lures, and no new horror can be more terrible than the daily torture of the commonplace. So when I learned of the drug which would unlock the gate and drive me through, I resolved to take it when next I awaked. Last night I swallowed the drug and floated dreamily into the golden valley and the shadowy groves. And when I came this time to the antique wall, I saw that the small gate of bronze was ajar. 
From beyond came a glow that weirdly lit the giant twisted trees on the tops of the buried temples, and I drifted on songfully, expectant of the glories of the land from whence I should never return. But as the gate swung wider and the sorcery of the drug and the dream pushed me through, I knew that all sights and glories were at an end, for in that new realm was neither land nor sea, but only the white void of unpeopled and illimitable space. So, happier than I had ever dared hope to be, I dissolved again into that native infinity of crystal oblivion from which the daemon life had called me for one brief and desolate hour. This is the end of Ex Oblivione by H. P. Lovecraft. Recording by Victoria Horseman. Facts Concerning the Late Arthur German and His Family by H. P. Lovecraft. Part 1 Life is a hideous thing, and from the background behind what we know of it, peer demoniacal hints of truth which make it sometimes a thousandfold more hideous. Science, already oppressive with its shocking revelations, will perhaps be the ultimate exterminator of our human species, if separate species we be. For its reserve of unguessed horrors could never be borne by mortal brains if loosed upon the world. If we knew what we are, we should be